Today, we're going to work on a, uh, a hypervisor in a way that you guys have probably never seen a hypervisor used. So we're going to use a hypervisor to run a user application. So we're going to take a core dump, and then we're going to resume execution of that core dump inside of a... Um, uh, we're going to resume that inside of a VM, but we're not going to do that in the standard way that you think of, which is creating an OS in the VM and running an OS in the VM and an application in that VM and resuming. That's something that we will get to at some point, which will be like soon. Um, but what we're actually going to do is we're going to use the VM acceleration stuff to basically provide a different context, but we're still going to have that VM have access to our physical memory. We're going to prevent that VM from accessing that physical memory by changing the CR3 for the guest. So we're only going to have the guest in user mode. So we'll launch a VM in user mode, 64-bit mode, that is currently executing um, in a CR3 that we provide it. And this will allow us to create isolation between us and the VM. However, that VM won't have access to the host resources. So that'll be kind of interesting. But yeah. All right, so that's what we're going to work on. Let's make sure, let's get this commit up. Um, and this should be fine. Yeah, I think everything here should be in a good state. So that means that we can we'll pull that in. Should be able to reset. Nice, and this will then download from the server. Yep, and there it goes, downloads from the server. Okay, so everything's working great. Car uh, git commit am um, added remote mapping support. Git push. All right. And we want to add a caching layer to that, and we'll, we'll get to that at some stage. So, first thing we're going to do is we need to get a VM up and running. So let's uh, let's talk through what it takes to use VTX on x86. It's actually pretty simple. Well, it's hard. We're going to fuck up a million times before we get it right. Um, but it's pretty simple. And we're going to set up all of the registers that we need to get a bare bones uh, application running. So we're going to do this through, uh, we'll do VTX. VTX. Hmm. I don't know if I want to do like VM new, but I think I do. We're going to find a way to make this work. Let me VM is equal to this. Create a new virtual machine. And we'll say uh, VTX. So that's specifically for VTX, which is Intel. So we'll do mod VTX. And we can close all of these things. Cargo run. All right, cannot find VTX. Uh, split kernel source, vtx.rs, pub struct vtx, impl vtx, fn new, oh, vm. Do I want to impl vm? I'm not going to make this agnostic to the vm type so that we can do AMD support as well. We'll do, we'll do this for now. We'll adapt that later. Um, all right, make new public. This is going to return a self, which is a VM, and we'll just return VM. And there we go. We did it. We made a VM. <laughs> um, oh, since we're not using net mappings, a lot of this code becomes unused. That's fine. That's fine. So, dude, it's so easy. Yeah. I don't know why people don't do this more often. This is going to be Intel VTX extensions support. And this will be um, create a new virtual machine. And we'll probably call this new user. New virtual machine for running uh, ring three user land snapshots uh create a new virtual machine for running ring three user land snapshots that sounds pretty close 
Um. Uh, 64-bit ring three user land snapshots. We're not gonna do 32-bit support. I mean, maybe we will, but we probably won't. Because I don't care about 32-bit support. So new user. This will make a new user mode VM. <laughs> okay. So now what we need to do is we need to initialize VTX. Now I've done this in another stream, but we're going to have to pull up the Intel manual. And we'll pull this up by going to the here, because I already have it locally. And then we're also going to check out the source locally for uh, git checkout or git clone github gamozo labs orange slice and this is a very thin hypervisor that i have open sourced before and we developed that on stream so we'll split orange slice source kernel source vt we did everything in main all right so this goes through all the things that we need to enable VTX. Um, so this will identify the VTX feature, which is the first thing we want to do, which makes sense. So we're going to uh, detect if VMX is supported on the machine and then VMX not supported or VTX. So get the CPU features. We then check if VTX is supported and then detected and then enabling. So this will probably say is not supported. Halting uh, is not supported. VTX is not supported. Cannot create VM. All right. So there we go. So that now fails in KVM. So to get this to work, we need to enable uh, nested vert. And the trick is this. Um, and we'll say uh, to enable VTX uh, nested VTX in KVM, do the following. Unload the old driver and then load it with nesting equals one sudo mod probe r kvm intel and then we're gonna mod probe kvm intel nested is one okay so now this should be supported and we'll see the nice supported message there we go v vmx detected enabling vtx noise Alex Warhawk, see you around. Does the Xeon 5 support VTX? It does not. Well, technically, Knight's Mill does. But if you can get your hands on a Knight's Mill processor, that would be incredible because I haven't been able to find them from any supplier, including Intel. So, they do exist. Some were made. Um, but I think they went directly to uh, Supercompute customers. So I think it's unlikely that I will ever find one. I would love to get one. It's pointless to have, right? It's a shitty, it's a shitty CPU. Um, but I'd love to, I'd love to have one just to own one. Okay, VTX, and this is uh, discovering support. So we check for the VMX bit, which is what we do, and then at that point we. Also check these feature control MSR. So we want to do that as well. So we're going to go and check that. Here's the feature control. And this is the um, uh, feature control MSR, which this contains what information? Uh, VMX uh, lock and enablement bits. Bought a Knight's Corner and Knight's Landing PCIe card out of curiosity. They're so cool. Yeah. Um, or they're so weird. Yeah, I would say, I mean, Knight's Corner is trash. I do not recommend anyone to use Knight's Corner, but Knight's Mill is actually pretty good. Or uh, Knight's Landing is pretty good. Knight's Corner is, is really... It's not good. So I honestly don't like the PCIe card versions of... Um, 
Xeon Phi's at all. All right. So before it can enter that, so we check that the feature is supported. Then we check the, it enables it by sending VMXE to one. It's then entered by starting the, that on. VMX on is also controlled by the IA32 feature control. This MSR is cleared to zero when the logical processor is reset. Relevant bits of the, uh, when this is clear, VMX on causes a general protection exception. So that lock bit needs to be set. If it is set, write MSR to this MSR causes a GP. It cannot be modified until a, uh, okay. So I think we want to set those two bits outside SMX. Um, um, when this bit is clear, VMX on in SMX causes a general protection fault. If this bit is clear, VMX on outside of SMX causes a GP. I don't care about SMX, so we're going to do it only for um, these two. So we will check. We will say if uh, CPU read MSR, and we'll pull in CPU, uh, CPU we already have, I32 feature control and one. Um, and we'll say uh, const I32 feature control lock U32 is one. These are the bit masks for these different fields. So you have lock. This is VMX and SM. Uh, safer mode extensions, and then we'll say VMX uh, in outside of SMX. Is there a better way to describe that? Outside SMX causes a GP. All right. Outside SMX. We'll do that. Uh, and then one and two. Nice corner is pretty cheap. Look at the, uh, I took the KNL PCI card because I couldn't find the LGA CPUs, uh, but not a single compatible motherboard and for less than a few thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh, you could find uh, CPUs, yeah. Can confirm, Knight's Corner is a bit garbage. Yeah, it's not very good. It's not good. <laughs> All right, check if the lock bit is set, and this will be I32 feature control lock. If that is equal to zero, um, God damn it. We'll do this. If the lock bit is not set, and this is a uh, lock bit is not set yet, typically the BIOS sets this, uh, so we can set it ourselves with the uh, features we want. So we will set CPU, write MSR, I32 feature control, and we'll write the outside of SMX support and the lock bit. Um, honestly, we'll, we'll just enable everything. Inside of SMX, outside of SMX, and this will be um, uh, when set writes to the uh, feature control MSR will GP. Um, this is often set by the BIOS. This is uh, when set, when set uh, VMX on inside of SMX is allowed. And this is when set VMX on outside of SMX is allowed. Okay. So we will write that MSR. That will enable those. And these are 64s. One, two, three, okay. Unsafe to read and write MSRs. Okay, so then we'll have to and like that. 
So that will enable VTX. Um, actually, that might fail. Enabling VTX. We need to also set VMXE. And what register is that? All right, we can skip this song. Um, VMX lockbit outside SMX. And oh, that's VMX E. This is the uh, v, uh, this is the VM v, VMX enable bit in CR4. All right, easy. So we'll say unsafe if CPU read CR4. Um, if CR4 and VMXE is equal to zero, um, set or enable VMX extensions if not already enabled. That way we won't like reset that bit. Not that it really matters, but CPU writes CR4, CPU read CR4, and then we'll or that with the CR4 VMXE. And that will basically enable that. So we'll go into CPU, uh, shared CPU source lib, read, read CR2, write CR2, read, write CR3. Then we'll add another one for CR4. SCR2, CR4G. Okay. So if that and that is zero, then we will set it to the read CR4 value, we'll or it with the VMX enable, and then we'll write that out. No problem so far. And then here, we will, if the lock bit is not set in the feature control, then we will set the lock bit by writing that we'll allow VMX in both modes as well as set the lock bit ourselves. So, uh, if it is not set, enable uh, VTX in all modes and set the lock bit. I think that's pretty clear. And then if we run it again, we'll just read, read, and we'll skip kind of all those things. Sweet. So now what we want to do is we want to start making a VM. Now to do this, we enable VMX mode by doing a VMX on. Um, once in VMX operation, it's not possible to clear that when it leaves it uh, via VMX off. VMXE can be cleared. Yep. So we set all those bits. Before Xing it, it should allocate a naturally aligned 4 kilobyte region of memory that a logical processor may use to support VMX operation. Um, okay. Before executing it, it allocates a physical uh, region of memory that is in the that the logical processor uses to support it. The physical address of the region, the VM on point VMX on pointer, is provided in an operand to VMX on. It is subject to limitations that apply to VMCS pointers. It must be 4K aligned, must not be set beyond the physical address width. And before executing it, it should write the VMCS revision identifier to the VMX on region. Specifically, it should write a Three, uh, the 31-bit revision identifier to bits 30 to 0 of the first four bytes of the VMX on region. Bit 31 should be cleared to 0. It need not initialize the VMX on region in any other way. Okay, so we're going to allocate, and that didn't say it needs to be 0 initialized, so we just have to set that revision number. So we have to get the revision number that we support, and that will be from... Um... I guess this is detecting the, the feature bits that we need and setting those. Validate that it's allowed. OK, enable VMX. Then we allocate a page, and we write, 
We allocate a page and we VMX on. We get the revision number. So get the VMCS revision number. Um, and we will grab these fields. I32 VMX basic. And this is the um, VMX basic. Uh, and wh what goes in here? Uh, Intel manuals. We'll pull up the MSR manual that will tell us the, the contents of these um, MSRs. Okay. I32 basic. Uh, VMX basic. Okay. Uh, reporting register of the VMX capabilities, appendix A1, basic VMX information. Okay. Where is that appendix? There isn't an appendix in here. I guess that's referring to this, A1. Uh, contains the 31-bit VMCS identifier, number of bytes that it should allocate for the VMCS region. It is greater than zero and at most 4,096, so we'll just do 4K. The width of physical addresses that may be used for that, it's fine. Um, dual monitor treatment and report the memory type that should be used for the VMCS. Oh, okay. That might matter. That might matter. That tells us what kind of allocation to make or the accessibility of those. You got seven, 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 seven followers on Twitter. Hell yeah. It's <laughs> like. That's a good mile marker. I think we'll hit 10K this year, which is pretty fucking weird, man. That, that Twitter fame. I gotta start monetizing. I'm kidding. I will never monetize my, my work. I won't have a sponsor. Um, if it needs to access this, e.g. modify the contents of MSR bitmaps, it can fi configure the paging structures to map them into linear address space. It should establish that they use these permissions. This is, reports the information. Um, reports the information in the, okay. I see. Um, if any VMX controls that default to one may be cleared to zero. Okay. Software can use a VM entry to deliver a hardware exception with or without an error code, regardless of vector. I see. And that is uh, reserved as read to zero. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the VMCS revision identifier, which is 31 bits. Then we're also going to um, determine, determine the caching mode for um, VMCS data structures. And this is the IO bitmaps. Data structure is referenced by that. Uh, virtual APIC page. MSR areas. Um, and the MSEG header. You know, I don't think we care about that right now. What is this PDF? This is the Intel Systems Manual. Um, can you give an overview of what we're doing? Right now, we're writing a uh, virtual machine for x86 for Intel processors. So we're writing something that will use the virtual machine extensions to allow us to have an isolated process uh, inside of our OS. 
This is basically the technology that things like VMware and Hyper-V and KVM and Zen use to create operating systems inside of operating systems. So we're actually using this uh, in a very similar way. So that's what we're setting up now. We're just using these features. Um, so we're going to do a VMX on, and I think I need to set those feature controls first. Um, so before I execute VMX on, let's see, where is that at? Where are the instructions here? VMX on. If the lockbit is set, blah, 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 get the address, check the revision, and we should be good. So we should be able to VMX on at this stage. It's pretty fucking cool, so let's try it. Unsafe LLVM assembly. We're going to execute a VMX on. We're going to pass in a pointer to the VMX on, a pointer to the pointer to the VMX on data structure, which is stupid, but that's how it's done. Intel volatile. So, and then we pass in one register, and this will be the VMX on ref. And we'll say, let VMX on ref U64 is zero. And this should crash. Um, yeah. So this should crash because it will be a null deref. We'll get a we'll get a uh, in e, and we're faulting on accessing zero. Perfect. So we're going to put in here. We have to allocate a VMCS region, and we'll do that through um, fizz contig new. And I think we can just do let VMX on. Uh, what is this? The VMX on region. What do they call it? VMX on region is equal to the fizzcontig. And we probably need to lock this. Yeah, so we're going to lock this. We'll do. Um, uh, well, right now we're, we're going to hack this, but the fizz can take that we can get that from uh, use create mm fizz can take. So this will allow us to allocate a contiguous uh, range of physical memory. That takes one argument, which is the initialized data. So we'll allocate a page. Allocate a page in physical memory that is also virtually mapped. And that is the VMX on region. And then the VMX on reference is going to be a. This is going to be a, a pointer to the VMX on region. So this will be VMX on region. Oops. VMX on region. And we'll ref deref it. Okay. And we'll mute that. And so we'll mark this mute. That'll give us a, oh, that's the virtual address. So we want to do, this is the physical address of the VMX on region. We can actually do this. A reference to the VMX on region fizz adder. Don't ask me why it takes a reference to it, but that's what it does. And that's a function, so we're going to call it. That'll create a fizz adder locally. Then we'll pass the reference to that on the stack. And then that'll get VMX on. And this should, this maybe will fail. OK, so that succeeds um, because the revision is 0. We're going to do all Fs. This should fail because the revision number is going to be bad. What? It seems it does not care about that revision number. Maybe that's just KVM doesn't care about that for some reason. Anyways, the correct thing to do is 0U8, and then we'll do VMX on region, copy from slice. And this is the U32, copy from slice to size of 
U32? Copy from Slice, uh... And that needs to be mute. This is, uh, write the revision number. Revision number to the first 32 bits of the VMX on region. And we're gonna copy those bits in from... Um... The revision number to Little Indian Bytes. Okay, so that's gonna write in the revision number. Put a reference on that. Size that we gotta pull in from core mem. And now we have created, we have enabled VM, VMX for this uh, core, but what I want to do is I want to make that per core because I want to be able to create multiple VMs that we can switch between. So let's see, how do I want to do that? Um, I think I, I just have to put it in kernel source core locals. And this is the VMX on region. Lock cell new none. And this is the uh, region I guess we'll document it up here. Outstanding. VMX on region. And yeah, I don't want to make that pub. We'll do a lock cell. Fizz contig of a U8 for 4096. So this is the VMX on region, and this is an option. VMX on region uh, for this core. If VMX on has not yet executed, or VMX off was executed, then this will be none. Okay, lock cell expected two types. We're gonna pull in page free list as well as fizz contig. And we need one more type, which is the, uh, I think, lock interrupts. So we're making a new lock that holds that VMAX on region. And then here, we will set that up under that lock. So we have to make an accessor for this. Uh, pub unsafe fn VMX on region self. Um... This is a ref to a to this whole thing. Oops, ref tab this this self dot vmx on region, and this is uh, get access to the vmx on region. Okay, so now what I can do these things we can we're checking, so it doesn't really matter what. Um, what other things are doing? Well, this core is only executing single thread anyways, but um, yeah, we'll do let VMX, uh, VMX on region is equal to core VMX on region. So this is uh, get access to the VMX on region, and then we'll lock it. And we'll say, if VMX on region is none, uh, check if we need to create a VMX on region for this core. And this is basically for the whole, the whole system. We, we're basically just giving the processor a little bit of physical memory for it to use for scratch space. At the end, we'll do VMX on region is equal to sum VMX on region. And we want to shadow, we don't want to shadow this. Um, VMX on lock. VMX on lock, and this is uh, save the VMX on region um, as the current VMX on region. Cannot borrow is mutable. Yep, we just make this mute. So we lock that, we get access to that, and then if it's none, 
Then we get the revision number, we allocate a page in physical memory, we then write in the revision number to the start of that page, we then execute VMX on, and then we save that region. So let's test this in hardware in parallel. I'm gonna disable PCI, which will allow us to, um, I'm gonna do unused for a minute. Probably gonna forget about that, but allow unused. Can I do allow? Yeah, we'll just do that system wide. And now I'm gonna re reboot this in physical hardware, and we're gonna test this in physical hardware in parallel. Um, because I don't want to get into a point where it works in the VM, but it doesn't work on hardware, and we're trying to debug both in parallel. We're gonna implement both implementations in parallel. And since we disabled PCI Express, we should have soft reboot Z, and there we go. So we do have soft reboot working just fine. It's 4 a.m. Sleep schedule dead. Oh shit! How you can you kill that which has no life? Did I go to university? I did not. Um, well, I can kill process too, which have no life. Hell yeah. All right, so we're just waiting for this to come up on physical hardware, which is going to be this right here. So this will basically show us on hardware what it's doing, and we'll just keep this up here. In fact, we can just develop this almost directly entirely on hardware. So this is um, enable, uh, enable uh, VMX by switching VMX to on. Okay, and we're getting a uh, we're getting a general protection fault on C seven zero E. Wow, yeah, that means the VM is like much less sensitive to this stuff. The VM is very relaxed on how this works. So basically, we can now go look at where we're failing. Um, let's go to Object dump m intel d build kernel x86 release kernel.exe. And then this will allow us to see where it's failing. It's probably failing on the VMX on plot twist. Uh, this is at uh, C70E. Yep, failing on VMX on. And that is giving the address to RBX. And RBX is a stack location. Um which should be, yep, that's where we store the physcon tag. So that means we're failing some check. Um, but VTX is detected, and we know that this works in hardware, right? Did we ever test this in hardware? I don't know if we did, but I don't set these feature controls yet. So maybe I need to set those feature controls first. Or these fixeds first. I'm just gonna yoink this and we're gonna paste this in here just to see, I should be able to soft reboot. Nice. So we can still soft reboot, we can still recover from that. But yeah, we're getting a general protection fault. I'm gonna set these bits. Uh, read CR0, we need to add support for that in CPU. So we'll yoink this, and we'll paste it into here. Oops, yeah, CR2. Then we will uh, CR4, CR0, go. This will hopefully set those bits, and then all of those are unsafe. But I'm just gonna see if this fixes it. If it does, then clearly it's what we need to do. Um. Uh, all those are unsafe. Nice, so that worked. Uh, so it means that we have to set these fixed bits. Um, basically, these bits are used to determine the, um, and that's on the VMX on. So these bits are required to determine, the VMX requires certain features to be enabled and certain features to be disabled. So what we're doing here is we are reading which bits the processor expects are enabled and reading the bits which it expects are disabled. And so we 
or the ones that are supposed to be enabled, and we mask off the ones that are um, uh, that are. Is that right, though? I mean, this is correct, and I don't know why it is, though. So we're gonna grab these. We'll read through this in a in a second. These are bits that must be set to zero when CR zero during doing a VMX on. So the fix zero, they must be zero in CR zero. And what do I do? What's my logic here? I read CR zero. I or the ones that should be zero. That just seems wrong. And one. Oh yeah, because it's an inverse, and this is um. It's it's really weird how they do this, and it's always been confusing. But this is correct. Um, but I think I should change my comments. Um. How do I describe those? What's fix zero? What do what does Intel say? Fix to zero, fix to one. Those bits have to be zero. Those bits have to be one. It's an inverse mask, isn't it? Um, bits which are fixed to one. That's what's so confusing about this Intel documentation here. Because it says that those bits need to be uh, fixed to one, but clearly they're not because the processor says all of these are set. So I think the ones are allowed one and it's just really shittily written. The fix zero and that indicate how bits in CR zero m may be set in VMX operation. Um, they report the bits in CR zero that are allowed to be zero and one respectively. Allowed to be zero and allowed to be one. Okay, so the bits that are allowed to be zero I think I'm doing that wrong. Allowed to be zero and allowed to be one. If it's set in fix zero, if it's set, then it must be one. If the bit X is set in fix, if it's zero in fixed one, then it must be zero. So we are doing this correctly. It's so fucking weird. The bits that are allowed to be zero and one. Um, um, okay, so this is bits set in this must be set in CR0 when doing VMX on, and this is bits set in this must be set to zero, uh, bits clear in this, correct? If the bit is set in there, then it must be one. Must be set. And then this is, if it is zero, then it must be zero. Bits clear in this must be set to zero in CR0 when doing a VMAX on. So that is accurate now to actually what the fuck they do. And then we're doing it correctly. We're setting all the fixed zero bits and then we're clearing the fixed one bits. Okay. So, and this works just fine, right? That works there, and it also works in hardware. Starting soft reboot. Interesting.
Am I getting a lock in there? I don't think so. We are seeing a delay. Oh, it's, it's, uh, oh, um, we have to disable VMX before we do a soft reboot. 100%. We have to do a VMX off. This is working because that triple faults, and we don't see the triple fault, but it is triple faulting. Um, because that's, that's going to fault when we uh, set some of the CR bits. So we're going to do this. In kernel source panic, soft reboot. When we soft reboot, we are going to get access to the VMON region. And uh, this is uh, VMX off if possible. If if VMX on, uh, if we're in VMX root operation. So we'll say if let some um, if let some VMX on is equal to VMX on dot take. So we're going to throw that away. It'll cause that to get freed. Eh, fuck it. We can do if it's sum, then we can do a, so we're going to lock that, and then we'll do VMX off to disable it. And I think VMX off, what does VMX off take? Um, instructions, VMX off, uh, no arguments, fucking easy. Kind of expected that. Uh, so this will uh, disable VMX root operation. Okay, and then we'll do VMX on lock. And then we'll ref it. Ref deref. So now, if we're currently in VMX mode, then we will disable VMX. And I think we want to. We'll do that like right away. Once all cores are disabled, we'll VMX off. All right, here we go. Z. Uh, okay. Non-preemptible lock and an interrupt. Yep, that VMX on region, we have to mark no preempt. Which is actually correct. Kernel source core locals. VMX on this. Here, new, no preempt. So now, we should be able to reboot this. And we can soft reboot. Okay, so... Let's reset the server, and we'll let that server come up in physical hardware, um, and that'll fix that soft reboot. We'll basically disable, before we do a soft reboot, we'll disable VTX if it's enabled. <laughs> that front-facing camera, hell yeah. Just waiting for that to boot now. But that should work. All right. All right. There we go. Shift Z. Hey, we soft rebooted. Nice! Oh, look at that reboot time. 0.2 milliseconds. 200 microseconds to reboot. <laughs> oh, that's glorious. Um, any progress on deterministic interrupt delivery? This is not designed to... It, um, 
This isn't designed to uh, inject interrupts at all. Not this one. I haven't done anything on Orange Slice. Um... Okay, so now we can soft reboot that. Noise. So we should be able to. Um, let's see. Now we want to, we enable VMX, we enable that, we do VMX on, okay. So at this point, VMX is enabled. And we only do it once per core, so we should be able to run this code twice, and it won't redo anything. This will be VM1, VM2. Noise. Um, VTX. We can get rid of that print because we don't really need it. We'll return failure if we fail. Nice. Okay, so the next stage is we need to actually make a VMCS region for a VM. So we're going to make a VM, and we're going to make a VMCS region for this VM. And this is for ourselves. So this is the VMCS. This is the fizz contig for um, U8 for 4096, I'm pretty sure. The VMCS for this VM. And this is a virtual machine using... Intel VTX extensions. Do you have a heap on this one? Yes, I do. Well, I have an allocator. I don't have a heap, but I have an allocator. I don't really have a need for a heap. Um, VM. Then we'll have VMCS. So let VMCS is equal to fizz contig new OU8 4096. So allocate a VMCS region. Bump allocator? No, we just have a full virtual um, virtual memory manager. So we can just construct anything out of pages. And then we can free them as well. It just won't reuse things. Every allocation will uh, cause the page tables to get populated. And then when we free something, it'll cause the page tables to get cleared out for those. Allocate a VMCS region. And we should be able to do a, a pointer load on that to activate the VMCS. I like at the root level page table, uh, and then we have all the pin based controls and all this shit. And then we just set up all the rights and permissions and stuff. What do we have set as pub on here? Just these two? Perfect. Um, sorry if I a if asked already on this is probably a dumb question. What are VMX extensions and why are you implementing this? VMX extensions are what are used on x86, um, on, specifically on Intel, to allow you to run a virtual machine. So it's how you're able to run kind of an isolated process on an Intel processor. It allows you to uh, run an OS inside of an OS and all these things. It's what it what's make uh, Hyper-V and VMware and all these different technologies work. Obviously, there's still full system emulation, but this allows you to, in hardware, run an isolated operating system. So we are making these so that we can load a, an already running operating system into these and fuzz it. And we can basically let it resume what it's doing. And we can see what it would have done with whatever input we gave it. And we can track information about it. And when it crashes or does something we don't like or times out, we can reset the VM to the original state. So that's what we're setting up here. Um, okay. So, I think what we'll do is we'll implement run at this stage. So, now we'll do uh, vm.run. And run is going to 92. This is going to vm pointer load. So, this is uh, pub fn run mute self. And this is uh, run the VM. 
done. So what we can do now is we can VM pointer load. So this will um, unsafe uh, set the current VM as the active VM. And we'll do this via uh, LVM assembly VM, or we'll just yoink this. It's the same thing, basically. This is the self.vmcs, and then we'll do a VM pointer load. So this is going to load this active VMCS as the active VMCS that we're working with. Uh, so we're going to tell the processor this is currently what is running. So when we call run, we will run that. And I want to make sure that we support two VMs in parallel so that we can uh, switch between them if we want. Beautiful. So that works. That's not crashing. So that means we have loaded the physical address of that VM pointer, and we're good. So at this point, um, god damn. Wow. That was easy. Uh, so at this point, we're literally just going to set up the environment for that VM to run in. So we have to grab kind of all these different controls. And... EPT pointer. Those are VM write fields. So these are. We're going to need all of these, so I'm just going to grab them. So these are. <laughs> Dude, we're like, we're booking it through this. Uh, VMX uh, pin based controls, uh, VMX uh, processor based controls. VMX uh, processor base controls um, uh, part two. This is the VMX exit controls and the VMX entry controls. Pretty obvious. And we're going to have to add uh, VM write and VM read to here. So these will allow us to read and write things to the VMCS region. And what do these look like? VM read, RM64. That allows us to write directly to memory. Uh, let me look at uh, orange slice shared CPU source, VM read. I mean, quite frankly, we just want these, the reads and the writes. Um, based on coding and the value. Okay. Unsave VM write and VM read. And this is LLVM assembly. Okay. So then in VTX, we will start setting some of these bits. So we make that page. Uh, we write an EPT pointer, which we won't need, but these are um, um, actually, oh, did we, we pulled out of here. Okay. Those are on the proc based controls. I think those are the ones that we can use. So we determine the minimums. And we write those in. Let me just grab these quick. Just want to get these working. Can we do this in WebAssembly? No. What distro is this? This is uh, Debian right here. So we're, we're using Debian right now. Just get that nice Linux stability, which I like quite a bit. Super simple. Um, entry controls. Now we're going to make these into a struct or an enum. And these will wrapper to a U32. I think VM read encoding is a U64. Okay. So these are um, VMCS region point uh, region encodings. Uh, the values to be used with VM. VM read and VM write uh, instructions. 
So we'll do a pub enum vmcs, and then we'll start pulling in the fields we want. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Uh, from here. So we're going to grab all of these. These are different VMCS region values, and then we got to format these to our R shape. S con space, get rid of that. S colon dot star equals and replace it with an, a space equals G. And replace semicolons with commas. Oops. Semicolons with commas. And yeah. So this is the VM instruction error. Where do we use that? At the end. Okay, so this is the um, VM instruction error information. And these are just the raw things. This is the exit reason. So this is the VM exit reason. Uh, pin based controls. This is the uh, proc based controls. Processor based controls. Uh, and that's the part one. And this will be proc based controls two. Um, part two. We have the VM exit controls. And this is the VM entry controls. And the EPT pointer we're not going to use for this. All right. Activate secondary controls. We do that to do unrestricted guess, which we don't need. Exit minimum or host address space. I forget what that is, but anyways, we'll just um, we're just gonna set all the minimums, and then this becomes VMCS. Uh, VMCS proc based, whatever that was, pin based controls. Pin based controls. VMCS proc based controls VMCS proc based controls two VMCS exit controls VMCS entry controls and basically the processor tells us some minimum requirements and that's what all this code is it looks really stupid you might be wondering what it's for. I didn't decide to do any of this. I am forced to do this. VM pointer. Um. What? What? That takes not expected on this target. Um, I don't understand. Have you written a hypervisor, hypervisor for AMD's SVM? Yes, I have. I like it a lot more. It's so much better. VTX sucks, man. Do you have any recommendations for getting better at Rust? In addition to just writing it? Not really. I would read the Rust book cover to cover. And then... From that point... I would... I, I mean, that's about it. Uh, we'll say a memory clobber here. 
That's not the issue, but I am going to say that there is a memory clobber because there is. I'm going to do that up here as well. Um, memory. I, I don't get that. Let me check the these as well. I want to make sure these have... Yeah, I want a memory clobber on these. Uh, I, I really don't need a memory clobber on those. We put a memory clobber on the CR3s. You know what? We'll put a, we'll put a memory clobber on this. To be honest. Because it does technically write to the VMCS region. Oh, this is getting confused about the assembly mode. This is not generating Intel assembly. What? What would this be on gas? It's just prens. Why is that broken? Weird. Oh, they renamed it to LVM assembly? Yeah, they did. Yeah, VTX sucks. VTX is pretty pretty shittily done. Once again, clearly done to make the hardware easier. And to make it so you just solve all the problems in software. I just I, I never get that mindset pushing off hardware things into software. It's just super annoying to me. Okay, so that's working. And a fef. So this is. I think these are read only, these pin based controls. Uh, easier to change software after the fact? I would disagree. I mean, that's why they do it, right? But I would disagree. Um, I mean, you can you can patch bugs, right? But this isn't this isn't this wasn't designed this way to patch bugs. This was designed this way to make the silicon easier, right? To make the work less. To reduce the amount of commitment that Intel had to make. I do agree if it were so it could fix bugs in post, sure, I'll give it that. But that's not what it's designed for. It's designed to literally just move the problems into software rather than in hardware. Okay, and this is um, gets the rec uh, the minimum uh, settings for all of the feature fields uh, from the processor. The processor requires that certain bits are set. This will get those lists of bits. And we don't need controls two for not using controls two. I mean, we are. Might as well fill it in. Anyways, this is... Um, oh yeah, that'll mask things off as well. Did I remove that comment? Where the fuck did I put that comment? I, I totally removed that comment. Have you done code for packing and unpacking the access bits in the GDT segments yet? That bit's probably the gnarliest. Yeah, I think that's that is probably one of the ugliest parts. We haven't gotten there yet. Um. Yeah, we're just gonna have to reset this. All right. Oh, 
Okay. So that should work just fine, and it does. That means we're writing all those VMCS entries, and now we need to actually create the register state. So this will basically um, bits that are. How is this done? We just and those together. I think the the top part is what's required to be one. Um. New running fields in the VMCS. Huh. Does that allow me to save and restore the whole VMCS? No, I mean, I can just save and restore the VMCS myself. Okay. The zero settings, and this is VM entry allows that to be zero if it's cleared to zero. If it's set to one, it fails if it's zero. So um, the control zero bits that are set in control zero must be set in the respective uh, respective VMCS. Um, control, and then bits that are set in control one, uh, bits that are z bits that are clear in control one must be clear in the respective VMCS control. Meaning that if we aim them together, that'll give us us that'll give us the correct set but this will allow us to basically disable or enable feature. This is telling us what the processor does and does not support. And for some reason, instead of like AMD, where you have everything zero, meaning not supported, uh, for some reason, Intel's decided that certain things are required and certain things are not. It's really, really, really stupid. Um, that's one of the reasons why this API sucks. But we should be able to set those. Yep, we got our soft reboots in. Okay, and since we're stylizing in this way, we don't need these paddings. In fact, we can just do this for these because they don't fit in one line anyways. Okay. As you 32, as you 32. As you 32, as you 32. Um, U32, and that should hopefully. Did we fuck up another one? Prens on two of these, and three of these. All right. This uh, never mind, we do need that because I want them to be U sixty fours. Yep. Alright. We'll just keep it as this. We'll get rid of this. Just to be explicit with those shifts, which I do like in this case. Alright, so now we need to set up the um we just need to set up the permissions and the segments and everything. Uh, so now it's just a lot of manual labor. So we want to set up the host information first. Um, so anything that's host, we want to set up such that we can restore the host state of these fields. So we're going to go and take a look at the field encoding and 16-bit fields. Um, and the host state field. So I only care about the host fields. Okay, we'll move that there. This. All right, so what we're gonna do is we are going to set up the host states such that when we transition back, these will get reloaded to their correct values. 
Okay, and we are in VTX, index and encoding. So these are uh, host ES selector COO. This is the host ES selector. Oops. Host ES selector ES CSSS DSFS GSTR. And now we just have to do this for a while. We literally just have to make descriptions of all these things. DSFS GSTR. CS. SS, DS, FS, GS, TR. And we should probably update these two, four, six, eight, A, C. Uh, low life peasant Python comp side major here. Just wondering what are the benefits for this hypervisor? Um, or for this hypervisor to spin up and kill VMs uh, millions of times a second, it's really just attention to detail. Um, and we don't have a transition all the way back to user space. Um, but that's largely what it is, is um, attention to detail and being designed to reset. KVM is not designed to reset. There's no, there's no way to reset something in KVM except for like mem copying the entire uh, part of memory. So this is actually going to track which memory has been changed during execution, and then it'll restore only the memory what is changed. Um, and there are a couple different techniques we can use to do that uh, that are supported on all processors. So we're not making anything processor specific, which is kind of nifty. OK. So what do we want? 64-bit host fields. So we're going to do all the host fields. And there, there aren't too many host fields, to be honest. The IE32 PATs and EFER, we don't really need those. Full and high. And these are 64-bit. Do I just want to make accessors that will know the size of these based on what you pass in? where my, I'll have like a write and it will know the size of what it takes. I probably should. How will I do that? I think I'd have to have like a write 16, write 32, write 64. It's mad relaxing and motivating to work on my side projects while they're talking in the background. Hell yeah, what's your project right now? Full. It only exists in the one. So all of these exist in all modes. Okay. These ones only exist with these settings. And that's to load the PAT and the EFER and global control. We're just not going to do those right now because we won't need it. Uh, host syscenter CS. OK. Host syscenter CS. OX 4COO. Host uh, syscenter CS selector. And we don't use syscenter, so we will never actually use that. Now we have the natural with fields and for host state. And these things only supported for load CET state and SSP. SSP and that and that. OK, yeah, these are all for uh, shadow stacks, which we're not going to do right now. So we'll have a uh, host CR0. Yeah, we'll do host crow in that stylization. 6COO, uh, host CR0 register, and these are natural with, host CR3, 662, 444, uh, four, four. host FS, base, 
So this is host FS base 6006. 6008, we have a GS base. Uh, we have a host TR base, which is a 6COA. We have a host GDTR base. Uh, TR base. GDTR base. That's not at A, that's at C. IDTR base. This is not at C, this is at E. We have a host IA32 sys enter ESP. Is that 10? And at 12, we have the sys exit, uh, sys enter EIP, sorry. Uh, sys enter EIP, sys enter EIP, this is ESP. It's important that I don't get any of these wrongs. And then a host RIP, host RIP. This is where execution returns back to, or RSP. Uh, 6014, 6016, this is the host RIP. Sweet. FS base, FS. GS base, uh, 02468 ACE, 0246, CR0, CR3, CR4, FS base, GS base, TR base, GDTR base, IDTR base, ESP base, EIP base, RSP, RIP. Done. Now, when we want to run a VM, Um, actually, we want to, like, initialize it. This will be, like, uh, this will be, like, init bool. And this is, uh, tracks if the VM-based controls, um, if the VM-based controls and, uh, and host and guest state has been configured. Um, hmm, if the VM base control, if the VM controls and, uh, unchanging host and guest state has been initialized. So for things that will never change during execution of the VM, uh, we will set up once. So we will reduce that, uh, entry cost. So it starts off as false. And then here we're going to say if... Um, if self.init is false, uh, do one time initialization. Oh, we just barely fit. Okay, and this is establish the VM controls. Okay, 152. Oh, and this will also track uh, tracks if the VM is a user mode VM or a uh, system VM. And this way, we will say that this is creating a user VM, which will not change. 175 didn't match on that. Okay. Isn't it just this? Pretty sure. Okay. And then at the end, this will do self.init is true. Um, we have initialized the VM. So that'll set up the control. So we'll only read and write those things once. Uh, okay, and both of those are working. Now, uh, set text width is 79. Oops. GQ that. Hey, Dankington, how's it going? 
Why is manual auditing so boring? Like for security research, I think it's quite fun. I mean, it, it really depends on the target. Some targets are pretty, pretty ass and some are really fun. Um. Hmm. What's a fun target in your opinion? I like network targets a lot. I like targets with a lot of state, a lot of globals, a lot of bugs. Mainly network services. No shadow stacks for where we're going. Hell no. So that'll set up all of the pin based controls. Now we need to actually program. So that's what we did. Now we need to set up the access rights for the guest. The host stuff is relatively easy. We have to know the bases of all these, but we can grab those pretty quickly. So I think it's probably safe to assume that these are not going to change. The host bases aren't going to change, and the crows aren't going to change. So we're going to write in, uh, write in the uh, host state, which will not change per run. And here we'll do CPU, VM write, VMCS, host CR0. Um, now, does this fail if we write something that's the wrong size? Let's try it. We're going to write, we're going to start by writing a host ES, and we'll write a 10 or 18. Let's see if this fails. Cell. So, um, ES as U64. I'm curious if this is going to cause a crash. Nope, we're able to just do a write, a 64 bit VM write, which would seem that it doesn't really matter then. Unless that's corrupting the, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing it just doesn't matter. Okay, so we'll VM write the host ES selector. And this will be CPU read ES. ES, CS, SS, DS, FS, GS. We'll grab the TR as well. Uh, CS, SS, DS, FS, GS, TR. Um, right, and we want to get all these from orange slice. Those, and we're just going to slide those in here. Put them right here. And then we'll change these from inline always to inline G. Um, I'll put a memory clobber on them. Doesn't really matter. Actually, these, these ones definitely don't need a memory clobber. They're just reading it. And then these are LLVM assembly. S asm with LLVM asm. That should build. This will fail because we don't have TR. Okay, so then we just have to load the TR. And I I don't know. If, you can't just move TR. Gets the TR selector value. Um, I think we have to do an LTR. There's no TR register. We can't do that. Uh... Read SS. Yeah, as you 64 for all these. Okay. Yep, undefined symbol TR. So we have to use LTR to do that. Uh, or actually STR. Uh, X86. Uh, 
Okay, so TR is going to be a U16. And then we will do a store the TR into a pointer to that, which is going to be a mutable reference to ret as mute U16. So that will write to an RM16 and will store the TR to that location. Uh, and then we'll mark the zero. Uh, make that mute. So that will store the TR into the memory contained at here, which is the mutable reference to the stack. So it's going to store to the stack with the TR register. OK, so that's going to set up all of those host states. Good. Um, this is uh, set host selectors. And I'm pretty sure that we have our enum. Our enum now has all host space fields. So we have all of the selectors. We have the sys enter cs, which is 0, because we don't use uh, sys enter. Sys enter cs. But that's setting all of those. We're going to set the host CR0. Um, CPU read CR0. 3 and 4. Write the FS base. GS base. Um, FS base. GS base. Set the host control registers 0, 3, and 4. Uh, set the host uh, selector or segment bases. Oh, I do have a GS base, but wow. Hmm. Set the GS base, and then we'll make an FS base one. P, replace all occurrences of GS with FS. And replace all occurrences of cap GS with FS. Then we just have to MSR for active FS base. And that is at 100, if I'm not mistaken. We'll check that. Yep, that's at 100. So we'll preserve all those things. Ooh, page fault. 6 of E7. That's going to be, I think that's the store TR. But why? Whoa. Uh, read TR. Ooh, that's not an output. It's an input. Um, and it clobbers memory. No outputs. We have one input, and it clobbers memory. That should fix that. OK, nice. And it works in hardware. Beautiful. So we also need to set the TR base. How the fuck am I going to get the TR base? What is the TR base? I guess, I think I want to save those in thread. The GDTR, the IDTR bases. We set those up in interrupt. Um, GDTR. Do you mainly audit source, uh, closed source stuff? Yes, all the time. 
GDTR, GDT. Okay, so we make it TSS. Hmm. Manually drop. I think I'm just going to whack those into... What's interrupts? Some interrupts. Yeah, why don't I just save the GDTR? I should not have that pub either. Um, we're going to have the GDTR. This is a vector. So I won't need manually drop. This is a box TSS. This is the TSS. Uh, TSS. The IDT. And this is a vector of IDT entries. And then this is a vector of GDT entries. If we set up a GDT, I think we do create a new GDT, don't we? GDT entry. Uh, we don't have GDT entries. I think we manually craft those. Yes, sir. So the GDT entries we manually craft. Interrupts, missing GDT, IDT, and TSS. Correct. And these, this TSS, will no longer be a manually drop. I don't know why I didn't do this before, where it would just create the boxes, fill these things in. That's the crit stack. That one does need to be manually drop. And that is from use core mem man uly drop. I mean, I could save that critical stack, but I, I kind of don't think anyone needs access to it. I uh, can't find IDT entry. I think I capsed it like that. Yeah, percent %s IDT entry with IDT entry. 209, TSS um, cannot deref a TSS. That makes sense. So we have to we have to drop the, we just have to get rid of that one deref there. Next, 271, uh, we'll have the GDT, the IDT, and the TSS, and we'll just save those into there. And 273, Okay, so we put the manually drop back in. So IDT is going to be a vector this capacity. The GDT will be a vector of this. We create that GDT entry with the GDT base. 277. Um, That's... And we got a wing on that. Cool. So interrupts should be unsafe to get access to that. And we'll do that by going into core locals, uh, pub space, uh, get access to the interrupt, interrupts. Pub on safe FN interrupts. This gives a reference to a lock cell, which is an option containing interrupts, I think. One fifty seven. Um, oh, yeah, lock interrupts. Uh, you know what? I think I've been stylizing more like this recently. Uh, interrupts. Then, boot args. That's fine being pub because it's a ref. The apic. Interrupts. We should make that free list non pub as well. Nevertheless, this is going to go kernel source. A pick. Well, 
I guess while we're in the A pick, we probably should do this. Remove access to the A pick. Um, A pick dot. A pick dot. Replace any instance of A pick dot with A pick friends dot. That kind of fucked us up in that spot. It might fuck us up in a couple more spots. I think we'll, um, I think we know they're all core, so we can do this. Okay. Oh, and we need to keep the core around. Core dot a pick. Okay, then we'll make a method for accessing a pick and free list. We'll just non-pub all these things, which is, uh, we're due. Get access to the a pick. A pick. This will one line. Get access to the, uh, what do we change? Free memory. I think so, right? Free list, okay. Get access to the free list. And then this will be free list. And I don't know what the type is for that. Page free list. How do you not lose your mind in Ida? Oh, Ida's. I'm I'm pretty used to Ida. Like, it's pretty pretty common for me to spend a lot of time in Ida in a given day. I use mainly Ghidra now, but I'm very comfortable in Ida. It just takes time. It just takes time. Um, epic. This is interrupts. This is also interrupts. Um. Private field, that's on interrupts. So we need to change all these. Free list, this is on MM, which we don't have open. We can fix that, so we'll go into here and we'll change this to free list. Change this to free list. Private field on main a pick. Panic. Hey! Cargo run. All right, so now everything should build. No warnings, no errors. Like motivation to RE after several hours, not the actual REing? I mean, that just comes down to my personality. So, I don't know. I don't know, you just like, every time you find a new function, you identify it and you name it something good, every, the clarity just goes up and it's like, the code gets exponentially more clear as you label things, which is so cool. It's one of my favorite parts is just like, labeling functions, making structure definitions and the code gets better and better and better and better and better and more and more clear. And then eventually it's like pretty readable and you get really comfortable with the code base. And at that point it's like you're reading C. I think that's one of one of my favorite parts is just that progression. It's it's just so addicting. Okay. Um close out some of these core locals. Don't need MM, don't need ACP, ACPI we don't need. Okay, so this should work, of course, in both hardware and the VM. 
We'll reset that, make sure it works all the way out from the bootloader, and it does. So that means that now we can go in and... Yeah, this part of the work is so boring, man. Um, get the FS base, the GS base, and then... I'm going to set the GDTR base and the IDTR base. So let the interrupts is equal to self dot interrupts dot lock. Um, get access to interrupt state, which will let us get access to our GDT, IDT, and TR bases. And then we'll do lock. Let's make that mute. Uh, it doesn't need to be mute. Interrupts is equal to interrupts as ref on wrap, and then we can write in the host uh, host um, table bases. So it'll be the GDTR base, the IDTR base, and the TR base. We'll do it in the same order. So this will be interrupts. Um, well, ref deref interrupts dot tss as const tss as u64. This is the, here we can just do the, um, this one I'm confident on because this will do interrupts dot gdt as pointer. As I sixty uh, as U sixty four, and then we'll get the IDT pointer, and we'll write that out uh, three twenty. So we're gonna go up to the gotta put a yeah yeah that's what it was. All right, and we can pull in those from interrupts. Use create interrupts. Um, we got a TSS, we got a GDT, and an IDT. Oh, we only need the TSS from this. That's probably not marked pub. Uh, struct GDT, or TSS. We'll make that pub. 312. Interrupts, not found on VM. Correct, yes, because that will be found on core. So get access to the interrupts, lock them down, and then those fields are private. Ooh. Ah, I think we can make these pub because it's unsafe to get access to these fields. Dispatch routines for interrupts. Yep, dispatch is core local. Cannot leak a private type, 85, IDT entry. All right. TR base, GDTR base, and the IDTR base. So we set all of those up. It should work no problem. Now... Sysenter ESP, uh, host, sysenter, information, VM write, VM CS, host, sysenter, ESP base, as U64, write into zero. We don't use syscalls once again. So EIP base and ESP base. And that's everything except for the RSP and RIP, which we will want to do per run. We will re-update those every time we enter and exit. Are you specifically on the Microsoft Vulnerability Research Team? Uh, yes, I I mean, Microsoft has multiple VR teams. But I am on, I forget the name of the team that I'm on. Uh, but it's like, uh, I think 30 or 40 engineers. I would say only like 10 of them are doing VR. A lot of them are doing mitigations and development work, which is arguably more important. It's actually probably like five to 10 people doing the VR on this team. But then there are different teams for 
a bunch of different um, Microsoft products. Okay. ESP base, EIP base. And at this point, we now need to set up the guest state, right? Pin based, execution bitmap, or exception bitmap, all these things we don't care about. I mean, we really care about them and we'll come back to them, but right now we, we don't. We don't care about them. PML, TSC offset. A lot, of the, a lot of these fields are only used if you enable certain features and functionalities. So these host ones, everything that we restore, I mean, technically, we would want to check that those things are not set. Host state fields, we did all of these, except for CET, load CET state. Okay, so then we set up all the guest state, and if I'm not mistaken, it's just pretty much just a bunch of manual labor. Unfortunately, it's just a bunch of fucking manual labor. <laughs> There's really no trick. Release docs for our jail clone user process so I can get my NT fork fuzzer to work. Oof. Sorry, it's, it's too private. Too, too sensitive, an API. <laughs> an API that you can get all the information about through symbols. It's too, it's too private. VMC's stuff is boring. Yeah, it's really fucking stupid, man. They do it in a terrible, terrible, terrible way. Um... Only used in those one settings. And a lot of these are only set based on the control fields. So let's check what kind of control fields we have. Um, where are the bits? Where do they mention the bits? There we go, control fields for VM execution. Interrupt exiting, all these different fields. Pin based, halt exiting, CR3 loads and store exiting. TSC offset, if RDTSC exiting control is zero and offsetting control is one, Read shadows. Uh. Hmm. Okay. APIC virtualization, don't really care about those. I think we pretty much just have to set up all of the, um, pretty much have to set up all the selectors. And we should be pretty solid. Set up all the selectors, the debug control patent EFER. I don't think those are used unless you have those bits set, which are entry controls. Uh, which is up here. Where are these at? We have execution controls. Then we, there are the secondary controls. I guess entry probably has their, yeah, has their own entry. Load debug controls. So that's if you need DR7 sets. If it's a 64-bit guest, and I realize this is kind of unreadable, but um, if it's a 64-bit guest set here, which you want to do. Um, 
There used to be symbols for MSMP engine. Got rid of it. There's one PDB on the symbol server. Like, private symbols or public symbols? There still should be public symbols for it, I think. Maybe not. Maybe they got rid of that. I, I could see them getting rid of that, actually. Nice. Don't even have pubs anymore on that. Um... Load the pat, load the EFER. We won't have those set. Um, but we should assert on them. So wh what we're going to do is um, sets the uh, controls you want here. So you'll, we'll do um, control one. We'll set the ones in control zero to what we want. So let pin based control zero or equals, or in this case, we want for a user mode guest, specifically for a user mode guest, we will do pin based control zero. This is a Vim entry control zero. We will uh, one shift nine. Um, actually, See, uh, let's entry, um, entry bits. One should, uh, set the controls you want to have here. So we will say it's a 64 bit guest and one shift. I think that's it. We just want that. We want to say, uh, set the controls you want here, and the controls you uh, set the controls you do and don't want here. So we'll say uh, entry bits want, and entry bits don't want. This will make sure that it's in the state that we expect. So we're going to say we don't want um, on entry, we want to be an a 64-bit guest. And then we do we don't want um, we don't want debug controls uh, load. We don't want Load debug controls. Um, load uh, perf i32 perf global control. Load i32 pat. Load i32 efer. Load i32 bound configs. Um, load IA32 RTIT CTL, and we don't want load CET state, right? So now we're going to make our own bitmap that's I don't want these features. Entry to SMM doesn't really matter. Or one shift 13, or one shift 14, or one shift 15, or one shift 16, or one shift 18 or one shift 20 and we should have that's seven different things one two three four five six seven 18 16 15 14 13 and then two so then we're going to assert that um uh, and this is going to be Validates that desired bits are uh, can be what was uh, wanted, what was desired. So we're going to say assert that the entry bits that we want and the entry bits that we want. Here I can actually just go through the sets. So we'll do this. Uh, let's. Um, checks is equal to, this will be a list of the things, we'll have entry, entry minimum, 
Right, entry control zero. Entry control one. Entry bits want, or we'll say entry want. I don't know why I say bits. Uh, entry bits off and entry on. Okay. I'll have entry on and entry off. Then for uh, must be one, must be zero. Uh, want, and then this is our on and our off. We're going to assert that the on and the must be zero MB1. And then MB0 is what must be zero. Assert that the on is equal to on. This is, uh, and then assert that the off and MB1 is equal to off. Must be one. Uh, on and that, and then off and then must be one. Is that the correct logic? The bits that we want, off, they must be zero. And if they must be one, if it's equal to off, no, I don't think this is the correct logic. It's close. For this in checks. Um, ref the whole thing. Set to on, and this I want and not that, right? Invert that. If I am not that, so this should fail, right? This should fail. Cool, and that's failing on the off checks. I think that has to be and not. Then look at the inverse of what must be one. So that will give us a bitmap of what can, must be one. This will give us a bitmap of what can be zero. And this should now work. So if the bits that are on and the must be zero is equal to on, God damn it. Ah, oh, why am I why can't I think through a fucking bit mask? Um God damn it. These are just so annoying, man. Must be zero and must be clear. So must be one. So if we and that and we make sure that none of it's got turned off and then here the ones that must be one i mean it's not a it's not this i don't think so they're not should have precedence over the end yeah um off maybe it's correct maybe there's something required on that i can't turn off In which case, it's doing its job. But I think this is correct. If we invert the must be one, that'll give us a bit mask. Wait, am I just doing this wrong? If on and that, oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. Um, yeah, this one I think is inverted, isn't it? Um, off and must be one. 
No, this this is not correct. Neither of these are correct. I basically want to say. And these are, what does this tell you? Bits that are clear must be clear. Bits that are clear. Yeah, it's not must be zero. It's, uh, uh, this is can be zero. Right? The bits that are set can be clear. Oh, but then we'd have to consult the other one. God damn it, this is so fucking stupid. I hate this shit. Oh. Why do they do this in the dumbest fucking way? Why isn't why aren't all features optional? Why do you have to support certain features? Oh yeah, because it probably saved someone 50 hours of dev when they made the hardware. Probably save them a couple gates. Ugh. So fucking stupid, man. Um, bits that are set in this must be set in their respective VMCS controls. So I think we have to do... Make sure... I think this one is not, not can be zero. Um, on and not CB zero, right? Uh, this is CB zero and on. So those are the ones that can be zero, which will be mainly Fs. And that's what we want. If it cannot be zero, then it has to be one. In which case, No, is it that? Oh my god, dude, why can't I think this through in my fucking head? Can be zero. Right, that CB zero, that came from control one. Bits that are clear in control one. T20 jumping jacks. Bits that are clear in control one must be clear in the respective VMCS control. So if they're set, if they're set, they can be one. So if we invert it, that will be the set. If we invert it, that'll be the set that must be zero. No. Can be zero, can be one. It's can be one. Right, control one. Must be clear, which means they can be one. So that's can be one. And then this is can be zero. So if right. If the bit that we want, if all the bits that we want can be one, then we're happy. 
right? And these are all the bits that can be one. And this will be sparse. Apparently not. Um, off can be zero. Because that's what that is, right? Can be zero, can be one. Can be zero. Bits that are set must be set. So that's not what it is. God, why do they do this in such a fucking confusing way? Oh my god, man. Uh... Allowed zero settings. They're allowed to be zero. The bottom bits indicate what can be zero. Indicate the allowed zero settings. If it is cleared to zero, if that is set to one, the entry fails. If the bit Oh my god, man. Don't you love this documentation, y'all? Look at this. <laughs> oh, it's so fucking confusing. Vim entry allows control X to be zero if it's cleared to zero. <laughs> Which means we invert that one. These are must be. If it is set to one, it fails if it's zero. So these are must be. If it's set to one, Oh, this is must be one. One in the mass, not, yeah. I know it, I know it makes sense. I'm just making sure I get the things right. Allows that to be zero if it's cleared to zero. If it is set to one, so that is must be one, correct? <laughs> then this one, wherever they describe it, allowed one settings, and that can be one. It allows control X to be one if that is set to one. If it's cleared to zero, it fails if it's one. So if the bits that we want can be one and the bits that we don't want, um, not must be one. I think this is correct, isn't it? All the bits that we want can be one. And all the bits we don't want... Um, must be one. That's can be zero, right? This is can be zero. Isn't this correct? Or do I have to and the two mass together? No, I shouldn't have to. Given that Intel is sane and they don't report things with conflicting requirements, but in that case, I can't do shit anyways. So that means that there's a feature, must be one. Those are things that must be one. There's things that can be one. And here are things that we want on, and things that we want off. Uh, 
And then we can also print must be one. The inverse of must be one is can be zero, right? Okay, so here are the things that must be one. Oh, and there's something off. I see. It, it's, it's working, I think. Because we apparently need to have this uh, debug controls required on Skylake. On entry, we want. On entry, we don't want. 64-bit guest. And load debug controls, which is uh, one shift two. What's your typical stream schedule like? I do not have a stream schedule. Wait, that doesn't work? Oh, this. Hey! And then we can make a comment. MB1 must be one. Can be one, can be one. Let's must be zero is equal to not must be one. Or it can be zero. And then we can do this. Um, compute what can be zero. And things that do not have to be one can be zero, at which point we have these masks. Generally though, like twice a week, it, it varies. Like I normally stream every single day and then I take a break for a month. So there's like, there's like no schedule right now. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of all over the place. Um, and I probably want to check all the controls. Execution controls, entry, exit. And for MSRs. And that's only used on, so on exit, save debug, host address space. That's probably important. <laughs> Um, here we're going to say, on exit we want, let's exit on is equal to, um, I guess save debug controls we'll want, and uh, save debug controls and uh, host is 64 bit which it is just in all cases okay and then on exit we don't want these are exit off Let's see if we can get by without the save debug controls. Save debug controls. Load this. Acknowledge interrupt on exit. Save i32 pat. Load i32 pat. Uh, oops. 
save i32 efer load i32 efer save preemption timer clear i32 bound configs conceal vmx uh, we don't we don't care about that that doesn't really matter and preemption timer we don't really care about We actually kind of want that. Clear I32 RTIT control and load CET state and then probably a store CET state. Okay, nice. So these bits are save debug controls, one shift two or one shift ek, ek. acknowledge. Um uh, load perf. We don't care about that. Save i32 pat. Load i32 pat. EFER 21. EFER bound configs. Um, RTIT, CET. This is probably not going to work. Well, we got a entry. This is exit control zero, exit control one, exit on, and exit off. Probably, there are probably some bits here that we cannot have, have in this state. Yeah, and that's the can be zero. So there's something we want off that can't be. It's probably this. I'm just guessing before checking because I think it'll be faster because I'm I'm pretty confident. Here we go. Yeah, we're fine. Works on hardware as well. Okay. So what we're doing is we're making sure that it's going to behave as we expect. On AMD, we can just set things to zero and just assume that they behave in the default way. But on Intel, things can default to being used and not being used. So basically on Intel, the hypervisor's in a different state on like every architecture that you use. So we're just making sure that it behaves exactly as we expect it to. And then if we hit these assertions, we'll change them. As someone who comes from lower level languages like C and assembly, how do you find Rust performs in being able to write systems with fewer defects? Uh, it, it outperforms C and assembly by a metric landslide. It's not even comparable. C and C++ are, or C and assembly are just jokes compared to Rust when it comes to uh, writing things with fewer defects. They just, you just can't, you can't write C without defects. You just can't. I mean, you can, theoretically, you can. But no one ever has in the history of humanity. Ever. <laughs> so I think the odds that someone writes something without a defect is basically zero, given that no one has ever done it before. It would be legendary if someone did it. <laughs> it would be fucking nuts. Um, let's see here. Do do do. VM entry. And then execution control, we have the pin-based controls, processor-based controls, external interrupts cause VM exits. Yeah, we definitely want those. So here we'll say, um, let pin on um, for... Uh, we want pin entries, uh, external interrupt exiting, NMI exiting. Uh, if this control is one, NMIs are never blocked, and the blocking by NMI bit in the interruptibility states, NMI window exiting. Yeah, we'll probably want that. Process posted interrupts. Treats interrupts with the posted interrupt vector, updating the VAPIC with posted interrupt requests. Okay, we just want those two. 
one shift zero or one shift three. Someone's laughing at you. All the code is perfect when he's eating this foot cheese. Oh, yeah. And then... I think we don't really care about the rest of the pin entries. Let pin off is zero. So this is pin. Pin based. Pin based. And then this is pin on. Pin off. So this should be fine. Noise. Okay, and then um, the processor ones. Interrupt window exiting. It exits when IF is one and there are no other blocking and there's no other blocking of interrupts. Yeah, that's for interrupt windows. We don't care about that. TSC offsetting, don't care about that. Hull exits, invil pig exits, m weight exits. It's like, we basically want exits on fucking everything. <laughs> and then if we have secondary. Um, if it is zero, RDTSC is an invalid opcode. VPID, write back invalidates, unrestricted gas. PCID, already RAND exiting, already seed exiting. Enable, uh, it sets an EPT birdie, dirty bit, sets an entry in the page modification log, which I think we'll want to use PML. Oh my God, there's so many things. <laughs> so many things. We're so fucking close, man. We're gonna ignore these. These are execution-based controls. So pin-based controls are like pin on the actual pins, like referring to like interrupt pins and vectors and lines. And the um, the entry bits are referring to uh, what happens when you enter a VM, exit what happens when you exit a VM, and then execution, the processor-based things, what happens when certain conditions happen while executing in the VM. So this allows you to hook different things that happen inside the VM. So right now, we actually want exception exiting. Uh, one, VM exit occurs at the beginning of any instruction if there's no virtual NMI blocking. Okay. Where's the, where is the exception handling? Oh, that's just done entirely via the exception bitmap. The exception bitmap contains one bit for every exception. Okay, so we want the exception bitmap and then the IO bitmap has an address. If bitmaps are used that, and I'm pretty sure if we don't use IO bitmaps, if we don't use MSR bitmaps, don't use MSR bitmaps. If they're not used, all executions to read MSR and write MSR cause VM exits. That's what we want. And then we want IO bitmaps. If it's zero, unconditional IO exiting. Uh, if it is one, zero means don't use that. If it's if they are used, that setting is ignored. And then this controls whether executions of ins and outs cause VM exits, which we want them to. <laughs> but let's find the um, exception stuff. We're we're pretty close. We're probably like an hour and a half away from VM execution. It's just it's just a bunch of manual work, and then we can actually do research, but. Until then, we just we just gotta bang our head against this table and fill in all these fields. It it sucks, man. I wish we didn't have to. I wish we could just start going right away. If this were AMD, we could, but on x86, we just kind of have to do all the shit manually. 
Um, pin based controls, control fields. We want to do PML. We're going to want to try out PML. I've actually never used PML before, so that'll be a first for me. That logs the pages that have been dirtied while executing. And I'm super excited to use that because I've, I've never used it before. Um, Processor-based execution controls. Exception bitmap. Right here. Exception bitmap is equal to OX1234-4004. This is uh, exception um, VM exit bitmap. And we'll set this to up here. Oh, uh, we want to OR in pin on or exit on or entry on. And then uh, exit on all exceptions. CPU VM write VMCS exception bitmap as U64. Just write all Fs to it. That is a 32-bit field. This may fail because they're writing top bits, but I think it just ignores it, and it does. Okay, so now we exit on all exceptions. We don't exit on a lot of conditions that we need to, the proc-based controls, but that's acceptable for now. So now we can start working on what we need to set up. Um, we set that host address space to one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, host is 64-bit, save debug controls. All right. So what do we want to control in the guest? We want the guest ES uh, selector. Uh, guest ES selector value. Paste, 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 paste. Got a lot of these guest fields. PML index. Virtual interrupt delivery. Yep, those are both off. So we have ES. Setting up these socks, man. These, these, this next part is what I've been dreading. ES, SS, DS. FS, GS, CS, SS, DS, FS, GS, LDTR selector. That's not the LDT. Oh, yeah, that is the local descriptor table. LDTR selector. It doesn't save the host LDTR? Okay, so I would have to do that myself. Um, local. Uh, task register, and this is the task register. And that is, okay, so, ESCSSS, DS, FSGS, LDTR selector, TR selector. Now we're gonna set this to a two, four, six, eight, A, C, E. Two, four, six, eight, A, C, E. Okay. Now we have 64-bit guest state fields, and I think the debug control is always written. PDPTE0. What are those for? Enable EPT. Okay, that makes sense. You know, tell us what bin you found your first big vulnerability on. Um, I guess Chrome Sandbox, maybe? I don't know, just Chrome Browser, actually. Maybe Firefox, maybe Opera? I don't know. I, I basically simultaneously found bugs in all browsers on the same day. Because I wrote a fuzzer. <laughs> it's just, it's just kind of what happens when you write a fuzzer. You just find bugs in everything. So it was kind of parallel in all those. I don't know, because that's what I started off with. I started off with a browser. I'm trying to think if I if I did something prior to browsers, and I don't think so. 
Yeah, I don't I don't think I did. I think browsers were my first first things I look at looked at. Um it's probably Opera first, I think. Opera fell over really easily. At the time. That was before Opera used WebKit under the hood. BMCS link pointer. I don't know what that is. At all. <laughs> oh, is that for nested vert? Is that how you do nested vert? Maybe nested vert isn't too hard. Debug control. Um, okay, so let's see if debug control is triggered by the, uh, the debug stuff. Debug controls, I'm gonna guess it is. Yeah, I'm, it definitely is. So we will grab that field as well. So we'll have a uh, guest IA32 IA debug control, OX2802, uh, and this is low and high. This is the Oh, it, um, we're only 64 bits, so we don't care about the high because these are always going to be 64 bits. It's full. I think full basically means that, uh, this will probably describe it, but I'm guessing that if you are in 64 bit mode, you use the full one. Um, maybe they don't describe it. They have two encodings, different on bit zero, the access type. A full access and an odd encoding for a high access. Yeah, we can do a full access. Because we're only 64 bits as a host. We'll eventually want to support multiple guests. But this is the... Um, we didn't do high and low for any of these. I don't think so. Perfect. So this is going to be the guest IA32 debug control register. And that is at... Is that really at 2802? Yeah, I think it is. 802 and debug control what is it debug ctl debug ctl c table 22 be really nice if that were a link but it's not. Here we go. This is the LBR format PEBS. We can just set it to, oh, never mind. That's not it. That's definitely not it. Uh, debug control, rewrite, bran uh, last branch record, BTF. We actually can use these for um, tracing, but we're going to just set them to zero. So, um, set up guest state and we'll do CPU VM right VMCS remember this is not for uh, systems this is only for running a um, a user land application which is all we're gonna get to today right Debo control to zero we have the patent EFER we know those aren't getting updated the rest we know aren't getting updated so that leaves 64-bit guest fields that's everything and then these so we need the limits all these are, are relatively straightforward. We just have to type them all out. These limits will all be uh, zero. Guest ES limit is equal to 4,800. Guest ES limit uh, segment ES. CS, SS, DSFS, GS, LDTR, TR, GDTR, IDTR. This music is is kind of kind of me j making me jam out, but also like not what I want to listen to. It's this weird like mix of I'm like I'm feeling it, but I don't know if it's what I want to listen to right now. Uh, A, B, Ace, uh, 10, 12. Okay. Guest. Yeah, you know what? 
I'm actually I'm actually jamming onto this. It's pretty good. S S D S F S G S L D T R T R G D T R I D T R I think those are literally all going to be zero. <laughs> Pretty much all these things are going to be zero. Well, the access rights won't be. Um, this. Yoink. Paste. This. S segment limit. Access rights. S limit access rights. Okay, so we got the limit, we got the access rights. Um, then we got to update these. These are all wrong. Uh, 14, uh, 16, 18, 1A, 1C, 1E. 20, 2, 2, 14, 16, 18, 1A, 1C, 1E, 20, 2, 2. Not very experienced by this stuff. By user line application, do you mean something running in CPU mode corresponding to rank 3? Yes, correct. We actually might have it wrong as ring zero with direct physical memory access. Maybe. <laughs> we might we might do some weird shit. Um 14, 16, 18, ACE 2022. Okay, guest interruptibility state. OX 4824, guest SM base, guest IA32 sys enter CS, 6 and 8, don't care about the preemption timer right now, uh, guest interruptibility state, pretty obvious, uh, guest uh, I think SM base is system management mode, but we'll just say SM base because I don't know what it is. And this is guest um, IA32 sys enter CS MSR. Okay, then we have natural with fields for the guest. All the bases for all the things. Oh my god, it that doesn't end, man. Oh, guest guest CR zero. 6800 guest CR0 guest CR3 guest CR4 3 4 4 2 uh basis for everything include including All of these. Segment limit. This will be uh, S segment limits segment base. Is it backward from sitting a lot? Not really. I, I rotate my sitting position quite a bit. And I have a really nice chair. Base G. Okay. Then this is... Uh, Six, eight, O, oh. ESCS, SSDS, FSGS, LDTR, TR, GDTR, IDTR. Okay, so we have a six hundred six. No, that's not sixty eight hundred. That's sixty eight oh six, sixty eight oh eight, sixty eight oh A. 
680C, 680A, 680E, 680, uh, 6810, 6812, 6814, 6816. Does it end on 6816? Nope, we are off by one. 6, 8, A, C, E, 16, 18. 6, 8, A, C, E, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. All right. Now we have the guest DR7. Uh, 6, 8, 1, A. We have the guest RSP. Guest R... OX 681C RIP. That's the good one. That's what we care about. That's why we're doing all this. R flags. 6822. No, I'm off. 1A, 1C. 1E, 20. Skip to activity base. I Maybe? Where? That's a Herman Miller chair? Yeah, this is, uh, this is an Arian. Um, right before SM base. SM base was a 64 bit field, I think. 32 bit field? Activity state? I did miss that. Wait. Yes, because this is activity state. Thank you for that. Uh, guest. SM base guest activity states is equal to OX forty eight two six. This is forty eight twenty eight. And then this is a uh, forty eight two C. No, S two A. Forty eight two A. We'll we'll go and re verify all these when we're done. But yeah, that would have been we would have been off on a couple of them. Um, um, May I ask what a hypervisor is? A hypervisor is the, um, it's basically a hardware isolation between two different states of the processor. It allows you to run an operating system inside of an operating system by kind of isolating it out. Um, and that's what we're using it for. We're using it to isolate a different state that's going to be a kind of a hostile environment that we're going to end up breaking and crashing over and over again. So we want to harness that thing in a way that when it breaks and crashes that we get notified of it and we're able to just um, reset it back to original state and we can log that information. So we can kind of hold these crashes in place and make sure they don't kind of pollute the whole system. So it's mainly just for isolation, but this is what things like VMware and VirtualBox use to allow you to run Windows on Linux and vice versa. Um, R flags, guest R flags, pending debug. Uh, this is gonna be the I, IA32 sys enter ESP 24, 26, 26, this is the EIP, 
I should have. I, A32, sys, enter, ESP. What is RIP? RIP is the instruction pointer. That's what the IP stands for. And it basically, oops, system, uh, sys, enter. It basically indicates what the processor is currently working on. So it points to the, the code that the processor is currently executing. And it's how the processor knows what it has to do next, because it will grab something from the location that's executing, and then it will increment it to beyond to the next line of code effectively. And then when that has happened, um, once that has happened, the, uh, the processor will just load that and continue the pipeline. And that's basically how processors work. Uh, at, an at an extraordinarily high level. Um, What are your thoughts on governments using contract tracing in order to track uh, quarantine offenders? I think it's pretty sketchy. I think it's a slippery slope. I don't think that's what they're asking for the permission for. CR0, CR3, CR4. Now I'm just now I'm just verifying all these. ES base, six, CS base, eight, SS base, A. DS base, 680C, C, FS base, E, 10 for GS base, LDTR base is at 12, TR base is at 14, GDTR base is at 16, IDTR base is at 18, DR7 is at 1A, RSP is at 1C, RIP is at 1E, RFLEX is at 20, Pending debug, debug exceptions is at 22. Syscenter ESP is at 24. And Syscenter EIP is at 26. So those look good for that set. Let's check the 32-bit states, which are all these fours. ES limit is at 4,800. CS limit is 4,802. SS limit is 4,804. DS limit is 4,806. FS limit is 4,808. 480A for GS, LDTR limit is 480C, TR limit is 480E, GDTR limit 4810, IDTR limit 4812. I'm basically a data entry person. ES access rights is at 14, CS access rights is at 16, SS access rights is at 18, DS, FS, GS is at 1A, 1C, 1E, LDTR and TR 20 and 22. Interruptibility state will be found at 24. Activity state is found at 26. SM base is found at 28. And syscenter CS is at 2A. Checks out. I feel like I'm validating like a bingo on a bingo card. <laughs> I32 debug control is at 2802. That's for the full. Then we have the 16 bits. 0248. 2468 ACE 1012 02468 ACE no 10 cuz they're not storing guest interrupt status Woo! uh g g u g thank you for that one Oh, I think we're there. I think we're I think we're perfect. So, uh, does a guest OS run as a host OS process, but in a VMX state, it runs in kind of an isolated container. That that's up to kind of the OS and how to interpret that. But typically, it would not be reflected as a process. Um, it's kind of it would be managed by the operating system as kind of a whole different meaning. So, yeah. I32 debug control. Okay, so 
CPU, VM writes, VMCS, guest ES selector, we're gonna say zero. And I think we can get away with this. As long as something doesn't load a selector for now, we'll eventually have to actually give it a valid table for these. CS, SS, DS, FS, GS. This might be mad at me for this. LDTR, TR cell. Technically, these are like not valid, what we're doing here. But given no one actually loads those selectors, it shouldn't matter. Then we have the debug control. Now we have the limits for all of these. And we have limits for everything, including a GDTR and an IDTR. So we'll have a GDTR and an IDTR. And instead of selectors, these are now limits. And this one is actually correct for 64-bit. Then we have all the access rights for everything. Well, only for this set. Um, S cell access rights, G. Those access rights are very wrong. This will not work. Uh, CPU, VM rights, V VMCS. Uh, TR access rights. Interruptibility state is zero. Activity state. SM base. Syscenter CS. Now we're gonna set the CRs, the guest CR0. And this is actually gonna be the host CR0. Um, read CR0. And we're gonna actually give it access to the CR3 and the CR4. We're gonna change that CR3 very, very, very soon, but we're hacking. Then we have the bases for everything, which are all of these. S limit base G. Okay, now I also wanna get rid of this uh, allow unused. And I'm gonna put the allow unused in net. I don't think I can do that. Is that module wide? Yes, that is. I don't like doing that though. They're in order, we'll, we'll go through it. Uh, I'm just gonna use this to let it tell me what I have and haven't used, because I wanna make sure that I'm using everything in here. Uh, guess DR7, that's easy, that one actually can be zero. Those bases are correct, by the way. Guest RSP, this is where the stack will be for the guest. We won't give it a stack, and we won't give it an, an RIP either. R flags, um, this will be equal to, um, I think just two. Um, sandpile.org. I'm gonna look at the initial state of the processor to find the R flags, but I'm pretty sure it's just two. Yeah, it's just two. Then, uh, pending debug exceptions, uh, VMCS, this as U64, write a zero in there, paste, paste. I32 sys enter ESP and EIP. That should be using everything. Host rip, host R SP not used. That is fair. Okay, so now we're gonna unsafe. We're gonna enter the VM. To enter the VM, I'm going to save off the RSP and the RIP of the host. Uh, Asm. This is Intel syntax and it's volatile assembly. We're gonna have a memory clobber on here to make sure memory has been synced. And then uh, VM launch. I think you do a VM launch the first time you enter a VM, if I'm not mistaken. And then from that point on you do uh, VM enter. 
Um, let's see what I do up here. Yeah, set the host. Yep. This is effectively what I want. Um, get rid of the VM launch. And now, tab, oh fuck, wrong side. Tab, tab. And we'll put some spaces around this so it's a little bit more standout-ish. So here we're gonna write the host CS, host rip. We're gonna have a Rax clobber and RBX clobber. So Rax and RBX are gonna be clobbered. This is LLVM assembly. So this is unlikely to work, I think. Holy shit. Print VM exited. Oh my god, first try? No. Okay, now we check the statuses. Uh, oh, wow. So we're gonna VM read the exit reason. This is uh, VMCS as U64. And then the instruction error, we'll grab this as well. Uh, VMCS in VM instruction error as U64. Why don't I just make that take an enum? What am I fucking doing, man? Uh, as U64, as U64G. VM read. Yeah, oh, because it's in CPU. Uh, VM write. Change anything where it's CPU VM write into a VM write. Okay, and same for VM read. Okay, and now we will yoink that out of uh, SP uh, shared CPU source lib VM write delete those and I do read before write anyways so I'll put this in VTX these are just helper routines we'll move this one above oops Then it'll take a VMCS. We can uh, derive clone and copy for this. This will be a VMCS, and so will this. All right, uh, 554. These are as U64, as U64, as U64. That's just because we copy replaced a little too many things. Uh, as you 64 for all these okay VM read for uh, 649 these are unsafe and now we'll see the VM exit reason something failed didn't it or did that work um, can't leak private type yeah no problem don't need to be pub. Good evening, Nightshade, dude. How's it going? Came here to play, pay tribute to Gamosa, our lord. Oh, man. Don't worship me, please. <laughs> Brains, man. Hello, Gamosa. How's it going? Wondering when you want... Uh, do you have some music... Uh, uh, have some music? Like, do I have some music playing in my headset right now? Yes, I do. I'm always listening to music. I, I cannot not listen to music. I I need music at all times. Are you building full supervisor with UI for making VMs? No, I'm not. There will not be a UI for this. Okay. Is that a valid exit? No, it's not.
That I mean, that looks like the... We did hit VM launch, right? If I int 3 here, this crashes. Correct. Start on hardware. Hardware, we get the same thing. 4402. But that's literally the exit reason. Uh, is that cast fucking something up? I don't think so. VM read. Okay, I'm doing something really stupid here. What is it? VM read. Ret. I'm so confused. Why is that returning literally the the, the index? VM launch. You can't have the same, you can't use the same register. I bet that's what it is. I bet you can't use the same register for the operands. They must be different. Uh, from VMCS and stores it. Non read from the current, yep. If we're non root, it's by the link of the current VMCS. Oh, so that is how you do nested vert. We actually could do nested vert probably not too difficultly then. Destination. If the VMCS field is shorter than the effective operand size, the high bits are cleared to zero. If it's longer, if it's longer, the high bits are not read. Ret. Um, Russ be, Russ seems to be doing something weird here, man. 4402. Well, that's for the call. That's for call, that's for the print. We have two prints. Move EAX that. The code is technically not 64 bits. I'm going to force different source and destination. I'm going to force that this is in RCX just to see. Okay, what the fuck? That's an R. In 64 bit mode, it's always 64 bits. Dude, what am I doing? What am I?
What if I don't do a VM launch? Maybe I'm off on those fields. Am I supposed to be using index and not encoding? No, I'm supposed to use encoding. Yeah, I'm supposed to be using encoding. Exit reason. Exit reason, I think that's a... Forty four hundred instruction error. Intel volatile. I mean it's it's literally reading it and then putting it as the argument for the print. How would that just have some random shit in it? I feel like Rust is doing something really weird here. As U64, as U64, oh, whoops. Rat. Encoding, zero. Oh, are they not getting set? Are we looking at uninitialized data? Well, in that case, this would... Why would this be different? Oh, because it changes the, the size of the code? Um, let's go look at VMCS. It's uninitialized. This whole thing's uninitialized. Check this out. Uh, mute. VMCS. No, it should be initialized to zeros. What the fuck? Why is it giving me a pointer? Five. Is like everything fucked up? Stack. What do we do for the stack? We save the current stack there. Oh, VM launch. We weren't VM launching. Yeah, we turned that off. Okay. What? Uh, yeah, we'll put this back in RCX. And this, this fails in the same way, where it just gives the number. Wait, what? One. Put this back in a register. This just gives us the value on both hardware and in the VM. VM launch. Uh, sushi roll sort, um, orange slice, kernel source main. Take a look what we do here. Read the abort indicator. Maybe that matters. Oh, am I not setting clobbers on this? No. Rax is clobbered. RBX is clobbered. It could be fucking with the state of the system because we could be hitting an exception. Maybe we don't want to give it access to our CR3. We'll just say the guest CR3 is zero. Just in case it's kind of like fucking with some, some stuff in our own memory. It's not. We'll grab that abort indicator from the VMCS region. Let VMCS, let VMCS is equal to core VMCS.
Read the board indicator from, uh, is that actually the VMCS? Self. From the VMCS, we don't have try into. Board indicator is zero. What? I'm so confused. There I'm writing rel rip and then I launch the VM. Host, bases, R flags two, DR seven. Let's set to four hundred. I don't think that's it though. Minimum CR0, minimum CR4. Access rights. We don't set those, but I don't think that should matter. Guess, Pat, we're not swapping in and out. Okay, what if I do it before? We're going to try it before. If this works before and then it stops working, then we clearly clobbered something when we did a VM launch, but that's not the case. So something's happening here. <gasps> Are these backwards? No. RCX. Explicit RCX. How is that different? How is that different? VM read? Zero RCX before VM read? Well, I, 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 I shouldn't have to zero it. Move that into ECX and VM read that. To check if the instruction is actually writing out. Okay. I respect that. It is not. Why would VMread not be doing anything? Let's try it on hardware. Clearly, it's like something very basically stupid that I'm doing right now. It has to be 64 bits, okay. Like, that's a really bizarre... Execution, in my opinion. Um, that will write to that register, which is an output. I mean, clearly that's what it's doing. Why would it be different with RCX and, zero, uh, and 1? Why would that change it? Well, now it doesn't because we zeroed it out. 
Well, I see, I see why. Because it changes the register allocation that's used. Why would that not cause the value to be written? VMCS. VM pointer load. Let's check that. We're going to load the address of the VMCS. It's correct. What? And that's what we use up in this. We read from 4400. Activate with that. Got CC and memory clobbers on that. Then we read that with VM read. What? What if I do this before I load the host pointer? Before I before I load uh, an active VM pointer, what happens? Dude, I have no idea what's happening. VM pointer load. Here's the VM read. And then that calls write. If we're in root operation and the current VMCS pointer is not valid, that's probably what it is. What are we? We write the revision number into the VMCS. And it just does nothing. So that's clearly what it is, um, VMCS. When we make a VMCS, We also have to copy the revision into the VMCS. Well, that's the VMX homepage. No, this is a different. No, I copied that revision number. That must be what I have to do. That silent failing is bizarre, man. What a really weird way. What a really weird way of doing that. It just silently doesn't work. Holy sh shit. That's disgusting. VMX on, VM pointer load, get the revision number, uh, here, get the revision number and copy that in, let this, 
It makes sense. It's just bizarre. Get the revision number, and then we want to copy the revision number into... Uh... and write it into the VMCS. Why wouldn't that fail on VM pointer load? This is VMCS. Unsafe. Cannot borrow as mutable. Mute. Okay. Wow, it just silently doesn't do anything. Woo, abort indicator is zero. Okay. I think we print the abort indicator up here. No, we don't. All right, VM exit, now we can see why we exited and the instruction error. So now we can look at the VM exit reasons. The lower 16 bits are the exit reason. And the top bit, here we go, reason. Top bit is VM entry failure. Okay, so we failed to enter the VM. And the reason is a uh, one at a uh, twenty one, which is a thirty three. Invalid guest state failed one of these checks. CR three. Okay, let's write in that CR three again. These are just all the checks we have to pass. Um, they must each contain a, a canonical address. Okay, they do, which is zero. I mean, we fuck up our segments a bit. Use an I3, this is DWM. Bit 31, they each must be one. not supported in VMX operation. We're using literally our CR states. Corresponding to CET. The load debug controls is one. The bits reserved must be zero in that. Thus, this check is performed unconditionally in some older versions. And that is uh, debug CTL debug DR7 debug control. We write zero to that. What is that value on start debug control? It's probably just zero. Zero is fine. If that, then CR0, yep, paging must be enabled. CR3 must be valid. If that is set, bits 63 through that have to be set in DR7 to zero, which they are.
Those must have a canonical address. Load CET, we're not using. Um. Oh, on the segment registers. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. I was like about to say, none of these should be broken. Uh, I guess segment registers. Um, selector checks. Um, yeah, we're just going to give it directly. Uh, we're going to directly give it access to the host registers. So the basis for all these will be zero, LDTR will be zero, TR base will actually be the host's base. That interrupt base. I copied pasted that in such a fucked manner. And then I screwed up all the commas. At least to my stylization tastes. Fuck. Okay, the limits. Uh, if the guess will be V8086, must be that. Otherwise, uh, those must be canonical. If LDTR is usable, it must be canon. Um, CS, those must be zero for the base address. Those must be zero. Limit fields must be that for V86. Access rights. Oh, yeah, we don't set up any of the access rights. Um, we got the type. Uh, should be the permission level. Oh, DPL they put there. Okay. Um... Now are these bits? Yeah, we didn't we didn't set these up at all. LDTR must be LDT. Only apply if the LDT is usable. Checks on these. Must be canon. Or the L bit is not set. Okay. So for these, we need to set up our permissions. Um, if the control is zero, it must be 9, 11, 13, or 15. If the control is one, it must be either three, 9, 11, or 13. Uh, so these fields we will get directly from our interrupt stuff. I'm pretty sure the fields are, um, I think it's this. I'm pretty sure. Well, these are 16 bits. So these are packed. I think they're the same bits though from the access rights of the GDT of the descriptors. So let's take a look at the descriptors. Because I, I think that is the case. So we want to look at segmentation, uh, which is protection. Um, system descriptor types, not IA32 mode. Using segments. There we go. Yeah, the CPL, the requested privilege level is there. There we go. Here's a descriptor. What section are we in? Is this for 64 bit? 
Yeah. So the base address will be zero, and then the permissions. Is it these 16 bits? So it's a type, S must be one, DPL, P for present, software available, all those states. Uh, DB. Oh, they're split up a little bit. So that's eight bits, and then there are four more bits there. Reserved. Oh, uh, if it is usable, they must be zero. That's the seg limit. So the 16 bits are these 16 bits with the seg limit zeroed out. That's what they do. Okay, so then it's 9A. Right? 9A00. Uh, oh, that's 16 bit. We don't want that. We want 32 bit, 29A. So this bit, this 20, that should be, uh, that's bit 13. So bit 13 should be the L bit, which is uh, whether it's a long mode segment. And let's see if that is 12. Um, P. Did they not use it? I swore I saw. What? What? I didn't see the L bit. Bit 13. Reserve slash L. Oh, they must all be zero. Oh, if it's V886. If it's not V886. It doesn't mention what 13 is. All right, well, whatever it is, so that is a code segment, and this is a data segment for 64-bit. Shouldn't that be 20? 20? 29.2? Um, shouldn't it be 29.2? I think it should be. Let me check. I'm pretty sure that should be 29.2. Um... Bootloader source. Uh, bootloader source stage zero. Hmm. I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be 20. Let's. That would mean I've been using 32 bit segments. Reset. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah, that's de definitely supposed to be 20. Anyways, uh, so this is 29.2 for all these. 29.2, 29.2, Okay, and then LDTR and TR. I think the access rates are the same on those. Then the bases. If it will not be IA32, if it is that, it must be 11, which is busy for TSS. So let's take a look at what we fill in for the TSS. Oh, we construct it. So for this, we will do LDTR won't be active. The TR will be one shift seven or 
11. It's the TR mode. What else? GDTR. IDTR. Must have canon addresses. RIP R flags. I have must be one. If the valid bit in the interruption information field is one, and the interruption type activity state, interruptibility state must be zero, pending debug, debug exceptions. Do we set a link pointer? It's just zero by default. Um, CR3 paging. All right, let's see. I wonder if it's because So hard to say if it's segmentation or not. 29A. Oh, 29 29A. There we go. Fuck. Limits, selectors. Oh, this is so annoying. All right, we'll set up the GDT base and we'll set these selectors to be what we currently use um, in stage zero. So we'll use for this, this will be 30 and this will be 28. Uh, the TR selector will be zero. I'm hoping I don't need an LDTR. I don't think I do. So we'll load up those. And then the base. Rip RSP. Let's give this um let's give this some fucking memory somewhere. Uh what do we want to point RSP and R? Mm. Where do I want to put those? Let's do uh, let bytes is equal to four OX41 for 32. Inst bytes and stack bytes. CR3, ES base, all those are zero. TR base, GDTR base. This is the um, GDT base. IDT base. This will be inst bytes or stack bytes as pointer. As U64, stack bytes as pointer. As U64, these will be instruction bed bytes. TR base. Pretty sure I don't have to set these. Oh, access rights. All right. I guess we got to go through the list. Got to go through the list of everything. Um, 
if any of these things fail, we just get that error code, right? That's, that's how this works. There's no, there's no error code that tells you what happened. It's any of these uh, five pages of errors could have happened. So then you have to randomly figure out which one happened. <laughs> this is how it works. It's great. It's a fantastic API. It's like, why did it fail? Nah, one of, one of these f five pages of reasons. If any of these bits is off by one, we will fail. <laughs> CR0 is valid. CR4 is valid. Debug controls. All the reserve bits must be zero. Done. Uh, if it's a 64-bit guess, which it is, paging must be enabled, which it is. CR3 must be valid. Debug if load debug controls is set, DR7 must have a valid setting, which it does. ESP and EIP must contain a canonical address, which they do. They contain zero. Load C T state is not set. Um, if perf global control must be zero, we disable that. Pat's disabled. EFER is disabled. Bound configs disabled. C T state disabled. Okay. If we're in I32 mode, then these checks are run. Usable if the unusable bit is zero. Ooh, can we just set them as unusable? Any one of these registers is said to be usable if the unusable bit, bit 16, is zero. Disable the TR and the LDTR. That's bit 16. So now none of those are usable. Um, okay, then selector fields. For the TR, the TI bit must be zero. Uh, oh, these are the actual selectors. For the LDTR, if, the LD, if LDTR is usable, the TI must be zero, which it is anyways. Uh, if it will not be V8086 mode, the RPL must be equal to the RPL of CS. Okay, which it is. Then, those are the bottom three bits, or two bits. Um, if the guess will be virtual 8086, it must be the selector shift by that. For 64 bits, addresses must be canonical for the bases. If it's usable, it must be canon. So that means it can be anything. For CS, they must be zero, the top bits. For all of these, uh, blah, 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 zero. 8086 mode, don't care. For the limit, so limit in, um, the limit's just zero for 64-bit land. What are all the flags and fiddly stuff for? This determines uh, how the processor is able to access memory through segmentation. So based on the segment that you use to access memory, it determines what offsets and what permissions will be used for that segment. This is basically used prior to paging, but it's still required in 64-bit land because it's where the bits that tell you what uh, privilege mode you're currently executing in, uh, that's where those bits are stored. It's, it's pretty wild, actually. Base address fields, those are all good. If it's V86, then it must be this. If it's not V8086, it depends on this. Bits three to zero. For CS, it must be nine, 11, 13, or 15, which is an access code segment. And we don't set it to that. We set it to a, we set it to 10. And I think it'll become accessed Where's that table? I really needed that table. Here we go. The accessed bit is, is that part of the type? I think it is. I think that's the problem. I don't have it set to accessed. It's required that it's pre-accessed. Pre and I, I suspect that's what it is. Let's find where the segmentation is descript described. 
But that is one of the only things here that we do differently. Um, base is zero. Maybe we have to set the limit to all Fs. We can do that, but I don't think so. Maybe we have to. Nevertheless, um, where are the types, man? Types. Here we go. The bottom bit, I do think, indicates accessed. Oh, those are for system descriptor types. Segment descriptors, code. A, this is the access bit. This is writable, executable. So we want to set it to code. We set it to 10 right now, which is execute and readable code. We want to set it to execute read accessed by setting this from an A to a B. And these go to threes. And the three indicates a um, accessed read write data segment. And then these will make accessible. Well, we'll see. Um, if it's CS, it must be 9, 11, or 13, so 11. If the control is 1, it's, it's not. Uh, SS, if the SS is usable, the type must be 3 or 7, which it is, 3. For all of these, bit 0 must be 1. If bit 3 of type 1 is 1... then the type also must be readable. OK, so that's fine. Type must be accessed. And then bit 3, which indicates if it's code, which it's not, um, doesn't matter. OK. Uh, if the register is CS or the register is usable, S must be 1. And S is. That's bit four, S, which is segment type, code, or data. And we set that to nine, Python hex nine. Oh, I can't do that, can I? Or bin nine, one on one. I should be able to do that in my head. So that is set. So if it's CS, must be usable. DPL, if it's 9 or 11, it must be equal to the DPL of the access right field of SS. Yep. Cannot be less than the RPL. Uh, if it's usable, present must be 1, which it is. We'll put a 0 up front here. Those must be 0. For CS, that must be 0. And the L bit, bit 13, must be set to 1, which we do. OK. So I bet we're pretty close here. Let's set those as present, or as usable. F fuck. GDTR and IDTR. Um, just wild. Why has it got to be so complicated? Um, ask Intel. AMD doesn't do this. It's a lot easier on AMD because they tell you what happened if you have an error. But on Intel, they decided that one of these things could be wrong, and then it gives you the same error in all cases. It's, it's really nice. OK, let's set the limbs to all Fs. And we'll set this one to like a reasonable limit. Oh my god, I fucking hate this shit, man.
LDTR, only if it's usable, which is not. LDTR is not usable. TR, um, if it's not in I32 mode, it must be that or 11. Maybe I do have to set up TR. In which case, if it will be in that, it must be 11. This is a B. S must be zero. P must be eight. That is a valid TR now. Who kn who knows, man? Who knows? <laughs> one one of these things is wrong. One of these things is wrong. <laughs> oh my god, dude. The limits Those I think are fine. TRSSS. Selector fields, TM must be zero. That must be zero, that's fine. RPL must be equal to the RPL. V86, yep, it's not. Otherwise, that must be canon. If LDTR is usable, if these are usable, limits. So this is apparently the ch the check. Uh, maybe these limits are supposed to be zero. No, probably not, because those probably have to be set to something. Who knows? What are the actual limits that we have on those? The IDTR is FFF. The GDTR is um, th uh, 3F. And the TR is a size of the TR, which I have no idea how big that is, but FF should be valid. Okay, and it seems like that needs to be present. Oh my god, dude. Will not be V886. The control is zero. Must be 11. It is. If the register is CS or it's usable, it must be one, which it is. DPL. Type three, non-conforming, conforming. Uh, it's non-conforming. We're using 11. DPL must be equal to the, yep. If it's unrestricted guess for SS, it's not. DPL must be zero if the type in the access rights field. Is three. Yup, DPL can't be less than the RPL. Uh, P must be set present. Reserved to zero, which they are. Thirteen. Maybe I, maybe I do just want this. Maybe I don't want the L. Nope. Um, I don't know if that helped or hurt, right? That could be the next thing we'll fail on, but we have no idea. TR. 
if it's I32 mode, it must be 11. 0, 1, set, granularity, set. The unusable bit must be 0. Aha. Uh -huh. So the TR must be usable. Oh, well, we figured that one out. Did they, they said that, I don't know if they said that anything but CS needs to be usable. GDTR. So I don't know if we need to set the limits. Set the limit to not zero. Mm, nope. Who knows? Who knows? Um. Do a sand view check. Make sure your code changes are making it to the VM. Um, there's no way to really check that. <laughs> so, unfortunately. Um... Checks the validity of that. The VM entry. Yeah, I think we might just run this in the box and see what the issue is. Unfortunately, it's pretty much impossible to determine what it is from the documentation. It's just it's just one of these is wrong. One one of these things is wrong in the, in these 5 pages of of bullet points, maybe 7 pages of bullet points. Yeah, it's about 7 pages of bullet points. Uh one of these things is wrong. Any of these words is wrong here by one bit. Uh and we get the same error. It's it's really nice. <laughs> it's it's really nice, man. Uh, thanks, Intel, for one of the best APIs. It's really, really nice. I feel like next time that I report a bug to Intel, I'm going to give them seven pages of documentation and one error code, and I'm going to be like, sorry, one of these things is wrong. Like, this is, this is why it doesn't work. One of these things is wrong. Uh, go figure it out. Good luck. <laughs> Good fucking luck. Oh, man. How fucking lazy do you have to be? Like, what are you, what are you saving? Like, maybe you're saving, like, five square nanometers of wires. The spite is building. It's just tilting. There's literally no way to debug this other than doing what I'm doing right now, which is read through it, try, 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 and you get no information of whether you made something that made it better or worse. So, like, we might have had it right because we switched, like, a couple of the things and then a couple of the things, but since we reverted back, we actually rebroke it. So, like... I have no idea if these things need to be Fs or not. Technically, you set the limit to zero for 64-bit segments, but potentially this is expecting that they get loaded to all Fs. And there's there's literally no way to know. Are you using the right re revision? It's just latest. Always is. But yeah, there's there's just there's no way to know which one of these things is wrong. Maybe it's that interrupts are, are cleared or disabled in a wrong way. Maybe one of these selectors is incorrect. Maybe the TR selector needs to be set to uh, 38. Maybe that's the issue. And it's not. Well, we don't know. It could be the issue, but there could also be 50 other issues, and we could fix them 
but then we revert them because we think that wasn't the cause. So at this point, oh, maybe it is because these limits need to be zero. And now it would work. Oh, well, maybe, maybe we need to not have the long bit set on these. And then we have to try every single combination and permutation of every single one of these things until it works. <laughs> That's how this works. This is how Intel designed it. This, this, is, this is exactly what their thoughts were. It's that this is a reasonable API because they don't give a fuck about programmers. They're like, we do hardware here. Uh, you can figure it out in software. Fuck you. <laughs> and the argument, the argument is always, oh, well, it's hard to do on hardware. You know what's hard to do in software? Implementing it correctly in a thousand code bases and maintaining it in a thousand code bases. That's the hard part. And that's what hardware developers don't get. Like, the view is like, oh, yeah, it's really hard to do in hardware. I agree. I agree it's harder to do in hardware than one software implementation. But it turns out there's not going to be one software implementation. So instead, every single person who ever uses this feature and ever maintains an OS that uses this feature has to do these things in ex exactly these ways. And then Intel can change the feature sets dynamically. So if you were relying on a feature, fuck you. Once you get it right, you'll never forget it ever again. I've done this four times before. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I guess we loaded in a box. So we spent 20 minutes getting this running in box. Because we have to. Because then box can tell us what is wrong. Because, it, because the processor won't. Um, let's see if we can find an extended error, but I'm pretty sure there isn't for these. Yeah, these ones definitely don't have an extended error. Um, is that the L bit? Oh, yeah, that is only for code segments. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess I didn't need that. Nice to know. That also means here. That should be a zero. Okay, so it's a 64-bit code segment. 209B, it's exactly what we want. It is currently present, currently in use. These are data segments that are present and valid. We didn't change anything, so it won't make any difference. Um, maybe the interruptibility state is wrong. I'm pretty sure our segmentation stuff is correct, although the, the bases and limits, they don't mention those at all. Um, so I have no idea what the limits actually need to be, so I'll just set them to all Fs. Because I'm assuming it won't matter. Because they don't tell me they matter. So if they do matter, then the documentation is wrong. Okay, set the limits to all Fs. And the bases to those things. Uh, we currently don't set the LDTR as usable, so that field doesn't matter. Um, must be canon addresses, which they are. We're not using that. R flags. VM bit must be zero. The reserve bit must be one. We set the reserve bit. Those must be zero. If the IF flag must be one, if the valid bit bit 31 and the VM entry interruption information field is one and the interruption type is one. All right, we'll just set the I IF just in case. Okay, that's not it. Activity states. I'm guessing we just zeroed out. Um... If the valid bit in the interruption information field is one. Oh, maybe, maybe the activity state is fucked. Maybe we have to set the activity state. Um, section 24, two. 
Active. Yep, zero, active. Any interruption is allowed. Okay, interruptibility state. Reserve must be zero. Uh, must be zero if the IF is zero. Okay. Pending debug, must be zero, they are. Um, should be able to set that to zero. Oh, is all Fs for the link pointer? Ah, that's what it is, isn't it? We gotta set all Fs for the link pointer? That's how you say an invalid link? Because they just assume that physical address that will never exist, which is fair, it won't, rather than using a zero encoding. So we have to go find the field encoding for that. Um, all right. It's probably what it is. Guest v link pointer is ox2800. This is the guest vmcs link pointer. Uh, debug control. Okay, guest vmcs link pointer. This is totally it, isn't it? Oh, no, it's probably something else. <laughs> maybe, maybe these limits aren't supposed to be Fs? I don't know. Luckily, we have no way of... Oh, there we go. We got it. Yeah, the limits have to be all zeros. And that link pointer had to be set. And then and then we got it. See? That's all it took. <laughs> Just had to get all those things right. That's interesting. Set the ES limit to zero. And what happens? It doesn't work? Okay, let's read the, let's read the documentation there. Let's see. Limit fields for this. If it will be in V86, it must be Fs. Doesn't mention anything else. My interpretation of that would mean that the limit would not matter in those cases. But it seems that it does. Um, I'm glad that they don't mention that, though, because otherwise people wouldn't get to do this, which is, this is kind of fun to try these things out randomly until they work. But I am glad that they do not document um, that that is checked. All right. Okay, VM exit zero. Not a consequence of not being on metal. We'll try it on metal. Here we go, change that. Try it on metal. And it fails, so correct. It, it, uh, it fails on metal as well. But yeah, it's just not documented. Yep, why not? Okay, now we have VM exit zero, which would indicate that it succeeded, but it, oh, exception, nice. We got an exception, and then the vector will be put into, I forget what field. Uh, interruption information, I think. VM instruction error. Okay. This should be a, a very, very hard page fault. And this doesn't save the CR2, so actually we have the CR2. We have the faulting CR2. Um, CPU read CR2, because it doesn't, uh, the processor doesn't save the CR2. So just our CR2 state. So it's faulting on accessing zero. Unless it's putting that in the information field, but I don't think it is. Um, all right, well, we can read the, oh, natural width. Ah, it's probably one of these. Exit qualification. Yeah, let's let's just let's just read the manual. 
the rest of it's really easy from this point on. So we want to look at the execution controls, um, VM exits, and we care about the VM exits on a, uh, we'll put this on a new line, uh, VM exits, and basic information. Qualification for debug exceptions, for task switches, for control register access, remove DRs for IO instructions, APIC accesses, EPT violations, to vectored events. I forget where they put it. So this is grep for exception. An exception causes a VM exit directly by um, corresponding to that in a bitmap. Um, okay, I forget what it populates. Um, mm. Page fault exceptions. Well, it doesn't tell you. I'm guessing a page fault exception, this is maybe the CR2. Um, oh, it's the linear address of the page fault. Hell yeah, okay. So we wanna get the exit qualification field. Um, God, it's been a long time since I've done a lot of this shit. Exit qualification, uh, 6,400. Okay, we have nothing in that range. So we'll do uh, exit qualification. Qualification. OXC400. Uh, VM exits qualification. And this could be like a billion different things, depending on the mode. Uh, so this will be the faulting address. This is probably going to be PC because we're executing on non-executable. So that's the faulting address, which is good. So then I think what we'll do is we'll have the VM execute some code. We'll do, um, I guess we can give it, yeah, if we set this to zero, if we set rip to zero and we see a page fault on zero, we'll know that that's actually what it's failing. Yeah, so it's failing on fetching rip, which makes sense. Um, we won't give it a stack. What if we mark all these things as not present? One. So TR, I think, needs to be present. Yeah, I think TR needs to be present and like good. 8B is fine here. Okay. So now we're gonna do, um, this is gonna be the code for the VM. Uh, set guest rip and guest RIP is a natural width in the guest. Move racks OX 681E. VM writes um, racks RBX, LEA RBX, rip plus 2F. Yeah, we'll do, this will be 2F, this will be 1F. This is the code that will execute in the guest. It'll be an int three, and then this will be the end. That's the VM exit location, the landing pad. Um, and then we should be able to get an error code. There's another field that we can get. Um, Read only fields, exit reason, instruction error, interruption information. Yeah, so we'll grab that. Interruption 
information, and this is uh, VM exit interruption information, OX4402. That's the exit reason, 4404. We'll move this up to here. Interruption information, and then this is the exit, the error code. I think that'll have the index of the exception. Error. Uh, error code. 4406. So interruption information, we basically want those two fields. We'll print those. Uh, int info and int error. Interruption information. And this is interruption error code. Okay, and this will, one of those will probably have a three indicating that uh, we got a, uh, a CC, a page fault. I'm guessing that is the vector. So if I change that to a UD2, we'll get a different error code, which will indicate that we had a different exception. And we got a six, which is on the uh, uh, UD. So we are executing code now in the guest. We did it. <laughs> we did it. I'll be right back. I'm going to hit that. I'm back. All right, so uh, let's try it on hardware. It works on hardware too. Cool. All right. Oh yeah, those boot times. It's not too bad getting a VM up and going in uh, five hours. It's pretty fucking good. I mean, it should take an hour, but hey, we we got there. All right, so now, Save the host rip, guest rip. This is just one F. 
Now we're gonna write a uh, a decoder for the error fields that we care about. So there, that's indicating a page fault, right? That's what that uh, interruption information is. And let's see if we can find. Here we go. For an exception, it has the exception vector. For an NMI, they're set to two. For an external interrupt, it's the vector. So it's the vector in all cases. So what we're going to do is we're going to make an enum that will pretty print this information. And we'll develop the enum. Yeah, I think we'll do let exit reason is equal to this. So we're going to convert this into an enum and extract all the information we care about. Uh, what ended up being the problem? It was the VMCS link pointer. It's supposed to be all Fs instead of zeros. That's kind of what's used for nested vert, where you kind of chain these together. Um, and that was the problem. <laughs> that was the problem. OK. Get the exit reason. Um, we're just going to match on this. And we're going to say, if it's 0, this is a uh, yeah, we need a couple more of these open. We'll have the exit reasons here. Um, this is exception or NMI. OK. And an NMI to us is just going to be an exception. So we'll do enum vm exit exception. And then we'll have the. Fuck it, we can we can change the we can change the exception type. Uh, let's set the exception type to enum exception uh, drive debug drive debug. Then we'll have the list of all the exceptions. That's why we opened this fourth manual. <laughs> We're going we're gonna to have a lot of manuals open. I can tell you that much. We're going to have a lot of manuals open. Uh, where's the list? This is not necessarily what I wanted, but this does the trick. Divide error. Debug exception. NMI. Breakpoints. Overflow, bound range, exceeded, invalid opcode, device not available for math, double faults, invalid TSS, segments not present, stack, segments fault, general protection fault, page fault, And I probably want to call it general protection fault, I think. Page fault. Uh, what is this? Floating point. Floating point error. Alignment check. Machine check. Simmed floating points exception. Virtualization exception. Control. Protection exception. <laughs> we we did it. Um NMI is two, breakpoint is three, overflow is four, bound is five, undefined is six, device not available is seven. Eight is a double fault. TSS is a ten. Oh, um, coprocessor segment overrun. That's the nine boy. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. The good old fourteen. Got a fifteen. We uh, actually. We skip 15. No. Yes. 
Floating point error, 17 alignment check, 18 for machine check, 19 for that, 20 for this, and 21 for this. Okay. Yeah, and now we pad these out, make this look a little bit better. Okay, so this is the basically this is the vector for an exception, which is what we really care about for fuzzing. We have that APIC timer enabled, so we will probably eventually see a timer interrupt. We probably want to prevent the guests from being able to disable interrupts. So we'll eventually look into that. I'm not too worried about it right now. Well, we set the interrupt flag, don't we? Yeah, I think we set the interrupt flag. Yeah, we do. Okay. So now we have to uh, impl exception. Uh, impl from u32 u8 for exception. Fn from val u8 into a self. I'm gonna match val. Are the user defined ones um, useful to track at all? Not really. I guess I guess that's how you hook int n here, but there's no way to there's no way to hook those. Uh, you can't hook uh, the int um, instructions in VTX. I think, or you can. Well, AMD one of them allows you to do syscalls and one of them allows you to do um, software inter. I think you can't hook software interrupts on x86. Okay, so we're gonna change this. S A through Z A through Z plus What? Replace that dot star equals I think I still want the spacing and here we can do uh, white space one or more white space and then we'll do um, here we want to eat one space and then we'll consume uh, from sets of spaces and digits. Is that not digit? Literal space or digits. And then we'll replace that with a two. Um, two. One, zero equals G. Oh, not quite, not quite, not quite, not quite. Oh, zero, it's the other way around. It's uh, three, two, one. Mm, close, 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 close. Three equals two, one. Okay, that's an interesting way to do it. <laughs> um, and we need to also say that this is a, so that's the padding exception colon colon this uh, x at everything else oh and those are these bad boys fuck dude dude what what I don't know what I hit I don't know how I I did anything different. Except that exception. Um, 
other x other u8 can i do that yeah i can't use the i can't use the discriminants if i have the other well we're not we're just going to panic on that other will be unreachable cuz in this context it will be Seven thirty-two. So that will indicate an exception occurred. Unsafe. Get the code. If it's a zero, then it was VM exit is equal to this, and this will be a VM exit exception. And we'll get the interruption information. Um, yoink, paste, oops, uh, int info is equal to this, and then we'll get the int, we'll get the bottom bits of the int. That tells you the source. Hardware exception that would have delivered an error code. So that tells you if an error code needs to be pushed. Bit 31 is always set to 1. Yeah, we we only really care about this bottom part. So we'll say uh, int info as u8 into. Okay, and now we can print the VM exit. Um, and this is unhandled, unhandled, uh, unimplemented, unhandled VM exit code, uh, this, x, x at that, VM exit stylized like this, and we need some semicolons at the end, put a comma on this line. Get her to try into 738 needs to be on save. Doesn't fit. So that will tell us if we had an exception, it'll pretty print it. And we got one. We got a page fault. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um. Not using visual block editing. Yeah, I kind of forgot. Vim doesn't have easy digits. Okay. Um. Um. I feel like you guys are really fucking it up. If you're uh, if if you're, if you're having a sexual harassment problems at work like if, if you if if you really think that the amount of times that those things come up and then and how hard it's not to get and it's hard to not get written up and that you need to like figure out how to not get written up i think that's uh i, I feel like that's probably not a good sign then because <laughs> uh, it's really not a problem and i've worked at five or six different companies <laughs> Maybe maybe the problem is you. <laughs> maybe maybe you need to chillax a bit. I will say the meetings are frequent, but the like unfortunately it's kind of required. Like pe people still are shit. <laughs> like you you might think that you're fine and that it's just a bunch of overhead, but the problem is you can't select out and like say uh, that you know I'm not being ageist here, but I'm gonna say that uh, that historically <laughs> these allegations are typically more favored towards an older generation that has different social norms, and it's pretty hard to make a corporate meeting that's only for people who are more likely to sexually harass. 
So it turns out you have to have that go on to everyone. And it turns out sexual harassment is quite rampant in workforces. So people kind of need to be reminded. And it's, it's kind of a mix of helping people who are um, unwilling to stand up because they don't think they'd get corporate backing when they uh, blow the whistle. So it's to remind them that they will get corporate backing, even though in a lot of situations they won't. But, you know. But yeah, that's, that's just how it is, man. It sucks. Just fucking embrace it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fucking meeting. Who cares? <laughs> like, it's not that big of a deal. Got to make progress somehow. Progress is slow and it sucks for both sides. No one, no one wants to have no sexual harassment training. Well, some people do, but are you married? I'm not. Uh, exception page fault. Okay, and then for page faults, we want to extract more information. So I guess we won't necessarily have to have the conversions into those. So all of this hard work, we can just get rid of. Uh, S, one or more white spaces followed by an equals and everything afterwards uh, will get deleted and turned into a comma. This means that for certain exceptions, we can handle that. Uh... The chick magnet? I was I was a chick magnet maybe 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 for like a couple years in my life before I started balding and before uh I found out that I would never grow. <laughs> it's just like when when I found out that my height was not a pre puberty height, but actually my post puberty height is uh I think when uh <laughs> when that stopped being the thing. I don't really go out of my way to make myself attractive, though, so I probably would do better off. I'm not the most confident person either, and I have really nothing in common with someone to talk about, so uh, typically the answer is no. How tall are you? I'm like 5'8". I say 5'7", but I'd say it's like probably 5'8". <laughs> um... Okay, so we want that field. The interruption information. Then for page faults, what was that field? The interruption error code, that's gonna be the page fault information that we'll wanna parse out of there. Um, that's literally the error field that will be pushed during an exception. Um, it is literally, yeah, it's literally that what would be pushed onto the stack, so we can parse that. That's not bad. Yeah, it's totally, it's totally fine, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's an issue. It's, it's an issue if you want to do like the whole Tindery things, but if you actually can fucking smile and have a conversation, and you have non-zero confidence, uh, it turns out it's really not that hard to meet people. <laughs> like, it just, it just really isn't, man. <laughs> and don't and don't be self-deprecating don't shit on yourself all the time turns out that's not the most attractive thing to say like how hard it is to meet people or that you're too short or all these different things and balding makes you look like the rock oh yeah i'm 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 totally fine with balding i don't mind it at all it it, it doesn't it doesn't bother me Like, the only thing it affects are, like, superficial things like Tinder, but, like, once again, it's not hard to find people on Tinder either. The problem is both sides are looking for, like, God-tier people on Tinder. If you just lower your standards just a, a little bit, uh, you'll get infinite matches. <laughs> if, you, if you lower your standards from a 10 to, a, like, 7, you're fine. <laughs> you're, you're fucking fine. And it turns out someone who's a 10 who has a shitty personality is like a three. <laughs> so like, I don't know. 
I would say the people that I have really fallen for in my life have never really been the most attractive people I have met. They're, they're pretty much always people who I just can have conversations with for good reasons. Like, that's a, that's a beautiful thing, is just being able to have good conversations. Having, having some uh, back and forth that works well. Um, all right, so we want to parse out the which field. Which field did it throw it in? The error code is not us, the exit reason. So the exit reason tells us what this was, and then there was one other field that we parsed. Well, that we need to parse. That is the exit qualification. And so we want to look at that basically here. And it looks like all the information might just be all over the place. Saved in these things. Debug exceptions, page fault exceptions. So page faults will grab that. Page fault will have the virtual address of the faulting load. And we will have a use page table vert adder. And we're going to start using the page table pretty soon here anyways, because we're going to make a guest. Um, we're going to go to 718 page faults. Mm, shit. We'll just say zero. Uh, vert adder zero. Start out with that. And then here, we're doing it in kind of a weird way. What we're going to do, um, let exception is an exception, which is the interrupt info converted into a U8. And then here we'll return um, VM exit exception exception okay uh mute if let uh if let some and that impulse copy no nope, just debug right now so we'll just do this anyways uh if let some if let exception Page faults, ref mute, virtual address is equal to exception. Then the virtual address will get updated to vert adder, which will come from unsafe, the exit qualification. VM read, VMCS exit qualification as U64. It's already a U64. Oh, that's that's hunky dory um, so this is convert the interrupt uh, vector into an exception uh, if this exception was a page fault store the faulting address information so now we should have a faulting address and there we go vert adder zero uh, which is true let's change rip to this Three seven four five. There we go. So, and we're not hex printing that. So let's change that to a hex print, and you'll see that that is three seven four five. And fuck, X fixed. All right. So there's the code three seven four five. So that was the faulting address. Now we want to grab the error information field that's pushed on a page fault, which will come from. This tells you if there's an error code, and there's an error code on a page fault, and then the page fault error code will come from uh, paging. Where did I mention the error code? That's the error code right there. So it tells you if it's related to being present, read write, user super user whatever, whatever. Um, so we can do, yeah, I'll just throw them in here. Adder, address is the vert adder. And then we'll store a, um, a presence caused by a non-present page, bool. Um, 
right. Tells you if this is a right. Tells you if it's a user mode access. Uh, reserve bit violation we don't really care about. Uh, ex uh, instruction. Mm, exec. Uh, protection keys. Don't care about the rest. So that will be a page fault. This is the address of... This is the faulting address. And this is uh, true if the page is present. Uh, true if the access was a write. Uh, true if the access was a user mode access. And then true if the access was an instruction fetch. And we can t we can just get rid of the true if if the uh, true if the replace with nothing page is present access okay so then these we'll set up to uh, vatter and then we'll set all these to defaults. Um, I don't think I can do this because the this doesn't implement default. The enum doesn't implement default itself. Yeah, so I have the virtual address, present, uh, right, user, exec. So they're gonna tell us a little bit of information about the fault that happened. That should now work. And then here's 768. Um, can I bind the whole thing somehow? Can't do this. Yeah, I don't think so. If it's a page fault, then exception, uh, get the faulting address from the exit qualification. That should work. Put a comma here. 707. Comma there as well. Okay, 770. Oh, yeah, because it's not that. Um... Do I just want to put that in a structure so I can extract that out? Yeah, I feel like I'll probably do that. Falcon Riser and Floppy, first date gift. What's up, subnet? Hell yeah. Um, can we get an IRL stream after this is all over? What do you mean? Like, run around, fucking around. I think I want to put the page full information into a structure. Um, struct page fault information. Uh, information about page faults. Because I think I'm going to want to extract this out. No, maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not. Yeah, I don't know what I would do for an IRL stream. I, I don't... This is my IRL stream. I, I, don't, I don't know what more you guys expect. Uh... Ref mute vatter. Ref mute user. Ref mute present. Ref mute right, ref mute exec. Okay, the ordering doesn't matter, but I'm doing it just for funsies. Virtual address, okay. I guess it's just adder. 734. We did it. 
All right, so now we need to actually parse these fields out. And this is um, error, uh, get the um, error for the exception. And this will be a vert add, uh, unsafe, VM read, VMCS, uh, interrupt, error something, 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 error code. Interruption, error code. Okay, then we'll say times, times, I don't know why I say times, uh, presence is equal to uh, extract the access fault information from the fault. Okay. Presence is equal to um, error and one shift zero is if that's not equal to zero then it's present this is the right this is the user all semis um present right user and uh, exec, which is instruction fetch, which is a four. Okay, uh, here we go. We have a non-present access, and it's an executable fetch. Hell yeah, guys! <laughs> That's nice and decoded. So we handle page faults. We parse that information out of a page fault. We can give that back to a user in a meaningful uh, capacity. So what we're going to do is for a user VM, we're going to have it's fucking 300 lines of just fucking definitions. <laughs> God damn it. Um, construct the VM. It's a user-based VM. Here we're going to run the VM. All right, so we want to give a stack and whatever for, I think, the user. Well, we'll just set this up based on a snapshot, I think, is what we're going to do here. So we can set these fields up per execution. So these are things that we want to do every execution. The other ones are constant. Oh, here's another thing. We're going to make these all three. Um, uh, eight with a three is an F. Three, 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 three. So these are now uh, user land accesses. So we should now see that this is a... We, ba we basically just turned our program into user land. I think. Um, unless I need to set the CPL somewhere. Page faults. Am I still getting a page fault with those selectors? Oh, I'm not using the selectors. Oh yeah, th these will have the RPLs in them. Uh, where do they mention these? Um, theme entries, then checks. The basic, the basic VM entry checks simply. Um, unless there's a CPL somewhere. Okay. Where are these mentioned? Oh, maybe they do tell you the information. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe the exit reason tells you more information about that. Uh, oh, 33. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it still tells you that. Qualification. 
Okay, so it tells you some basic... Yeah, most cases it's cleared to zero. Okay, never mind, they don't. They don't. Um, what are the checks? That's for host state area. Where the fuck were those checks at? Where are those at? Okay, guest segment registers. Access rights, type. DPL must be three. Oh, for AD, V86. For this, the DPL, descriptor privilege level. So I guess we'll want to set those, which will be... They'll turn the nine into a uh, uh, an F. So these are now user land. User access. Fuck yeah. So we just we just converted this into all of these are user uh, selectors now. So we we basically converted the process into user land now. So now it's a user land application. And that means we can set up a new page table for it. So check this shit out. Uh, this is gonna be um, self.page table. Um, well, we'll have this be page table, uh, and I forget what I call it. Kernel source page, kernel page, shared page table. Macro drive enum. Oh yeah, I'm familiar with that. Um, page table. Pub fn. It's on the table. Yeah, it's just table. Dot table dot zero. So that will give. The page table, which we don't create yet. Now we can make a page table. So now we're actually making the memory model. So basically, we have a VM executing with the register state we give it. Well, we don't give it a register state yet, but we will. Um, yeah, let's check this out. So this will be um, page. Let me page table is equal to page table new. So we're going to create a new page table. Page present, page write, page user. Uh huh. Page write. Putting on the wrong thing. Uh, page table, page present, page write. Page user, kind of the basics. 435, we're going to give it a pmem. Let mute pmem is equal to mute mm. We got to pull an mm. Uh, physical memory, I think is what we call it. This is just a uh, physical memory. Mute pmem. That should be able to create a page table. Nice. Now we're getting faults still. So now we're going to do page table. Uh, what do we set RIP to? The guest RIP. 3745. We'll set this to elite 1234. So now what I can do is I can um, fn map. Page table map x. Um, we're going to map X as, uh, mute pmem, vert adder, elite, 
page type, page 4K, size 4096, readable, writable, executable. Oh, fuck yeah, we won't need these then. All right, and there we go. It was present now. So now we've added memory into this guest. Oh, we're getting there. Page fault. Huh. It's present. We weren't doing a write. We were doing a user access. Oh, we don't have a user bit. Yeah, I think it's time. We're going to have to change a little bit of code, kind of all over the code base for this, but uh, we'll have a user bit now. If user page user and we already have that bit, good. Those shifts are kind of gross. Uh, 175, this is now user. Okay, now we have problems in the bootloader. Uh, bootloader, source main, 253, map init. This is a user is false. 290, user is false. We're gonna have problems in our kernel, kernel source mm. Uh, page table dot map, not user land. That one we don't need to worry about. I think we're good. Uh, VTX, we need to set this in VTX at 437. Strigger, thanks for the raid, fuck yeah! How's it going? How's your stream? Uh, true. Oh, thank God. I thought that was like, I thought that was the onslaught of new errors. Uh, there we go. Uh, that succeeded. We had a page fault on this because we're accessing, um, we executed an instruction. Fuck yes. So what we're going to do is now we're going to have, we need to make a register state that can hold all of x86 register state. Which is kind of a hard problem. It's kind of a really hard problem. Doing user space or just a VM? We're doing a we're doing a VM. But this is a, a user space application running in a VM. So we're using a VM to run a user space thing. Okay, so now what I can do. I map that memory and then, yeah, register state has a runtime determined. Yeah. Um, what do I need? What is not saved and restored for us? Let's just go through this. This is the easiest way to look at what register state there is on the system. All those RIP R flags, those are those are saved for us. Uh, K registers were not. Um, the K registers will be stored in X save bound. Will be stored in X save. These are saved and restored for us. These are saved and restored for us. Ah, uh, yeah, they are. The CRs, except for CRT, are saved and restored. CR8 is not saved and restored for us. Don't care about it. So for user land, we really care about the um, SSE state, the MXCSR, which is saved in the FX save. Um, all these are, are uh, system level things. So really the only thing that we need to worry about are GPRs and uh, X save state. So I think we will handle the GPRs. Um, so, 
uh, struct vm. So we'll do uh, host regs register state, and this is guest regs register state. Uh, host registers guest registers. Okay, pub struct host uh, register state. All these fields are going to be pub. This will have pub, and this will be rep or C. And we'll just go down the line. Racks, RBX, RCX, RDX, RSP, RBP, RSI, RDI, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, rip, R flags. CX, uh, BX, CX, DX, SP, BP, SI, DI, R8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, rip, R flags. We'll say RFL. Okay. X save. U8 4096. So that's for the X save area. Uh, we probably need to rep or C pub struct X save. Uh, a line 4096. This is just uh, U8 4096. Just a big ass blob. X save. I guess I don't guarantee that you have AVX support, and I probably shouldn't. So it's not necessarily X save. This is, um, it might not be X save. It might be. Problem is, you can't migrate something with X save, can you? I mean, you can, but you have to, like, reformat it. It's a fucking pain, man. We're just gonna do XMMs. Uh, we can't limit the guests to not use them. Yes, we can. We can set X crow. Is there an X here zero in the fields? There is not, so it'll inherit the host's X crow. All right, so we're gonna just have the X mems. Um, X mem registers, and then we will cause it to not be able to access them, so it would fault if it accesses non X mems. So the state that we have as part of X mems is in FX save layout. Hopefully this describes the layout, and it does. So basically, do I have to save the MM separately? So this is the non-64-bit mode. Oh my god. Nice. This one maybe parsed it better. Non-64-bit mode. 64-bit mode. So we got to save the MM separately, apparently. We got the Zims reserved, available. FX save 64. Well, anyways, all that really matters are the... This is the um, control world. The, the floating point control word. This is the MXCSR, if I'm not mistaken. So you got basically the floating point state, right? So the MMs, the MMs overlap with the STs, so we got to save the MMs, CW, SW, and TW, the floating point IPs. Ugh. I guess we can just FX save it. Migrate across processors, yeah. It's a, it's a complete pain in the ass. Absolute pain in the ass. Isn't this the same? How are these different? 
160 for XMM0, 160, FDS, I feel like they're the same. Yeah, I think we'll do FX save here. We'll pub this. And this is the FX save state. Rep or C. Pub struct FX save. It's important that we get this right. So this is the um, 16 bytes. No, these are bits. These are bit offsets. Yeah, these are bit offsets. Okay. What? Yeah, 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 they're, they are byte offsets. So these are at the bytes. Yeah, you're totally right. I was like, what? 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 Okay. Um, this is like the float state. That'll force the alignment. Um, XMM state. I mean, technically it's, these are two U128s. We'll do this so you can programmatically access those. Float states, MM, U128 for eight, XMM, U128 for 16, and then some padding shit. We'll say uh, align 4096 just because we can. Uh, MM registers 0 through 7. Uh, XMM registers 0 through six, uh, 15. And then there's some reserve shit at the end. Reserved U128 for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, random. This is just like reserved fields. 496. 496. Isn't it... It's the same for all of these. Why Why does it give different tables for these? 496. Oh. Oh, because there aren't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's not... In 32-bit mode, you only have uh, seven of these. But it's still the same layout. Okay. So this is uh, floating point state information like the FXCR and MXCSR and... Uh, etc. Okay, so this is a uh, floating point state from an FX save instruction, and this is the uh, general purpose register state. Uh, drive default and debug. Whack these in here, too. Nice. We can close some of this stuff now that we're chugging. BTX, MM, we don't need main. Nah, we don't need. Okay, so we need to save and restore all registers when we transition to and from the VM, uh, including the FX state. So we'll do a FX save into this, into this spot, and then we'll save and restore these manually. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a better way to do that. So we just kind of got to do a little bit of manual work here. Uh, 469. This is um, guest regs. And this is register states default and host regs. 
Got host regs and the guest regs. Fuck yeah. Um, don't use that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, we'll do uh, allow unused. Okay. Then users not used yet. Uh, yeah, three seventy nine. We'll add that once we have non-user VMs. Okay, I gotta change up my music. Um, yeah, we, we just have to save and restore all of that. So we have to pass in as arguments. Uh, we got to use the stack. We're kind of forced to use the stack here. So we're going to pass in an argument, which is the um, two registers get passed in. Guest state. Guest state. Uh, self dot guest regs is what I call it. This is a mutable reference to guest regs. This is a mutable reference to host regs. So we pass in two registers. We clobber racks and RBX, so we won't use those. Save the host RSP and the host RIP. We want to do those right before we enter. Um. Well, yeah, now is where we got to get cheeky. So I have to basically save my state into those registers. So host regs is at uh, zero, plus zero, times. Uh, we're going to move quadro pointer. It's implied. And this will do uh, zero times eight. OK. Racks. Racks. Basically everything here. RBX, RCX, RDX, RSP, RBP, RSI, RDI. We can actually just save everything because we're not clobbering anything. So uh, save host state. Technically, RSP and RBP don't, or RSP doesn't matter. Um, this is uh, tracked by VM, uh, uh, VTX. Then we have, uh, we'll, we'll do this, tracked by VTX, and then we'll comment it out when we're done. RSP, RBP, uh, Rex, RBX, RCX, RDX. RSP, RBP, RSI, RDI. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Push, FQ, pop, quadroid pointer into 0 plus 0 times 8. OK, so now we go down the list. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Save host flags. Uh, that's handled by us, isn't it? Is it host R flags? Yeah, the host R flags will be handled for us. So we don't really care about those. Rip RFL, we don't care about those. So that's technically tracked by VTX, unless we want to save that there. Save the host RSP. We're going to push. Now we want to save, save, uh, 
save the host state register. Save the guest state register. Then we're going to save the host RSP, host RIP. And then at that point, those are sane. And now we can load the guest state. We're not doing X flags yet, or the uh, FX save yet. So we save those off. So we preserve those registers so we can get them after the launch. And then at this state, now we start clobbering everything. So now we do the same thing, but inverse. So this is load guest state. And we change all the dollar sign zeros, oops, dollar zeros into dollar ones. And then we flip everything around. Uh, anything contained between a square bracket to an ending square bracket, uh, comma space. Then we have the register, A through Z, one or more as another track thing. Then we'll do two comma one G. Oh, we got a zero through nine in there as well. Oh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Tracked by VTX, so we don't need to do that one. Don't need to do that one. So we'll load the RSP from the guest. And here, the guest RSP will come from self.guestregs.rsp. This will be self guest regs rip and then self guest flags rfl r flags oops guest regs so everything that is tracked for us we set and i think that's everything rip rfl and rsp so then we save and restore all the registers so that allows us to switch into this other state at which point we'll VM launch, we'll get a VM exit at this stage, and then we then we undo everything. <laughs> uh, so at this point, we get this stack back in this specific state. So we pop into one, pop zero, uh, restore host and guest registers. Um, host and guest state pointers, and then we need to put these in explicit registers. We're going to say that this is going to be in RCX, and this is going to be in RDX, because the ordering is going to matter on those. So this zeros will be an RCX. Save the host state register, save the guest state register. These will be S1 with RDX. So what we need to do is when we're saving everything, it's fine. When we're restoring everything, we load that last. Uh, oops. We load RDX last, right? Because that clobbers RDX. And then we lose access to that. Now we can pop RDX and pop RCX and we get access to those again, but I actually need to save them first. Um, uh, save the uh, VM exit RCX and RDX. So basically, load everything up. These This is just storing the memory, so there are no clobbers. Then we save the RCX and RDX. We then save the uh, host RSP and host RIP. And that's fine. We, we end up clobbering some registers. Then we load all the register states RDX last because that's where we're dereffing from. When we exit the VM, we start execution here. We save RCX and RDX. And then we're going to pop. Uh, we're not going to pop. We're going to move into RCX. We're going to load the RSP plus OX. 10 is the, that's basically a pop. 
so pop that one and then RSP plus OX18. So that'll read after these two pushes because that's eight bytes, eight bytes, so that's 10 hex total. And then we'll get the, we'll restore the host and guest state pointers. Technically we only need one of them right now. We'll use RDX for the guest state. Save the VM exit RDX. We'll load the RDX. Uh, restore the guest physical. Restore the guest, uh, not physical, um, register state pointer. So we load that from, this is at RSP plus eight. Because it's past that. We push that, we then DRF plus eight. That gets us the RDX that we had here. Then uh, save the guest state. We'll do it like this. I'm going to get rid of these comments because they're annoying me. So then to save the guest states, we're going to store everything in RDX. Ooh. Oh, that was $0 conversion. So then these, I'm just going to manually do these because I just don't want to fuck anything up. Super scared. Super fucking scared. Um, four is RSP. RDX. Now, now that we've saved this state, we can now start clobbering shit. So we're going to pop into RCX. Uh, get the saved RDX from above. And we're going to store that into RDX 3 pl uh, times 8. Uh, and save it into the guest state, right? And I think that's everything. The flags are handled for us. Super fucking scared dealing with unsafe and rust. I'm spooked, man. Rax, RBX, RCX, RDX, RSP is not saved. RDX, we then pop, get this. And that's just the guest register state. Um, pop RDX, get the guest, uh, pop off the guest register pointer, guest and host pointers. So RDX already has it, but it's still in the stack, so we want to restore the stack to the original state. So then we'll pop RCX. That'll get us uh, back to the here, so the stack is in the original state, and now we can load, now we can load the uh, host state, which is now present in RCX. And in this case, RDX comes up, RCX is the last one. And then these are now RCX, we're reading the host state, so we're restoring the host state. Technically, I don't have to storm in host state. I could just push everything to the stack um, for the host state. Um, is this better for caching? Not necessarily. It's probably worse for caching. Well, let's see if it works. Let's just see if it works. So I need ways to read and write virtual memory, and I don't right now. So I have no way of writing virtual memory to this. Uh, oh, I can translate this. Let page is equal to page table translates. Mute pmem vert adder 1337, 1234. Unwrap. Uh, dot page unwrap so that'll give us the physical address of the page and now I can do uh, create mm write fizz so at that location at the page I can write um, can I do this Uh, dot zero for the physical address. 
Uh, that's unsafe. I don't know why. <laughs> it's just right in the physical memory. Come on, Rust. Don't get mad at me. Okay, so I can do that. Oh, is that going to write the pointer to it? No, that's actually a... Uh, is that a ref bytes? No, that's, that's literally the bytes. Okay. So we are going to write to that location. We're going to write some instructions. So let's write a move EAX 4402. So a B8 is a move EAX, and then we can put whatever we want. B8 uh, 371337. So now that's going to execute an instruction, and then we'll execute an int 3 at the end. So that will cause an int 3, so we'll get that exception. And unhandled VM exit code, this. What did we break? What did we break? We fucked something up. Is it due to this transition? Let's see what that code is. Uh, Python hex this. God damn it. Copy. 21. Invalid. Invalid state. What did we change here? Were we fucking around with this stuff? I didn't think we were. Oh, our flags. Uh, our flags. Yes. Um, our flags. One shift two. Uh, or... One shift nine. Uh, so this will be set guest R flags. Make sure the reserved bit is set and interrupts and interrupts are always enabled. Did I intend to skip two times eight and four times eight? Yes, I think so. At least in some of those places. Six eight one. What do we what do we change? Let's comment all this stuff out. And just see if it works. In air quotes. If we're saving and restoring things incorrectly, we might end up clobbering host uh, state. And then we'd get, like, really weird behaviors. General protection fault. Oh, because I need to save those. That's on the exit. Let's take a look. Nice. Okay, so I don't think we broke anything. One shift two, one shift nine. Is it two? Is that bit supposed to be one shift two? It's one shift one. The value is two. It's one shift one. That's the reason. One shift one. There we go. Uh, so we got a ooh, we got a page fault. Really? Really? Re really? So now we can print the guest state. Um. This is self.guest state. Uh, guest regs. Um. We should be hooking the exception before it pushes the IRET frame. But 
that appears that it's maybe trying to write to the stack, and I, I don't know why. Let's take a look. If we set RSP to plus leet leet, see if it's accessing uh, leet 2a, uh, leet 2f. Print adder zero. We're trying to execute at zero, but why? But why though? And why is this different? That is zero. Sign in hardware as well. Why is it trying to execute zero? Oh, because we don't set fucking RIP, man. There we go. Uh, page full accessing that. See, that's confusing to me. That would make me feel like like it's trying to access the stack. Why is it accessing the stack? Is that getting an interrupt? It's getting an interrupt. Because we got the timers running. Because we have the APIC timer enabled. Page fault batter zero. What? I feel like it's getting an interrupt. It, it feels very interrupty. Changing the interrupts does affect it. All right, so we'll mask interrupts. We'll mask interrupts and not We really just need to add uh, interrupt VM exits and not one shift nine. How's that? How's that hitting that? All right, let's add some hooks. Let's. Yeah, external interrupt exiting. Why would that be pushing to the stack? What would cause that? Write fizz. Is that not an array? It's writing the address. There we go, breakpoint. Okay, it was writing an address. I was wondering that when I wrote that initially. So rip will have set up and then cuz that's a that's a reference to a slice so that was just writing the address of the slice the fat pointer actually. So now we're getting a breakpoint and we can see that uh, Rax is filled in with our leet leet value that we uh Indian wrong here but it's correct here. Um nice. All right, I'll be right back. I'm going to hit the head.
Okay. So. Now what? I guess. Uh, we gotta do FX save. That's a 512 byte field. Yeah, and that's correct, right? That pads us out to 512. Uh, 496 plus 16 is 512. So we'll add an assertion when we create a VM. Assert uh, core mem size of uh, FX save is equal to 512. Whoa. FX save broken. Um, sanity check our FX save structure shape. Costs nothing to do it there. It'll just not exist at runtime if it's always. Oh, FX save is broken. See, that's why we do it. Um, so that uh, 28166. 32 times 16, 512. Align 512, is that why? Yes. Okay, because it was getting the size of the alignment. So we'll align it to 512 just to be like super strict there. You have a list of what Vim plugins you use? I use none. All right. So before I forget, because it's because I, I just thought about it, we want to restore the guest flag states. Um. Here. Uh, self dot guest regs RSP is VM read VMCS guest RSP. R I P and R flags R F L, so this will be R S P R I P and R flags, and this way I can print those will be updated in the states. So now we can see oop, gust regs, gust regs, noise. All right, so this will now print the it'll restore those from the from that memory, and we should be able to see. Yep, there's R I P, there's R flags. There's racks, and then we don't set up a stack at all yet. But now everything, all the GPRs, are saved and restored uh, when we enter and exit VMs. OK. Fuck yeah. Next, we're going to have, and then this parse is so, um, uh, restore VM uh, guest state into our uh, Rust usable guest state structure. It's basically free to do that. And then read CR3 and then or read CR2. Guess we don't need that. And then this will process and convert the exception. And then we'll return the VM exit. And we'll put the guest reg the guest regs will be pub. And then we'll make the XMEMS pub and the MM pub. Just so people can fuck with those as needed. And then those pub, uh, 954. VM exit. Yeah, expected a VM exit. This returns a VM exit. What? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These structures and impuls don't have to exist here. Uh, parse the VM exit uh, information. OK. And we have these. Fuck. Boom, dot. This is uh, 
an x86 exception, inception, in exception, an x86 exception, uh, and this is a, a virtual machine exit reason. And that's going to be pub. I guess we want to make that pub. Oh, it's implied. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, at that level, it's implied. Uh, and then we'll implement, like, I don't know. I, honestly, we don't need cloner copy on this yet. So, all right. I want to really shut up all this stuff. And that would be on PCI. Oh, uh, unused. I could make all the mods pub. That's typically what I do to avoid the, this problem. And that means anything that's marked pub is kind of kludgy. I don't know if this hurts compile times or anything by making all these pub. And I definitely could have just done some vim foo there. But this means anything that's marked pub uh, can be unused. Panic. Uh, SP kernel, kernel source panic. PCI lock 81. Doesn't need to be mutable. That is true. Exception is private. Now it's public. Okay, cargo run clean, cargo run. Let's make sure everything builds, no warnings, no errors in the entire system. Looks good. So now uh, that's working, and then that will return out to here. So when we get to the end, we can print the uh, state or the exit reason. And yeah, we exited due to a breakpoint exception. And you know, let's pr let's print a timestamp. Let's print a timestamp for how long it took to create a VM, execute it, and exit. Thoughts, guys? How long? <laughs> how long is our boot launch VM and run VM cost? <laughs> a, mi a millisecond. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beer back. I heated up some food.
Yeah, that's sadly pretty slow. So I'm guessing that's due to having to allocate some of that physical memory for the first boot. All right. Okay. Yeah, that takes a long time, guys. Oh, we have a print. It's this print. I bet this print is what's killing us. Oh, I bet that's what's killing us. Yeah. Hell yeah. We, we, we boot our kernel, create a VM, execute the VM, exit the VM in under, uh, in... in in about 400 microseconds. <laughs> oh, that is good. <laughs> 390 microseconds. <laughs> oh, it's sick. <laughs> God, it's so fucking cool. All right, this, the performance is what we desire. <laughs> All right. That's pretty fucking good. Let's save X save state. Um. I guess we just know that that's inlined. Well, that's align 512. Yeah, right? Align 512. <laughs> Mine drifted off to sleep. Yeah, get back in here. Get back in here, quantum. <laughs> Um, all right. All right, what we got? I, I might have to make some hype here. I'm going to have to make a hype tweet, unfortunately, because I'm pretty hyped. But we got an FX save. God damn it. <clears throat> I'm loving your enthusiasm. Absolutely badass. Uh, is the code going to be available? Uh, yes, it's all open source. There's the link right there. Hell yeah. So we're going to get this uh, polished up in a more user-friendly way. Obviously, this leet is, is going to go away. Honestly, all this shit is going to go away. We'll probably set the CR3 manually. Ooh, do I want the VM to manage that for us? Huh. There we go. We're going to create... Uh, going to make a new page table. And... Ah... Uh, uh, where do I want to put this? Oh, we, I, I keep forgetting to do the FX save. <laughs> All right, we're going to put that in there before you forget. We got to pass in the um, the offset for that. Uh, where did I get that offset from? I need to pass it in. I don't know how to pass in a constant in, in Rust Assembly. I've tried it before, and I've had issues. So I think what I'll do is I'll just pass in a couple more registers, question mark. Um, we'll pass in R8s with self. Uh, is this going to cause us issues? Honestly, I don't think there's alignment requirements on this. So we'll get rid of this align 512. And then we know that it will specifically be at offsets 18 times 8 
doing the math, doing the math, and then we'll assert on this because we don't want to we don't want to make a mistake here. Uh, if we screw this up, it's going to be pretty catastrophic. So that should be at 144. That is 16 byte aligned. Yeah, I think we're fine here. Um, when we do a run, you know what? We'll do this. We'll put that sanity check because it's it's truly zero cost. So when we get to this stage and we enter, we're going to sanity check the shape of FX save. And then I don't think there's an offset of in Rust. Oh, maybe there is. No, there isn't. I think we tried this before. Yeah, so to do this, we will do... Well, we actually have these concretized at this point. So we can say, assert that the self guest regs... Guest regs again. Oh, boy, this is rough. Guest regs... Um, FX save... Get the address of that as a use size and then subtract off self.guest regs as use size. This is gonna tell me the offsets. Assert that this. Ooh, we're gonna write it like this. There we go. Assert that that is equal to. I think it was supposed to be 144 is the offset, and I want that in a hex. But it's 9 times 8. Wait. 9 times 16, which is 144. Uh, Python hex 144 is 90 hex. So we're going to assert, um, make sure the FX save uh, starts at oh, X 90 from the uh, guest regs. Because that is important. Because we're going to make some assumptions based on that. But since we're in unsafe code... We'll be fine. Uh, as const this, as this, as const this, as that. Vert adder. Oh, uh, we moved that out. Hmm. We'll hack this in here. Use core. We're going to start doing some benchmarks here to see how quickly we can uh, do some VM resets. Uh, with respect to the number of dirtied pages in the VM. Oh, X90 is not. Hell yeah. <laughs> That's that binary development there. <laughs> page type 4K. Uh, use page. It's actually in here. Page table. Use MM physical memory. This is kind of like our test program right here. Oh, uh, probably put, probably missed an as, didn't I? I did. Speed up exiting, control D. Oh, I've never learned that. God damn it, really? <laughs> okay, I've been, I've been typing that wrong for a decade. <laughs> I need to get that in my muscle memory somehow. Shit. All right. Um, exception breakpoint. <laughs> I can't believe it. Oh, oh, it needs to be empty. If this has something in it, it doesn't work. Okay, cool. Good to know. Oh, whoa! I exited my shell. I got I got a little too excited there. Um. Good thing our build is literally just running one command. Page type 4K, page table, uh, page type. Oh, we need page table as well. Page type. Control D sends EOF. Oh, shit. Leap pleb! Hell yeah. Thank you, Desu and Leap pleb. All right. What we got? Is that building? Not yet. Uh, 752. Oh, page table's not present here. I need to, hmm. Yeah, we'll just have a page table. Uh, the real MV, <laughs> he is the real MVP here in Plevland. <laughs> he at least deserves a sub. 
Oh, Lead Pleb did the gifting. Yeah, Desi. Thank you. I re I read that wrong. Control C, Control D. If you have something written. So yeah, that makes sense. Cause that will go to the Ooh. Okay, I gotta damn. I gotta start working that into my workflow. That and block uh, highlights in Vim, which I always forget to do. <laughs> Every once in a while I learn a new thing and then I forget that I learned a new thing and then I never use it. <laughs> Pub page table. Uh, this is a page table for the uh, guest uh, virtual space. And right now this makes no sense. Uh, well, this makes sense for user, but it doesn't make sense for kernel guests. Um, but that's acceptable to me. So we're gonna yank these and we're gonna paste these into where we create the VM. And this is uh, create a new empty page table uh, for the 64-bit for the guest. And then we'll do page table. Noise, 760. Uh, this is self page table. So we will use that page table for all these things. And the page type's not used, of course. And page table doesn't need to be mutable because we're just creating it and not using it. And then here, the page table, let page table be equal to create a new virtual machine. Okay, we create a new virtual machine. We get mutable access to the page table of the guest. And we can just do vm.page table. Oh, yeah. And then we translate that page so we can get the physical address. This is just hacky. So this is a uh, map in one page as RWX and user mode to leap. Uh, and this is get the physical address of the uh, page and write in some assembly. So we write in a move racks 3713 because we typed it wrong. Um, mute pmem. Let mute pmem is equal to mm physical memory. Can get rid of this import. I'm fine with mm because it's short. Not using page table because we're not creating one anymore here. And now that's managed for us. So. That's sweet. So this is kind of using our API. Let's make sure we're setting up. Uh... Oh my God! Did we forget? <laughs> did we forget to do the FX save and restore again? <laughs> oh, how many times are we gonna get distracted? Are you fucking kidding me? All right, these won't need to be uh, zero anyways. We'll set the access rates on those. <laughs> Let's go do that. <laughs> God damn it. We even wrote the assert. Well, how did we distract ourselves? What did we do? <laughs> uh, there's something I didn't like about the API. <laughs> Distracting me with tips. Hey, the tips are always welcome. Those aren't distractions. Those are uh, improvements. A distraction that makes you learn is an improvement, not a distraction. I always forgotten the FPU. I mean, I, I hate I hate the FPU. <laughs> the x86 FPU is so annoying. All right, so we're gonna FX save 64 to RCX plus hex 90, and you might be saying, "Wow, that's a hard coded offset." Ho <laughs> ho! It isn't though, because we assert this. <laughs> All right, so that's going to save the state. Then we're going to load our DX. And then we're going to save the state again. That's probably going to fail because we don't have a valid floating point state. I don't think all zeros is valid for FX. Anyways, we'll figure that out. Here we're going to store the guest state. And we can do a FX save 64 RDX to save that part. 
and then load the host state. Well, FX R, uh, is it FX R store? It's not FX load, I don't think. FX R store? Yeah. R store, restore, RCX. So we'll, ooh, plus hex 90. And plus hex 90. Same with this, FX R store. So then we'll swap into that new context, and this might this might crash, and it does. This is crashing on B2B1 on the very first on the restore after exiting the VM. Wait, no, when restoring the guest one. Yep. So we got to make that valid. To do that, we have to set up some like sane defaults. Uh, I think we have to set these CW, SW, and TW. Um, yeah, what all is in here? Okay, that one has the shitty. Um, FCW. FSW, FTW for the win. This is the floating point op, the floating point IP and DP, FDP, FIP, FDS. What is that? So we've gotten, we've covered FIP, FOP, TW, SW, these. So now we need to figure out what FDS needs to be, what FCS needs to be. Is that the CS? No, that's some... Um, I don't know what a lot of these fields are. Um, so you're building a hypervisor. Very dope. Why? Just curious. I'm using this for uh, security research. So we're going to run uh, applications under test in this hypervisor. And we'll be able to hook exceptions when they crash, when they misbehave. We'll be able to gather coverage information. Um, and we'll be able to reset them very quickly. I like to say that I think we'll be able to reset these a million times a second, assuming that they have almost nothing changed. But we're going to literally find that out in, like, the next two hours. Um, I'm so excited to actually see what performance we're going to get. Um, I probably won't write AFL support for this, but I will encourage other people to add that. But this is, this is going to be designed to run full operating systems, not just applications. We're playing around with just applications right now because it's easier. But then we'll eventually have something like Linux or Windows boot in this environment. And then you can fuzz anything. You can fuzz the kernel. You can fuzz a, a virtual machine manager if we have nested vert support. You can fuzz network packets coming over the IP stack, whatever the fuck you want, a user land application. Um, do you think you'll be... Uh, Uh, do you think you'll be using this as documentation of all this stuff for myself? Like, as a reference? Probably. It's pretty solid so far. It's my latest kernel. It doesn't have IOMMU and AMD support like my other uh, kernel. But I can actually add... AMD support I could add pretty quickly. And then this could transparently, under the hood... All you do, as an end user, right, we're kind of already working on the UI. Um, <laughs> UI being the API. Basically, you'll have a register state for the guest. You'll plug in the registers, and you'll hit go, and it will just run. Now, when we do system level, we'll have so many more registers that we have to track that are more complex. And MSRs, CPU ID states, all these different things. So we need to figure out these defaults. And there are two ways that we can figure out these defaults. We can either A, figure out what they should be, or B, 
dump one that we know works. <laughs> and I can tell you which one I'm going to use. And it's going to be the, it's just going to be dumping the one that we know works. So we're going to FX save. We're not going to restore the guest one. And then we'll just save. That'll give us the ability to crash B2C. Uh, B3 to C. FX save. That's a general protection fault. Um, uh, is that not aligned enough? I don't think it has to be, I don't think it has to be more line than that. This line destination must be aligned on a 16 byte bound. Oh, ah, yes. We'll just um, make this whole thing 16 byte aligned. Uh, register state, uh, ripper align 16. That way the base is aligned 16. And then we also can do the same thing up here. Okay, that would explain the GP. About to say, there we go. So that's now failing, or well, hitting the breakpoint, which is succeeding, question mark. And we'll print the FX save states of the host. And this will show me what a valid header looks like. Uh, uh, host regs dot FX save. So this will show me what a valid FX save region looks like, and we'll do this. And then we'll try and see if it looks sane. Uh, deadlock detected. 921. We're in a print right now, aren't we? Yes, we are. VM exit is vm.run. VM exits. That fixes the deadlock. God, that deadlock detection is nice. All right, so this is the state. So I got 37F. 37F, that's the FCW. And let's see, uh, CW, 40. Hmm. Do you have access to the kernel APIs directly when in the guest? No. <clears throat> the guest has no access to the host at all in this case. And I don't think it ever will for this work. Um, what's going on here? I mean, we know these are valid. All F's up here. MXCSR mask, all F's. I'm just surprised what state this is set in. And then it's only these four, which is 32 bits. This is the, this is 32 bits from the top which would put it here, FIP, the floating point instruction pointer, FCW. I don't know, I think zero is valid for a lot of these, one FA. So this is the, um, so that is the MXCSR mask. All Fs at the top, low zeros, and then MXCSR is here. And what does that default to? 1F80, 1FA0, okay. I could construct this. Yeah, we're just gonna construct this quick. Sorry, y'all. 
Uh, FX save. We're just gonna do this correctly. Move on from it. Uh, this won't impl default, but it will impl default for it. The floating point save. This is going to be um, FCW U16, FSW, FTW U8, uh, reserved. Um, FOP 16, FIP U32, FCS is a U16, reserved. Um, we're going to do, uh, instead of RSV, RSVD, reserved. Uh, U16, then we'll have an FDP, which is U32, FDS, which is U16, uh, RSVD2, U16, MXCSR U32, and MXCSR mask. Okay. So now we have all of these, and then we'll just construct defaults for these. All right. Yeah, I need to shift these over because this is driving me nuts. I cannot stand when my things aren't vertically aligned. Good night, subnet. See you around. Excited to watch the VOD for this one. Hell yeah, I will, I'll have it up. It seems like YouTube's been pretty fast, so we can do same day. Okay, we got to impl defaults for this. That's easy. Uh, well, it's not easy. Uh, default for FX save, FN default return a self. Then we'll do FX save, X MM is zero for eight, XMM is zero for 16, reserved is U128 for six, or zero for six. Okay, so we have all those fields, and then we will fill in these with the default states. Holy shit, we just exceeded a thousand lines of code on this file, and we've just started it a couple hours ago. That's a little spoopy. CW will set to OX40. FSW will set to zero. FTW will set to five, 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 five. We're just stealing all these. Reserve to zero, uh, floating point op is zero, floating point IP is zero, floating point CS is zero. Reserved uh, data and data segment. Reserved zero, MXCSR. This will be set to um, random off topic question. Uh, do you find line numbers in Vim useful? Yes, I do. Um, So I basically never actually read the errors. You'll notice this is a trend of mine. I usually don't read the errors. I just read the line number. I then find that line number. I'll jump to it if it's far. If it's close, I'll just literally look at the line and I'll see what the error is. So I'll, I very frequently will completely ignore the actual errors. MXCSR. Okay, MXCSR is OX1F80. And the mask, I don't know why. I don't know why the mask is that, but that's what it is. FTW. Why well, don't I say 5555? I don't know. Maybe that doesn't matter. We'll set the the control word. It's the control word, the status word, and then something else. We'll see if this one goes and chugs. Uh, F R store. Let's see what we got, and that works. So now we have set up a new uh, guest regs, and now we're using those guest regs. Uh, we restore those. So here are the guests uh, registers, and then if we did like a move XMM or something like that, what's a what's the fastest way I can do that? Uh, probably a move queue in from racks. So we'll do vim uh, move queue. 
There we go. Move Q, XMM zero racks. <laughs> I like how I don't have to assemble it. I just like, I just find one that exists. <laughs> um, X, ooh. So six, six is the um, segment override prefix. That, and then the four, eight is the Rex prefix. And then that basically controls the encoding on SSE. Uh, SSE encodings are, are very strange, but here we see an XMM with that value from racks in it. So that does show that we are saving and restoring the XMM values because we moved racks, uh, which is the leap value that we made, and it moved that into XMM zero, and that's what we printed. So we have successfully done XMMs as well. Relative line numbers when in edit mode and switch to actual when in normal mode. What's the, what are the relative line numbers? It's like, like every time you move a line, it just updates on the left side, like plus minus. Oh, so you can do like D40 or something. Oh my God. Cause you know how many, oh shit. Yeah. I always just highlight to do that, which is a relatively new thing. I used to just guess. <laughs> I, I used to literally just guess. All right. It works on hardware and it works on software. Or in, it works on physical hardware and it works in this uh, virtual machine as well. So now, holy shit, guys. I think, how fast does it boot on native hardware? Na on native hardware, <laughs> it's, it's 180 microseconds. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> Alright. So now we want to get rid of this hard coded leet that I have. Okay. We always set the reserve bit and always enable interrupts. Page fault. Yeah, because I got to set rip. So. Here's the API. You create a new user mode VM, creates an empty VM with an empty address space and all initialized registers. And then you map in memory as needed, write in the bytes that you want to be present in that memory. And then you set vm.guest regs, rip is equal to wherever you want execution to start. And then it'll use those values and run a VM in that context. And there, there it goes. 1865. Oh, I love how much more deterministic hardware is. Yeah, that's pretty fucking cool, man. Even though this is like my fifth time I've done this, this is the first time I've done it this clean. And this, like, I've never really done it in Rust and had an API that's this nice. Obviously, this looks like shit. But now, as I eat my waffle, um,. Let's write to some memory. Let's do a push racks. Uh, 50. I should know that. So we'll do a push racks at the end. That should cause a page fault because we're going to write to the stack. Right? Uh, that's basically all Fs. Let's hex print this. So that's writing to the stack because we haven't set up a stack yet. So let's set up a stack at um, at the end of the page. So this will then push onto the end of the page. And there we go. So that wrote memory, and that means that I should be able to print the value that I wrote there after execution is complete. Once again, I'll make better APIs for this. Uh, create mm read fizz page uh, read fizz as a u. 64 because we pushed racks page dot zero plus ox f f8 i'm gonna read the last thing on the page vert adder a uh, fizz adder okay uh unsafe apparently i always get surprised by that all right here we go and there's the contents of memory. So that also updated the memory. So we know that we have access to memory. We know we can execute. And 
you know, if we change this, right, if we change this to uh, uh, 0 FF8, right, we won't see a value. We'll read 0 back because that will be the uninitialized page contents. Um, actually, they're, yeah, they're uninitialized, and that was from the last boot. <laughs> so if we put this at FF0, well, that's the new one. We'll go FE0. Since this OS is deterministic, we actually get the same pages and allocations, so uninitialized things from the previous boot will show up in the exact same location. Um, FE0. Oh, FE8. That'll cause it to push to FE0, and then we should see that become delete. All right, so. Right now I map that memory and I don't initialize it. Literally just give the guest uninitialized memory. Oh well. So now we need to initialize it. And I think, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this run shell code. So I'm gonna build a, a shell code assembler here, which is really easy, right? So we're gonna make um, uh, um, at shell code, and we'll uh, git commit um, basic uh, user land hypervisor. Get that shit locked in <laughs> before we like have some catastrophic thing happen. Although I just uh, I just got UPSs for all my computers, so now I feel like bulletproof. I got UPSs in a whole house generator, so <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not too afraid of like weird events anymore. All right, we can move that back to four. Cargo run. All right, so now we can use our. We can use our virtually mapped in memory. Uh, we can use this, our net mapping stuff. So we're gonna use net mapping to create a mapping of what we want to use to back the virtual machine memory. It's gonna be really weird. But basically, we're gonna map this file. Um, at a given location. So here's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna have any memory mapped in at all. And we're gonna set RIP to a certain value, right? So create a virtual machine, set RIP and run. This is gonna page fold immediately, right? Uh, fill the netmap file. Yeah, we don't have access to a network card. So let's do that. Get access to a network card by enabling PCI again. Reboot. Okay, that's getting a lease. Oh, it's just working and we're not printing anything. Oh, I can't soft reboot. Um, we have to add a TFTP thing if we want to do that at some point, but not a big deal. They'll print the VM exit. Here we're going to try and map it, and we get the mapping from server. So we should be able to reboot. That'll get a map, and then we'll print the error code. There we go. So... Um, what's taking two seconds there? I think I have something wrong in my server. Reset. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's the time it takes to get a DHCP lease from the network. There's really nothing we can do there. That's on the network. And then that's how long it takes for us to get this foobar. And I, oh, I know why. It's the same issue that I was doing last time. So when I do entry, I'm reloading this file every time, dot or insert. Uh, and I want to do an or insert uh, closure, because I'm actually reading that file every time and then discarding it. And it's a four gig file. Um, th this was just a test file that we were using. So I want to do entry. I want to figure out entry on Rust. Uh, entry on hash maps. Uh, hash map entry. This returns an entry. Or insert with. Okay. There we go. Or insert with. 
Now, this will only get invoked if it's not already present. Cargo run. Um... Ooh. Or insert with. Uh, I guess I have to unwrap that. It's not that big of a deal. If the file doesn't exist, we'll get a panic. Okay, reset. Now the first time, it'll take a long time. And then the second time, it should be basically instant. Yes, it is. So that's basically the time between when we ask the server to open a file and when the uh, server tells us that file information. Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to actually make something that allows us to write some shell code. Um, the active server will move away and then make a new stream term. So here we'll go into, oh, and git status, git add server source. There's a, we didn't add a lot of shit. Whoa. Uh, let's do uh, git add server source first. Git add shared folk tp. Git add shared noodle git status. Tuple match gen serialized tuple match. Okay, so we have noodle pulled into there. A lot of stuff. Uh, git add kernel source net. You're welcome, guys, for committing basically nothing, because we didn't have all the files we added. <laughs> um, server. Git add server cargo.toml. Uh, git add l slash diagrams. How big are these? We'll add these. Um, server target. We don't want that, of course. So we'll go into git ignore slash target, and then slash files, which is where we'll host files from. Uh, get add server cargo.lock, get add server git ignore git status. Okay, then foobar, it's gone. Status git commit am uh, actually added the uh, files we're using. Git push. All right. Cargo run clean. History C. Cargo run. We have a couple of warnings. Not a big deal. All right. Now, make their files, vim source, and then we're going to jail into this files directory. So instead of this, we're going to canonicalize files. So we'll host files out of files. Uh, cat. Yeah, I did call it files. So now anything that we put in files will not be part of git and that will be where we serve from. So we'll go into chocolate milk server files and I'll make a make file all nasm fbin uh, test.asm o test.bin and then make vim test.asm bit 64 uh, origin ox 1337-1234. This is our test application. Uh, entry point uh, move racks ox lit move rbx ox high. Uh, I can't move high. That's not going to work. Uh, cafe int3 cargo uh, make. Uh, and that should assemble that into a assembly file that we can now write and then ship that into our um, VM. And we're gonna actually gonna fault that in. So I'll show you what we're gonna do. Server files uh, make, and then here we'll edit test.asm. So this will be building it and then running it here. Okay. So, fill the netmap file, of course. Uh, this is now test.bin. Test okay, this will allow me to, we'll be able to netmap that. 
hopefully. Fill the netmap files, vim sources, this. Files. Oh, we need to um, path new. And then I think I'll do a path new files dot join the file name. I think I can join on an into or an asref path. And I can. So this should now work. Good. So that loaded that file. It figured out the size of this, which we now can build. And this server is caching. So what I might, I might need like a no cache bit so the server doesn't hold it in memory. Otherwise, I'm going to have to restart the server every time. We'll restart the server for now. Ah, uh, entry. Yeah, we pretty much have to cache it based on this. Actually, if there's a new open request, we could uh, load it again. Um, if the date has changed. So we could store the modification time of the file. And we can get that through Rust, I think, from metadata, file, metadata, metadata. We can get that off path. And we can get the modified time. OK, so we'll store a system time in our database um, system time uh, map of file IDs to the um, to the system to the modified time and their contents okay uh, Hell yeah, this makes me want to learn Rust. You should go learn Rust, man. What's stopping you? File DB. Insert width. This is the closure. Um, let modified is equal to path. File name is already the path, isn't it? Yes, that is the canonicalized path. So we can do modified is file name dot metadata unwrap dot modified dot unwrap maybe in that ballpark system time yep use standard time system time. Expected tuple, 65. Did we really get that first try on that? Yes, we did. File. Then here we're going to get the modify time. You know, maybe I should have that as part of the hash. No. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll improve this shit over time. This is going to get access to the file and the file ID, file database. This will get, it, that only cares about the contents, 72. File.len, file.0.len, oh, 1.len are the contents. And make that a release build for perf. And this should work. And now, what we can do is Vim source, get the entry to that. Um, or insert with that. And then we'll say if file dot one is less than, uh, here we'll get modified. Get the modified time of the file. Okay, and if the file is less than, if the one in our cache is less than the modified time, print uh, reloading this file name, 
we'll do this and then print loading loading this file name now if we get a newer one uh, check if we should reload the file um, since it has been modified and if it has been then we just update file with this something like that that's like ballpark what I want to do uh, file name get, file name got moved here okay I was not kind of expecting that to work first try let's see if it actually works though reset loading that if I run this again it won't reload it won't reload it if I make this and then I run this it will reload it god fuck yeah okay obviously if someone else if a server already is accessing that file it's gonna have some big issues but uh, whatever so that means that we can now network map that file and then we get a page fault here so now we can fault in page faults from our net mapping so we know um, this is uh, map the uh, map the um, what is this the memory contents at network map the memory contents okay now what we're gonna want to do is we actually want to make a readable version new read only um, this way we'll only have read only access to this mapping and let's get this implemented in kernel source network mapping net mapping where did we implement that kernel source network net mapping then in here we'll just have a bool read only um Yeah, we can now have backing uh, slice to the raw contents of the mapping. Then we'll have um, fault. This is the registration uh, for the fault handler. And then we have, uh, we'll have a bool here, which will be um, read only, uh, tracks if this network mapping is read only. And there's really no way that I can do this in a clean way without having a, a mutable accessor, I don't think. Because, how does Rust handle it? Because someone can make this mute. I think we just will have this read only field and then new. This will have read only as a bool. Yeah, we'll do that. This will have read only. Um, from our parts mute and then assert self dot read only uh, is not read only and this is uh, attempted write access to read read only network mapping okay so if it's not read only then get out of here then 218 self dot zero backing stop backing doesn't have this field in net mapping. Uh, new read only, yeah, so this will just be new and then we'll set the read only bit. Set this to true. So that's a read only mapping and then 205 um, backing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I get, I get what's happening. Backing. This is vert adder dot zero. That is correct. I was just, why was I just guessing that dumb shit? Uh, vert adder dot zero. 
how many how many of y'all guess just like randomly try shit as much as I do? I feel like I'm always randomly fucking trying stuff because I'm never actually reading what the errors are because I'm too lazy. I think I like doing it because it keeps my APM up. Um, uh, set to true if this is a read only mapping. In which case, we actually want to hook and make sure we don't map these things as read only. This is the handler. So that, that's the handler registration. Uh, we'll call it the fault reg. And then read only 217. Uh, unclosed. Oh, is that a sum? Can this fail? Yes, it can. Okay, so that will plumb everything through. And now, if I try to mutably access this mapping, mapping five is equal to five, this should now panic, because it'll be like, whoa, that's not a mutable network mapping. Okay, now if I get rid of that assertion, this will succeed. And we want to change that. So currently, Yep, that'll succeed. And what we want to do is when we map this, when we set the permissions, we will do if self.read only zero else page right. So now if it's read only, we'll actually truly map it as read only. Here we go. This should actually cause a page fault. Uh, fill the map in. Ooh. Ooh. Why? Um. I don't understand why that would fail. This succeeds and this fails. If that else page right, if it's read only or with zero, fail to map in network mapping. Okay, let's look at our page table code. Uh, shared page table source um, map raw. I think we've mapped read only things before, so let's see. If present is zero or that, if it's already mapped, but it won't be, go through for the depth, translate. We don't write to it. Um, oh, because we get another page fault that's uh, for a write request. So we got a page fault for trying to write to it because I don't pass the, I don't pass the page fault reason. So this is a, a stat, um, status flags uh, code U32. That's the reason why we caused the page fault. We try to reassign to it and Um, okay, so then that makes sense. Uh, kernel source interrupts. You know, I feel like I thought about that when I started to write the code for the first time. Uh, the page fault handlers will take a, this impl will take a code, which is the, the code is the, uh, uh, error code pushed onto a stack during a page fault. Okay, now, in our handler, uh, 367, this is gonna have the code. Probably call it error or something like that, error, u size. Mm. 
Uh, do I like that being a U size? No, we'll make it U64. Um, U32. Make this a U64. Might as well. Then, in net mapping, this becomes a U64. Now we have the reason why it failed. And then in interrupts 3d6. What are the regs? Handler. I think we want to change this. Yeah, I was passing that to the handlers as well. Interrupt dispatch, U64. Now we're going to have to change kernel um, source APIC, where we register a timer interrupt. This just has to be a U64. We're not using it, so it's not a big deal. Now we got all that plumbed through, and now what we can do is that same error field that we parsed out in VTX. Uh, this error code here, this present read write, what we'll do is we'll say if code and one shift one. Um, if self is uh, read only and that is not equal to zero um, if there is a write access to a read only mapping uh, return uh, unhandled return false okay so now this should page fault because we don't handle it there we go. We got a page fault trying to access that memory because we're trying to write to it. Um, and we don't allow that. So now it's a read-only mapping. And now, uh, oh, we'll reopen that. Kernel source net, net mapping. And then this. Uh, I can't soft reboot. So this should fail yep because it gives that nice pretty assertion okay so there's no way that we should be able to write to that anyways but so here we create a network mapping uh as read only now we map in nothing into the vm the vm is empty when it starts running so what we want to do is we want to handle that page fault so we'll say uh if let VM exit exception uh, exception page fault and we'll just grab the address is equal to and we discard the rest is equal to VM exit so if we had a page fault uh, print page fault so we're just going to print that we got that just to make sure that that logic is working. And it should. We just got to pull in a couple more things. Uh, use VTX VM, VM exit, and exception. Okay. So make a new user virtual machine. We will then catch if we get an exception, which we will have. Now, if we have an exception, we'll say if it's in the range, if... The address is greater than or equal to, uh, here we'll do uh, const vm base is equal to a u64, eh, a vert adder, which is leet. So this is vm base. All right. Uh, base for this test vm. So then network map that, and then when we have a page fault, if it's greater than the VM base and the address is less than or equal to the VM base plus mapping.len. Oh, I don't have a len for mapping. Oh, I, I do have a len for mapping because that will deref. Um, 
let mapping end is equal to vm base plus mapping len minus one. Do that one first. Um, vert adder this. Uh, end dot zero. Okay, so if there was a page fault, if the page fault was inbounds of our mapping, uh, then we can potentially handle it. So what we'll do here is we'll do a loop. This is going to print the raw VM exit. Then, uh, otherwise, else break uh, VM loop. Break VM loop. So if it is a page fault, that's the only thing we handle, and this will be the VM loop. So I'll print page fault, and then this will try to re-enter, and we're probably going to get a general protection fault because we're going to try a VM launch when we need to do a VM enter. Um, but that's fine. We can always clean those things up. Else. Okay. So this will go and re-enter it because the page fault will be handled, even though it won't be. And we just keep getting the exception in a loop because we never handle it, right? So that looks great. Actually, how's that VM launch working? What? I thought you had to use VM launch the first time and then VM enter the subsequent times. Oh, maybe VM launch is always works, but it's expensive. Let's take a look at... Um... VM instruction reference, instructions, VM launch, VM resume. Resume the current one. Okay. VM fails if it's not clear. VM resume fails if it's not launched. Um, okay. Neither VM launch nor VM resume should be used immediately after those. That makes sense. All right, let's see why. Why would I want to do a, an entry? I'm guessing it's cheaper. VM resume should be used for subsequent ones from the same VMCS. Um, so I'm guessing that's just cheaper. But I don't really know if the VMCS has changed. Yeah, I don't know what VMCS is currently loaded. Is there a VM pointer store? There is. I don't know how expensive that is. But I could use this to determine the current VMCS pointer. And then if it is changed. VM pointer store. Oh, VM clear. Ah, oh, fuck. How do I want to do this cleanly? Because technically, right now, I support multiple VMs. No problem. And I kind of don't want to. Chat, why are you so quiet? No one said anything for like an hour. <laughs> Wake up, chat. <laughs> I feel so lonely. Um... What do we got? What do we got? We're doing VM launch to... We're focused in a trance. Chat's borked. We're all lurking. I'm still here. Okay, chat's still here. <laughs> that was just a test. Now it's spam. Good, good, spam. 
<laughs> oh, hell yeah. <laughs> okay, so we want to do a VM launch. Or resume. And we want to do a, a VM resume. You know what? We'll, we'll probably benchmark that. I'm working on my own code, to be honest. Listen to you talk in the background is oddly soothing and making me want to work on cool projects, too. What are you working on right now? What's your, what's your project right now? Um, okay, so we got a page fault. Now, let mute pmem is equal to mm physical memory. So what we're going to do is we're going to map in the page, and we're going to read it from the mapping. It's going to be really strange, but we can do that. Um, your distraction from coding in the language start? Oh. Currently doing some open source work, migrating code bases uh, from nose test and Python to PyTest, so that they can that they continue ah, so that they continue to run correctly on Python 3.9. Ooh, what open source project? If if you want to share, I don't know if you if you don't want to share, feel free to not share. Python 3.9. What did Python 3.9 add? I have not used it at all yet, or looked into the new features. Um, PMM is equal to physical memory. Then, um, we're going to map in to VM page table map raw, which is unsafe, unfortunately. So we're going to map into the page table. Oh, do we have to use map raw? No, we don't. We can just map uh, shared the walrus operator. <laughs> I just got a segmentation uh, fault core dump trying to run dodgeless binary, not as root. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> you got some uh, you got some uh, APTs after you? <laughs> okay, we're going to map. You know, maybe I have this return the physical address that was used for the mapping. No, maybe we will do a map raw. I'm a core developer for the Pylons project, helped to develop Pyramid, a uh, Python web framework used, in some, used by some small sites like Reddit and Yelp. Oh, yeah, small sites. <laughs> we, we, we bomb uh, with Python WSGI res request and response library and Waitress, a pure Python HTTP server. Okay, all those sound really fucking cool. <laughs> those, like, all sound sick. I'm always scared to do Python dev in large projects because without typing, but I do recognize that a lot of people are using them. We have a bunch of older projects that are still heavily used, uh, but are using the old nose test framework, which no longer runs in Python 3.9. Oh, interesting. Huh. Is PyTest like universal as well? Or does that like set a new floor for the Python version number for those projects? All right. I want to make sure they continue when Python 3.9 is released. When Python 3.9 is adopted in 2050, when we stop using Python 2. <laughs> I don't know how Python 2 is still a thing. It's like 15 years old. Uh, I guess people just, I, I think people just like not having prints on their prints. I honestly like Python 3 more and I don't know. Like a lot of people say they like Python 2 more due to like byte manipulation, but I think Python 3 is better. I like the explicit different 
differentiation between strings and bytes. I think that's very healthy. Uh, 2.7x is officially retired in 2020. Ooh. Python 3 is better at byte manipulation. That would be my viewpoint. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Python 3. Yeah, I just objectively think it's better. It's just so good. I love it, man. Uh, look forward to dropping Python 2 support from our projects. Hell yeah. I'm all about that. I've been doing only Python 3 for a while, and I've been like forcing people to use my uh, scripts to use uh, Python 3. <laughs> Mainly, I just use uh, f strings, which is I think Python three six. F strings are so nice. Holy shit! <laughs> I use f strings everywhere now. All right. So I think I will just alloc mem from fizzmem. Yeah. Map in the page. Pmem let page is equal to fizzmem alloc fizz zeroed layout from size align, 4096, 4096, unwrap. Uh, page table uh, layout comes from use alloc, uh, core alloc layout. Okay, so allocate a new page and zero it out. Then we're going to map in that page by doing a map raw. It's raw. <laughs> Mute pmem. The virtual address is the adder.0 and not oxffff. We'll just page line the address of the faulting. Then uh, we got some parens off somewhere. No. Okay. I feel like something's off because the tabs are a little fucked. Uh, page type, page 4K, and then the raw bits, this is actual page table entry, we're going to do um, page or page write or page present um, and page user. Oh, we'll, we'll try this as a test. Um, page present, page... Right, and then we'll need page user shortly. 121, fizzmem, not found in this scope, uh, pmem. I might need that trait. Yes, page table, and this is uh, fizzmem. And then we'll use page table this. 125. This is unsafe. So that will create a new mapping at that virtual address. And then we'll print our page faults. The page fault will be handled. So now we should see the first one will be a, a non-present page, and then it will be present. Uh, user exec. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, panic mapped in page. And I should go and re-execute. Okay. Mapped in page. Uh, unwrap. You only want to see this once. Okay, so that worked. That successfully mapped in the page. Now, is it because we're not using VM resume? Do we have to use VM resume? So we get another one. This is a non-present. And be good, man. Thanks for the follow. Thanks everyone for all the follows. Anyway, just doing gardening, keeping projects update rather than letting them stagnate. Yeah, for sure, man. Like. Cleaning up projects is something that I really enjoy doing. Just going through and like 
rewriting a bunch of things or, I mean, quite frankly, this entire project is literally just a rewrite um, of old kernels, right? It's just, it's a, a new take, a new view using features that I'm better at writing with hopefully the fact that I'm a better developer than I've ever have been. Um, okay, so we're mapping this where? Let's print here, mapping in X question mark. So this will print where we're mapping to. And this should be leet. And we are. So the fact that we're actually getting an old entry value makes me believe that I do need to call VM launch. And or VM resume. Um, how do I do that without copy pasting the code? Refactoring is an art form for sure, for sure. How do I have this different with a VM launch? So if I do just a VM resume, what happens here? Oh, actually, actually I'll do an int three. If I hit that int three, I know that VM launch failed and we're falling through. And I bet that's what's happening. Beautiful. So you get one exit and then we hit int three. Totally is what ha is happening. And this is um, should never be hit unless uh, we should be using VM resume. And we could technically. Then in three. <laughs> if the VM launch fails, then do a VM resume. Uh, my perf. And it worked. We got a new fault with uh, page present. Um, yeah, so that, that does work. Uh, we don't want to do that, though. I don't think. I think that VM launch is probably relatively expensive. So uh, unless we should be using VM resume. If we should be using VM resume, then... How are we going to do that? Does FXR store set flags? Holy shit, can I do a comparison way up here? FXR store? Moves don't set flags. FXR store, I don't think, sets flags either. Um, FXR store, x86. If this doesn't set flags, Flags. It doesn't mention flags are set. I would assume that flags do not get set. Uh, load the guest state anyways. Here, load the guest, uh, load the guest floating points regs. And this is load the guest GPRs. And this is um, check if we should be using VM launch or uh, VM launch or VM resume. And we're gonna test, I don't know, R8. Uh, yeah, we'll do something lower. Well, yeah, we'll do um, EDI, EDI. Uh, these flags can persist during the uh, G guest GPR loads. And then down here we can do uh, jump non-zero two f, and this will be two f, and this will be should not be hit unless we're hitting VM resume uh, or VM launch failed. And then in this case, jump non-zero. Uh, if use VM resume, or if resume is true, if it's non-zero, then use resume. Otherwise, use launch. So we'll do a VM launch. 
And then this will um, be the VM resume. Int 3 uh, should never be hit unless VM launch failed. Uh, should never be hit unless VM resume, uh, VM launch failed. And this is VM resume. Because those don't fall through, those get re-execution on the exit handler. So we'll, we'll see an int 3 here. It's basically a sign that we need to be using a resume. So we'll say if init is true, um, now I need to determine if I should be using launch or resume. And I don't know the best way to do that. I don't know if storing the current VMCS pointer is expensive. But I'm kind of afraid that it is. Uh, let's old. Mm. Unsafe. LL assembly. We're going to see how quick this is. We'll do this in a loop. We'll profile this instruction. VM pointer store into zero. Where... Zero is a register, which is a mutable reference to um, old VMCS. Let's mute old VMCS as an OU64. Uh, let's say a memory clobber here, and this is volatile assembly. Okay, print x old VMCS. And I think we'll want to store probably a zero into it to just cause it to be zero when we first launch. All Fs. Nice, so VMX on will set it to all Fs. Okay, makes sense. Um, and let's see how fast this is. Uh, for this in zero dot dot a million times, uh, print took this to store. And then we'll do CPU RDTSC minus IT. And this is uh, let IT is CPU RDTSC. So we'll save the time. We'll loop a million times. We'll see how fast uh, this instruction is. Depending on the cost of this instruction, it might be better for us to do a lock. And it looks uh, pretty expensive. Um, copy, paste. This divided by... A million. This is the number of cycles per, wow, 4,500 cycles. Holy shit. That is, okay, literally pretty much anything we could do is better than that. Um, is VM pointer load the same? Let's benchmark that one too. We want to omit that then as well. Uh, this is to load. So we'll load in the loop. Wow, that is... That is egregious. I know this code looks like shit. There you go. We copied an extra unsafe. Doesn't really matter. Reset. Whew. Okay, so loads are faster, but they're still incredibly slow. They're uh, two, uh, about 3,000 cycles each. So we do not want to do that every iteration. <laughs> Absolutely not. That is a big no-no. Otherwise, we're gonna lose all of our perf. Okay, so, try it on a real machine, sure. Um, this probably only has one more reset in it because I'm actually initializing in the nick now. Uh, Oh, 47 cycles to store, 96 to load. Okay, yeah, it's a lot faster. Yeah, the nested vert, nested vert was killing it. Okay, uh, I can't reboot this machine anymore, which sucks, because I lose that network card in the Pixie. Um, you know what I can do is I can, I can probably set this to Pixie boot off one of the NICs and not initialize the other one as a, as a quick hack. Um, we'll set that up once we fix this. So in core, sp kernel source core locals, 
uh, VTX, uh, VMX on. We'll store the, we'll use an atomic so it's cheaper. This will be the um, current VM pointer. And this will be an atomic U size. Uh, current active uh, VM pointer from a VM pointer load. And then we'll give access to that through an unsafe. Uh, pub unsafe fn current VM pointer self. Um, atomic u size self dot current VM pointer. Uh, get access to the core's active VM pointer, uh, VTX VM pointer, VM, VM pointer load, right? Just as a reference. So then what we're going to do is if, and we'll set that to all Fs, atomic u size new not zero, because that's what they use as invalid. So we'll say unsafe. Um, if current VM pointer, uh, if core current VM pointer dot load ordering sequentially consistent is not equal to self.vmcs.fizz adder. Ah, uh, fuck it. Atomic U64 that then. Makes more sense. Atomic U64, Atomic U64. Okay. 160, uh, not found in the scope. Now it is. Okay, so if this is not equal to the physical address, then activate it. Um, so this will be a uh, check uh, if we need to uh, switch to a different active VM. So if it's not equal to that, okay, we got some probs. What's going on here? I don't understand why my Vim tabbing is all fucked up. Um, Fizzadder dot zero. Then here we'll do core current VM pointer store self dot VMCS dot fizz adder uh, dot zero. And this is ordering sequentially consistent. Okay. Uh, use core sync. Atomic ordering. So if that, then we swap over. Now the question is, when do I have to use VM resume? VM resume. VM launch should be used for the first VM entry after a VM clear, uh, VM resume should be used for subsequent ones. Now when I'm done, when I'm done with the VM, do I use VM clear? Um, Uh, 
Um, it sets the launch state of it to clear. So, and this, after VM clear, oh, do I want to be VM clearing that when I make a new one? For that VMCS are copied to the VMCS region in memory. Pretty sure I mentioned the tunic thing before. I've used that before. But yes, I did I did see that. Uh, note that the VM clear instruction might not explicitly write any VMCS data to memory. Do I want to be using a VM clear? VM resume only with one that is launched. Okay. How do I switch VMs? VM exits. VM clear. All right, let's take a look. VM exit. Um, uses that. Yeah, I, I, I maybe should be setting it VM clear, or I should be using VM clear. After that, that VM CS is neither active nor current. If it has been current on the processor, it is no longer no longer has a current VM CS. The VM pointer test or store stores that into that. It stores that if there's no active uh, no current VM CS. Okay, so if there's a current VM CS, ah, here here we go. This is what I want. So, um. Anything else, VM clear to here. So then we do a VM pointer load and that makes it active. So I can just set that as active, I think. And then VM launch is launched and then clear. Or load Y sets it to not current, but launched. Aha, okay, cool. That is what I actually wanted to know. This state diagram is fucking awesome. So that lets me know that um, if I load a new Y, then it's still launched. And thus, the launched bit is actually part of this. True, or false. So the first time we run it successfully, launch will be set to true. Um, struct VM and this launched um, tracks if this VM is currently launched. Thus, VM resume should be used. Okay, ordering. So if the current VM pointer is not equal to the VM that we want to load. Then we'll do a VM pointer load of the uh, physical address, and then we'll store that that is the active VM, which I think is the terminology they use, active. Oh, not current. Whatever, it's not current, who cares? Oh, then you have to, oh, you can load X back, and then you're back in this state. Okay, cool. Um, so then what we're going to do is down here, launched will be passed in into RDI, EDI. So EDI, into EDI, we're going to pass in um, 
One second. Okay, join. Okay, this. Okay. Oh, I gotta grab something on my Tibi character. Uh, while we do that, while my character's running, we can write this code quick. This will take self dot launched as u32. Uh, that's a colon. So then we pass that in into EDI, and then self dot launched is true. Uh, mark that this VM has launched. So now we were getting that int three, and now we shouldn't get an int three anymore. And we don't! Ho ho! Easy, guys. Which written the operating system was the easiest launch is true? That's what we just did. That's what we just did, and it worked. It worked just fine. Launch is true, and then we tried it, and then it, and now it works. <laughs> and let's see, if we don't set this, then we get the int three, right? I like to test the negatives sometimes. And there's the int three. Beautiful! So that means that Boolean is correctly being used and passed in. Oh. All right, so now we get that page fault uh, on main. We don't need this open, and we don't need core locals. So now we're going to map that memory in, and we're going to map it in as page user. So we map in the page, and now it is accessible. Um, page user, we got to pull that in. So that maps it as read writable, executable, and user accessible. And now we have a page fault accessing zero because we haven't written in that memory. Now what we want to do, so this is um, map in the page. This is initialize the page contents. And what we're going to do is the page contents will be equal to adder.zero and not OXFFF. This is the offset into the base dot zero. Let offset uh, compute the offset into the mapped file. So we'll get the offset into a mapped file, and then we will copy into there. So we got to slice this up. I think we did. Um, mm fizz sliced or something like that. This will be page 4096. Mm, kernel source mm sliced from raw from raw parts mute uh, slice mm, slice fizz mute. And we give it a size in bytes. Let uh, page is equal to this. Get mutable access to the underlying page. Honestly, we want to do this before we map it in. Just out of habit. Typically, you should write to things before you start aliasing them. And then we'll do um, offsets, copy from slice. Oops. Page, copy from slice of... Uh, let two copy. Two copy is equal to. Um, we want to slice up this allocation, this mapping. Mapping at offset two. Uh, and this is as u size. Offset two. Offset plus 4096. 
That could go out of bounds. Well, this will fault, but we'll do... Um, Yeah, we'll do uh, core compare min, the smaller between the offset plus 4096, or 4096 and, uh, there we go, mapping.len minus offset. So determine the amount of bytes we want to copy. Then we'll copy two copy bytes, and we'll copy from mapping offset dot dot offset plus two copy so uh compute the number of bytes to copy and then this is uh copy in the bytes to initialize the page so now and we don't want to shadow that. Um, P PSL page slice. Page slice. Okay. Doesn't need to be mutable. Of course not. It's impossible to mutate that. Uh, fault registration is never used in net mapping. Um, that's just a placeholder. That's just to hold that handler so it goes out of scope at the right time. Okay, so now this will... In three! <laughs> Fuck yeah. So we started a VM. We started a VM with literally no memory mapped. We then executed that VM. It faulted. It caused a page fault. We noticed that that was in the region of this network mapped file. So then we download that page by page faulting. So like right here, this copy, this memory is not existent on the system. We don't actually download that file. On demand, a request comes in to pull in that page. And then we copy that in and we map that into the guest. So basically, until memory is used by the guest, that memory will not actually be downloaded. So we only download the memory that the guest actually uses during execution. And there you go. That's obviously, you know, write the same logic, but with some permission bits and whatever, and you have like a pretty solid fucking setup. Okay, now what that means is we can do um, data, uh, we can do uh, times number db0. And then um, DQ, OX, leet, 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 leet. And this is like val, right? This is the value. And here we're gonna move, we're just gonna move racks val. And now we should get two page faults, right? Um, and we don't actually have to, we don't have to rebuild the kernel because the kernel will just get this. This is the, this is the code that's running that. There you go, there's the page fault for the offset onto here. And we page fault and we download that. Now if I add some verbose prints to here, we'll do um, uh, const verbose bool is true. Uh, if true uh, prints some extra spew, read. So here's the read handler. Uh, this is the read handler. This is um, if verbose um, read 016x that's the file ID offset for size now cargo run release so this file this file that we make this test.bin is 854k but we run this VM and this VM will only download the two pages that were actually accessed during execution. Isn't that fucking cool? <laughs> this only ever downloads the two pages that are used, even though it's an 8K file. And you can see my point, right? You can see my point that this could be a 16 gigabyte 
physical memory map of a VM snapshot of a running Windows entire host system, and we only will download the pieces that we need that are actually used during execution, or like during your fuzz case, or during your snapshot, or whatever. Isn't that fucking cool? <laughs> God, I love this shit. All right. So those will print the page faults. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty cool. Damn right, it's very cool. Hell yeah. So now what we want to do is when we get to an unhandled exception, we will print here. This, this is going to be... Um, we're tabbed in twice here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this into a function, and this is like a test VM, right? Fn test VM, just to decrease our tab level by just one. But hey, I'll take every decrease on my tabbing level that I can. This now fits on one line, which I like. Okay. It also scopes the thing, things a little bit better. But yeah. So now we can write whatever application we want, whatever user land application we want, and it will run in this VM. Um, now what we want to do is, when this is done, uh, this will, will print VM exited. And this happens when there's an exit that we cannot handle, an exit in this case, the breakpoint is a VM exit that we currently do not handle, and thus we break out of the loop. We hit break VM loop here, and we end up hitting VM exited. Now, what I want to do is we want to do another loop, and this is uh, VM.reset. <laughs> so we want to reset the VM, uh, the VM, the VM, to its original state. And to do that, uh, we'll probably implement fork, maybe. Um, yeah, I think I'll implement fork. How big is, actually, I don't think I have to do fork because I can do, um, well, effectively, this is what we do. Uh, guest regs is equal to vm.guestregs.clone, and this is like a ridge regs. Uh, save off the original register state. Okay. Now, 116. Uh, clone, we don't have clone implemented on this. So we're about to implement VM resets. Uh, 119. Uh, 387. There we go. Uh, clone copy for both of these. Clone and copy. 119 reset. So resetting will just be vm.guest regs is equal to the orig regs, right? So what's really cool is that we actually keep those mappings in there. So this is a uh, reset the register state. So you reset the register state, and here we go. So in a loop, we hit our breakpoints. Eventually, we hit uh, unhandled VM exit code one. That is an interrupt. That means we hit an interrupt. Uh, our one of our APIC timers actually fired while we were inside of the VM. Um. God, why do I fucking know that? <laughs> All right, here's an external interrupt. So basically, if we had an external interrupt, we're just gonna ignore it internally. Um. VM exit. This is external interrupt. And so if it's a one, VM exit external interrupt. Okay, now that will get popped out. Oh, VM exit external interrupt. And I think that means we slurped up that interrupt, unfortunately. We'll eventually need like some way to break out and check in on things and, and whatever. Um, 
Oh, we tabbed that in again, fuckers. Uh, we'll say if VM exits, uh, if matches, if the VM exit is a VM exit external interrupt, continue uh, the VM loop. Okay, so this is like, that's a hot one. We'll do that one real quick. But yeah, I think we lose that interrupt, unfortunately. All right, so now we're hitting all these exceptions, right? We're, we're resetting the VM, we're running through. Uh, that gets stuck. Why did that get stuck? Um, why does that get stuck? What's happening? What's happening? Is it just the prints getting stuck? Or is it actually getting stuck? Oh, that's probably... I bet an interrupt fired, and then it goes into run it. Yeah, so we're gonna, um, we're just gonna I flags. Um, R flags. We're gonna disable interrupts. And not this. I guess R flags and interrupts are always disabled. So now we or those, and then we and with one shift nine, uh, and then this will never have that situation. I think what's happening is an external interrupt comes through and then that interrupt is sitting pending, or maybe it was just actually getting stuck there, but whatever, this will, uh, external interrupt. Oh yeah, because that won't prevent interrupts on the host side of things. Okay, okay, this, I think I broke something maybe, no, um, one shift nine, there you go, our flags, uh, so I guess we want the matches stuff in here, I think that print was just getting fucked. I think it might have actually been fine. I think for some reason the console just gets like stuck. Cause it seems to come back. Right? When we when we went away and came back, it was printing again. Here, champ, I look forward to reading the code, uh, trying to understand it. Looking forward to the next live stream. This is exciting work. Much love. Stay safe. Thank you so much. See you around. Thank you for stopping by. I hope you had a blast. Sounds like you did. Hell yeah. Uh, okay, so, is that actually getting stuck? Didn't we come back and it was at like 50? And it was fine? Alright, let's... If we have an external interrupt... Maybe I just want to disable interrupts when I enter it. I do have break on external interrupt, right? External interrupts cause a break, right? External interrupt exiting, good. And yeah, this should never get stuck like this. So I'm just gonna, um, when we do a run, I'm just gonna do When we get down to the assembly, that actually invokes it. Uh, core disable interrupts. And then when we're done with it, enable interrupts. We can technically do those in safe code. 
So in the safe code, disable interrupts and then enable interrupts at the end when we're done. Oh, never mind. I apparently marked those unsafe, which makes sense. Because the context of when you use them might matter. So disable interrupts there and enable interrupts at the end. And let's see if this fixes the like getting stuck thing. I'm guessing it will. We're probably getting an APIC timer interrupt. Um, okay, and I'm still able to uh, soft reboot. Well, the soft reboot is not working, but uh, yeah, so basically an interrupt is probably getting set pending, and then I don't actually handle the interrupt, um, and clearly that is a problem. Okay, so now we can see how quickly we can reset and enter that VM. We're not resetting the memory right now. Just a heads up, we're not resetting the memory. <laughs> Just want to caveat that. This is going to be um, four fuzz case in one U64, right? So then, um, let mute next print is equal to time future one million. We're going to print, I guess this will start at zero. If CPU RDTSC is greater than next print, greater than or equal to, it doesn't really matter, uh, print VM uh, fuzz case this, number resets. And then next print is equal to time future one million. It's in microseconds, so that's a second. So time to print the next status message. And then this is uh, print status messages on an, on an interval. Okay, here we go. Now it won't spew as much. Eight that, oh, that's slow as shit. That's really fucking slow. All right, we might have to try this on hardware. That might just be the limitation of VTX, uh, of nested vert and KVM. Damn it. Remember when I said KVM slow? Let's try it. Let's see what happens on hardware. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, uh, let's boot this server. Okay. Okay, and remote control, power control, reset server. I know that there's a command line IPMI tool for it. Maybe I should block starting on a certain Mac. If we, actually, the i210, uh, kernel source net, Kernel source net Intel NIC i210. We'll just we'll just disable support for the i210, <laughs> and then I'll make sure I boot from the i210. So I gotta I gotta make sure I get into this BIOS. I probably missed it. Uh, F12, which I forget. Please, I think I missed it. Son of a bitch. Well, we can see it's three million a second on real hardware. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Easy. A <laughs> single core, <laughs> three million resets a second. That's what I'm fucking talking about. All right, we got we got to fix this so we can actually test. Um, this is IPMI uh, F12 uh, serial over LAN. Shift O M. Um, 
I could IP my tool it to specifically put it into that. Use those sequ sequences for that. Okay. Shit. Um. F1. What is F1? Uh, OP. Nope. Son of a bitch. Uh, let's do the IPMI tool reboot into BIOS. Right? That looks good. <laughs> that, that looks good, I like that. Fuck. Oh. Um, Lenovo. Uh oh, you got my password. All right. Okay, that clearly didn't work. <sighs> I know I've done it before. Um, chassis boot pram get force dicks uh pixie bios disk safe oh now i have to reboot it i see then i have to reboot it um ipmi will <laughs> reboot force dicks yeah I, I did temporarily say that didn't i uh i'm guessing just like reboot i don't know chassis reboot just yoloing help Help. Reset. Uh, restart cause. Status. Power. Reset. Alright, so that should boot into the BIOS because we forced it to. Um, and we're just going to whack this in. Uh, reboot. Uh, Vim. Reboot. CPU land. Dot SH. Binge. Bam, chmod plus x reboot CPU land. And we'll grab this string as well, just so we don't lose it. I'm not gonna use it, but that exists, so I know how to get back in the BIOS if I need to through that mechanism. And then we can fuck off with this website, because it. That website's so bad, man. So this should boot into the BIOS. Are you fucking kidding me? God, I fucking hate IPMI stuff. So trash. Uh, God damn it. Um, isn't that how you do it? You do the force reset? Or you force BIOS? Lenovo? No, no, not on the laptop. God damn it. I think the correct way, I mean, this is super micro... But it, sh it should be the same. Oh my god. Do it graphically. God damn it. All right. We're going to try it again. We'll try more um, key sequences and sh key sequences and shit. Maybe doing reset is not the play here. Power
Um. Force into the bias. I don't know if that's going to re-reset it. Okay. Uh... Whatever it was, I, I got it. I, I hit a bunch of keys as well. Um, okay, CPU configuration. Let's turn on all the good shit. We'll turn on hyper-threading. Uh, we'll turn on... Uh, turbo. So, hyper-threading on. Active cores all. Turn on turbo. Turbo boost. Bam. Okay. CMCI. Thermal throttling. Nope. Nope. Don't throttle. Speed step off. And turbo performance. Okay. We set those. That's good. Now, let's check if we can set the... Uh, I guess we want PCI. Onboard LAN 1, LAN 2. Super IO. No, that's Sol. That's booting from boot from onboard LAN Pixie. Network priorities. Yeah, why is that using the PCI? I want to turn off the OPROM effectively. That'll fix that problem. So we'll disable using the OPROM on the X540. Where the fuck is it? Where is the OPROM stuff? Maybe this doesn't have it? And while we're in here, I'll set this to last state. Um, can I not turn off the OPROMs? Hardware stuff. Oh, God. Oh, God. Mistakes were made. Mistakes are made. Uh. No throttle, just melt. Hell yeah. Can I escape this? Yes, I can. Um. Is there really no way for me to turn off? What's ASPM? That's power management stuff. Are you serious? Oh, maybe it's on here. Here we go. Boot beep. Oh, I love boot beeps. I might actually turn that on. Uh, display the boot logo or disable the short. I want to see the post messages. There we go. Do not launch. So compatibility. Yep. So you got the pixie op ROMs. 
We got the storage oproms don't launch. So don't ruin the oproms for the uh, storage and for PCI Express. And then we should get more verbose boots here too, which will be nice. So should be able to discard and save. Beep boop. Yeah, I, I love having boot, uh, beeps when computers boot. It's actually kind of a nice diagnostic tool. Um, and I can't reset this because that, yeah, that booted off of a different, it still booted off that pixie adapter. Now this will come in and this will not allow booting from pixie. Holy shit, did I save those settings? I don't remember if I saved those. We'll go back into the BIOS and see if the XE device is no longer in the boot menu, because it shouldn't be. But I also set the boot to verbose, which will be nice. I don't know why I had it on like the logo. I I hate that shit. Give me the give me the post messages. Give me the full full smack. So I can see what the hell's going on. There's something I love about like the bio system configuration prints. Any plans to add deterministic record replay? I will not have record replay. Um, I'll have time travel though, which I would say is just better in pretty much every way. I didn't save those settings. What the fuck? I'm not a big fan of record replay. I'll probably have record. I won't have replay though. Um, don't want speed step. We want turbo boost. So what do we do? We set turbo boost on, no thermal th throttling, turbo, enable hyper threading. Um, I set like a couple other things. Oh, that sensor shit. Get me out. No. I swore that I was able to escape this last time. There we go. Um, boots. Disable the full screen logo. Boot beep. And then there was the... Uh, I want the power on. Yeah, this last state. I don't want this server to turn on when I lose power. Okay. And then we have to disable these ROMs. Disable. Disable the op ROMs. Now, saving changes. There we go. I can't believe I didn't save those. But yeah, I'll, I'll definitely try to strive for determinism. I mean, this has full determinism as is. Um, so I'm more of a, a, a time travel person than record replay. I don't like record replay. It's just, it uses so much memory and it's so slow. You can get the same thing by, by literally just going back in time and replaying from where you were. Record replays for things that aren't deterministic. <laughs> that's, that's my view. <laughs> it's only nine hours, man. <laughs> it's only nine hours. <laughs> it's, not, it's not too crazy. All right, so we're going to see if we can soft reboot here. We should be able to because we'll no longer pull up the i210 device. Uh, so we'll be able to soft reboot this. There's a chance that maybe that didn't disable that pixie operon, but I don't think that's the case. Okay. Yes! 
Oh, fuck, no. Damn it. Why is that booting off that device? I mean, we can just disable that, right? We can... We can force it to not. We can tell it not to boot off the IXE. But if I'm telling it to not use OPROMs... Unless it's using that Pixie OPROM... I just don't want it to use that X540 OPROM at all. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Let's get that setup menu going. There we go. Yeah, it's still booting off that. Um... All your devices were at Eufy. CSM gets rid of all of that. Well, whatever. Where is my, where's my pixie boot stuff? Network device. Uh, I don't know which one is which. I don't know which, which port I actually have plugged in there. Whatever. Timer interrupts will be non-deterministic for replay. Our method is low overhead. You you can get the timer interrupts deterministic. That's my goal. The R method is not low overhead. Oh, I I, I see what you're saying. To to inject the inter um. You record the conditional branch on each exit, then interrupt to stop before on replay? Is that so you like, I mean, that's effectively what I plan to do is deliver interrupts based on uh, PMCs so I can deterministically inject interrupts. I don't know, maybe that's exactly what they do. Start Pixie over IPv6. Conditional branch one is the only deterministic one? I don't think so. I don't think there's anything specifying that uh, any of them are deterministic. There's no, there's no like solid rules there. But yeah, conditional branch would be a good one. I see. Only one that works in practice. Yeah, that's fair. Start Pixie over IPv6. I don't have IPv6. <sighs> and only on Intel. Are AMD's perf counters not deterministic? There we go. I just have the wrong nick order, I'm guessing. No media present. And then now I'll try IPv4, I'm guessing. Come on. Ha, oh, you fucker. That right, what's up? Whoop, whoop. How's your stream, man? What were y'all up to today? Thanks for the raid. 
broken on Intel on AMD. I haven't tried it on AMD. I don't know. My view is everything's deterministic if you understand how it how it works. <laughs> Almost had it working that broken Zen. Damn. Yeah, but I'm I'm definitely gonna strive for determinism. It was good. Got my DSP server to parity back end rework and uh, some log reporting stuff. Hell yeah. Oh, I fucking missed that. I missed the window. You might have better luck being below the OS. Oh yeah, for sure. As long as SMM doesn't fuck things up. I don't think SMM uh, perf counters get counted. Or at least you should be able to turn them off. Well, they might fuck with the determinism. If I'm not mistaken, the instructions executed should be deterministic. Trying to get high now? Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> high now low? Okay, maybe you're not trying to get high. I don't I, <laughs> I don't know if I've read that right. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> Trying to get high, not low. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Getting high. By <laughs> I, I totally read that wrong. All right. Enabled. I think those were Yuffies. All right. Now... We did it, guys. No 420 unless it's line to code. <laughs> It'd be nice if instruction to retire counter worked. I have played around with it and I've never seen it not be deterministic. Also went with the retired branch counter and they're below the OS, yeah. Honestly, I don't know how you would use a perf counter with an OS that isn't, isn't your friend. I mean, you can count only while inside the VM But I don't know if that would behave well if the OS above you has interrupts. Because I can literally just not have interrupts at all on my OS. Like that'll, when I'm running the VM, I just won't have interrupts enabled. Which is not something that's really feasible for <laughs> any actual OS. But I've never seen determinism issues with instructions retired. And I would prefer to use instructions retired because I want to be able to deliver interrupts on... Uh, per instruction basis. I don't want to have to be bound to branches because that's way too rough granularity. All right, this should now work. This will boot off the i210. And then we will not install a driver for the i210. We'll only do it for the 10 gigabit driver. We might have it trying to boot off the wrong device first, so it might take like five seconds for it to time out. But it'll eventually boot. Oh <laughs> no, I lost my hands. <laughs> Two small paper hands. Yeah, I gotta I gotta make some damn emotes. I'm now successfully two rates deep live overloaded dial right and <laughs> right to me. <laughs> Welcome to the washed up dredges of Twitch, <laughs> where everything just sifts down into this ball pit <laughs> of of death and low level shit. <laughs> Come on, I definitely picked the wrong pixie adapter. So what's easier, for me to go into the BIOS and switch the Pixie adapter or to go run over and physically reconnect that? And I'm pretty sure it's physically reconnected, but I do want this to boot first. Come on. Come on, Pixie. Just time out. Just time out. It's not that hard. It's not that difficult to time out. It's just you send a couple packets, and there's like no DHCP request or response. 
or offer more specifically? Oh my god. What is this? <laughs> How long is this delay? This is the most resilient network stack. All right, I'm going to go uh, physically move that cable. See if that does it. Reconnecting cable, hell yeah. I don't know, it's just it seems to be faster, but we'll see if this goes into there. Maybe I fucked up the pixie order. Maybe I maybe I refucked it up. Come on. The cable whisper. Let's see. Let's see if this comes up. Maybe maybe this server's dead. No, that server's up. Okay. Put the cable in the other slot. We'll see. Are you kidding me? Did we did we just break it? Does does it just not want to boot anymore? I broke it. What did I what did I break? I didn't change anything too dramatic. Let's see if I'm seeing discovers on there. I mean, why wouldn't it just detect that there's no link? God damn it. Oh, did I not like save those last settings maybe? Yeah, I'm not seeing any boot P requests from it. Oh, and now I probably switched the cables on over to the wrong slots. <laughs> All right, we'll reboot again. Uh, why is it so difficult? I should just plug both of the adapters in. <laughs> That's usually my normal play, is just pl plug in both adapters, call it a day. <laughs> F1. This is the most import important part of booting. You gotta, you gotta smash that F1, get right into that BIOS. Some F1s here too. You never know where you gotta put the F1. Sometimes it's in before, sometimes it's after. Oh, that might not have been enough F1s apparently. You son of a bitch. <laughs> Come on. Why? Why can't I just get this to boot? <laughs> this is just the most basic shit. How? How can we write a hypervisor in less than fucking nine hours and we can't boot a server? <laughs> there we go. Hey, we made it. All right, what did I do here? How is that, dis did I not save my settings again? There's something about, no, no, that's enabled. Legacy Pixie. I was booting into Linux? No. 
Why? Why, why do you think you can just change your priorities on me? 500, then 200. Why do you think you can just change that shit up? Save changes, let's go. Here it is. Boot into the disk. Why did I have a disk in there? Why do I have a disk in there? I don't think I've ever booted onto that. I don't even know what's on there. <laughs> It's probably Linux or something. Uh, it's actually probably Windows. Probably to uh, test out a, a CPU bugs. Mystery disk. Dude, I've got so many mystery disks. I like, uh, the last three computers I got all are NVMEs. So I have like, I have probably like six different terabyte SSDs floating around this room right now. I've got like one on a windowsill. I've got two on a table. I've got one on another table. <laughs> it's, it's like the graveyard of SSDs. <laughs> that old SATA, man. NVMe has made it feel like uh, SATA SSDs are, are fucking platters now. All right. I maybe got the network order. Oh, we did it. Interrupt F. Interrupt what the fuck? The fuck what's the what's the F? How did I get an F? The fuck is that? Reboot? That must have been a spurious. I bet that option ROM just ha just left a spurious interrupt sitting in there. Well, anyways, we've cleaned it up. All right, we're back, guys. We did it. We did it. All right, so now we can move this over to here, and we can see our fuzz cases per second. That's pretty solid. Pretty happy with those numbers. Well, that's not per second, so let's do a... Uh, Let's it is equal to um, CPU RDTSC. I'll save the initial time, and then here we can do uh, fuzz case. Got to do a lot of digits. That's what I'm used to. Uh, Ten dot four, and then fuzz case, fuzz space case as F sixty four. You know. Are there any languages that support spaces in identifiers? That would be the most fucked up language to read, but I kind of kind of want to see it now. <laughs> time uptime since IT uh, elapsed. Okay, so now we can build the kernel and then we can reboot it. There we go. And now we're doing all our testing on hardware. Uh, if it can find that interrupt. There, it found it. Okay, so we're running 306. Or 3, 3, 3 million. 3.06 million fuzz cases per second. Doesn't go support basically all UTF characters? Oh, you could do a, yeah, a, a <laughs> lisp reported it. Foo slash bar. Ugh. All right, all right. So now what we can do is we can make this, um... ooh, 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 mapping. Uh, oh, we want to do this on one core. Um, static mapping is equal to uh, lock cell mapping uh this is a net mapping. Uh, core locals uh, lock interrupts equal lock cell new none option. So now we can have all the cores share the same mapping. So this is uh, load up. Uh, uh, this is the uh, network mapped file to 
execute from. <laughs> uh, lock interrupts is from use core locals lock interrupts. So this is how you scale. This is how you scale a fuzzer to use cores. Um, and we can arc that shit. Yeah, we'll arc that shit. That means we can do this. Mapping is equal to this. Uh, first, if let sum. Ooh. That will be the mapping. Let mapping is equal to this. Uh, then we'll say. Let map state is equal to mapping.lock. If, uh, if let sum mapping is equal to ms, then uh, ms.clone. Else create a network mapping. Uh, let mapping is equal to arc new mapping. Yeah, fuck it. We'll do this. Arc new mapping then we can do map state is equal to sum mapping and uh let ret is equal to mapping dot clone uh ret so this is uh get access to uh okay so we lock it and then that gives us access to that and then arc we need to pull in from use alex sync arc Lock cell, we gotta pull in that. We use lock cell, lock cell. Lock cell. Okay, and then this, we gotta ref deref that. Add a semicolon at the end. If and else have different variants. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna press an X to doubt. Found an arc. Oh, this is mapping. Uh, can't borrow is mutable. Done. So this will open the mapping on one core and then. All right. So now we can do test VM on all of the cores, and then when all the cores are come online. Then here we'll say if core id is zero and this so we'll limit the prints to one core and then we'll have fuzz cases um const fuzz cases atomic u64 as atomic u64 new zero uh, number of fuzz cases we'll pull in uh use core sync atomic Atomic U64 and ordering. Okay. And so now we can do loop at the end. Um, yeah, I don't think I continue that loop. That's the VM loop. And then fuzz cases fetch add uh, one ordering relaxed then up here let fuzz case is equal to fuzz cases load ordering relaxed all right so now this will run the vm on all cores deadlock detected 116 hmm hmm Hmm. Hmm. Why would that be the case? Fill the map in network map memory. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, we got some we got some deadlocks. All right, that's not happy. Yikes. Um what's going on there? 
Why would that have deadlock detected? Okay, first let's see if this is a problem single core. If core ID is zero, it shouldn't shouldn't be the case. And the core ID is not based on the APIC ID. Yeah, it shouldn't be that. Okay, let's try this on this. Worked fine here. False cases. Are we doing a continue on out of this? Oh, I made that const. It should be static. Make that mistake all the time. Okay, so in the VM, emoji code is a thing. Oh, gross. All right, yeah, we get that spurious interrupt. Then that's chugging. So if I allow all the cores to come online, why would they? Why would I get deadlock detected unless my core ID is not being set correctly? Let's see if we can repro it in the VM. We can. Fill the map in network memory. We lock it. Static. What the fuck? Print net mapping. Well, clear, clearly there's an issue here. Which is good. We can reproduce it here. So if it fucks off real bad, net mapping. MS is equal to some mapping. Why would that be none? Like that that read a that read at an offset. Filled the map in on net mapping one thirty two. For some reason, I couldn't get access to the page table. I mean, other cores would be coming up. Vert adder, fault adder. That's been reserved. Um, do I have this mark const? No, next free a virtual address. <sighs> What's happening here? Fill the map it in. The basic, basically the only way that we can fail to map something in is if it's already present. Oh, that's because two are faulting it in at the same time. So two things are faulting, and they're running through this code, and they're downloading it twice. I think that's what's happening. Um, so we want to lock on this. NetBF handler. Um... Handling, lock cell empty, lock interrupts. Uh, used to prevent multiple cores from handling the exception at the same time. And then here we'll just do let lock is self.handling.lock. Uh, prevent two handlers at the same time. That's not going to fix it because they're still going to fall through. Um, 
I could, I could ignore the error. Yeah, well, lock handling. I can't really have a list of pages. Yeah, here's what I'll do. We'll lock that. And we'll pull in lock interrupts from core locals. And lock cell. Um, and we'll do this here. If it's in our range, if it's not in our range, then fuck off right away. And then this will be core locals. And then 215 handling. This is going to be handling is a uh, lock cell new. This will prevent two cores from handling it at the same time. Now, this is still going to have the same issue. Still going to have the same issue. Right, uh, I guess that's just straight up deadlock and because that's panicking. Is that panicking? I should be able to panic with that lock held. Let's see. This this is back to what it was. Panic occurred on another core. Yep. Then in this state. Deadlock detected. Uh yeah. So no preempt on this lock. Okay, fill the network, fill the map in that. Yep. Perfect. So all of them should be filled. I don't know why that deadlock detected would ever happen. But let's see. I just want to see the different types of errors I get. Deadlock detected at 118. Weird. Print core this. And we'll print the mapping lock. The, uh, we'll print our core ID. Where are you releasing the lock? When I, when I return from the function, I will get released. Unlock detected. How though? How there be a deadlock there? I don't think there is. I really don't think there is. Anyways, handling. Uh, acquire the lock, which we do now. Why would that? Why would that deadlock? We can only deadlock if the core ID is the same. Oh, we don't print anything. 118. That's deadlocking on a print. We're inside of a print, and I think we're hitting a deadlock on that. Okay. All right. So, prevent two handlers at the same time. Then here, we're going to do a translate. Um... At the end, page table and pmem, and the virtual address. So this will say, um, uh, check if someone already mapped in the memory. This is possible if we lost the race. 
It's a good bug, bug to fix, though. I'm glad that we hit this. Um, that's the virtual address. So we'll do uh, translate. Translate pmem. And the other thing we could do is we could literally just return if we lost the race. Well, we don't know if we did. Okay. So get the page table. Lock that shit down. Um, then we're going to translate this virtual address. And then here we'll say if let sum, uh, if this, and then here we'll map the results and we'll get the page dot flatten. Oh my God. Fuck yeah. Is sum. If this is sum, then it's been mapped. Uh, return. Uh, this has already been handled by another core. 